Uh, so good morning and thank you for joining us today at the 2021 Roger Williams University Law Review Symposium, An Uncomfortable Truth, Indigenous Communities and Law in New England. My name is Hannah DeVoe and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Roger Williams University Law Review and coordinator of this year's symposium. Along with the RWU American Indian Law Student Association, Professor Diamond and the RWU Law Review Symposium Committee, I would like to formally welcome you to today's event. As the day progresses, I will briefly introduce each speaker and their topics. Please keep your microphones muted until the Q&A period at the end of each speaker's time. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to either put it in the chat directly to me um, so as not to disturb the speaker or their presentation, um, or during the Q&A period, use the hand raise function and I will call on you. Um, and I would also encourage each of you to view the screen in speaker view. I will put my email in the chat if anyone has questions throughout the day or following this event, please do not hesitate to contact me. At this time, I would like to introduce Raymond Tuhawks Watson, a 3L student at Roger Williams University School of Law. He is a member of the Mashapug Nagansett tribe, um, so sorry if I mispronounced that, and a 3L student with a focus on mediation, wills and trusts, and indigenous law and policy. Ray will be opening this year's symposium, so uh, Ray, feel free to take it away from here. Manta penuni, isa poni ga. Manta penuni, isa poni ga. We kwe yo, peni anamu. Which ni un manacha kwe kwe yo. The bad name in wayan ne wo chi wam ni tampa kwe kwe yo. Kwe kwe yo, we kwe wam pe yo. Manta penuni, isa kuni gan. Manta penuni, isa kuni gan. Kwe kwe yo, peni anamu. Which ni un manacha kwe kwe yo. The bad ni ni nweyan ne wo che wam ni tampa kwe kwe yo. Kwe kwe yo, we kwe wam pe yo. Muni kisak na tawa ma ka ni tampag. As ka ta skwamsan. Nutuis nisu wushu wunak. Tomashipag na higansit. Kwe kwe. Ut soams. Kwe kwe. Ut pokanokit. Wuni kisa, wuni mosquito ka akuni. Good morning, family and friends. How are you doing? I am Raymond Tuhawks of the Meshipag Nahigansi people. Welcome, welcome to the land of Soams. Welcome, welcome to the land of the Poconokid. Good day, good medicine, and peace be unto you. The song I sang was written by Daryl Black Eagle Jameson, council chief of the Pacasset Wampanoag tribe of the Poconoke Nation. It is the Pacasset Nakanata, and we would sing that song traditionally at the beginning of the day to ask Creator for blessings and that our path on that day be good. And the words are as such 
Muntapin Wuni, Kisa Kunigan. Good morning, good day, Kwe Kwe O, welcome, welcome. Kunianamuk, Wichinia Munachak, honoring the clans. Kwe Kwe, welcome, welcome. Tabatne Niwayan, Niwuchiwam Nitampav. Thank you for all of my friends. Kwe Kwe, welcome, welcome. We Kwe Wampeyu at the beginning of the day. I thought that was a fitting song to begin with uh, because I am so honored that the symposium this year has chosen to focus on the experience of the indigenous populations of what we now call New England, where I hail from. Our uh, experience here has been one that uh, is fundamental in my opinion, definitely to the foundation of what we now call American society. But I would argue beyond that, the world, because out of these very lands came the concepts of freedom of religion and freedom of speech, which is so held in such high regard by American society. And I just want to say Katapatush for the symposium for honoring our people in this way. I do want to give much respects to the American Indian Law Students Association for the fantastic work they've done over the past two years uh, to advance our agenda of bringing attention to the indigenous uh, experience with law. And I also want to give much respects and honors to all of the speakers who will be sharing remarks today. I have been asked to give a prayer this morning, but before I do that, I want to give a little context so that you will understand why the prayer is the way that it is. Uh, I'm often asked as a New England Indian, given your experience with Christians, how can so many of you still endorse the Christian religion? And indeed, it's a very important question and one that deserves to be answered. And I can best answer it in this way. When Europeans came with the Christian religion, for us as indigenous folks here in this region, we did not see many conflicts. They told us that there was a creator that had placed man here on these lands to be caretakers of them, had given them instructions on how to deal with each other, and had charged them with living out these instructions to ensure that everyone lived in unity and peace and harmony. We saw no issues with that. That tied in very well with our traditional beliefs. The element that they added was the concept of Jesus, which made sense to us as well. And since we were unaware, and since we welcomed them with good arms, we assumed that what they were sharing with us was truthful. And so many of us endorsed it and still do to this day. The conflict came in large part when we began to understand this religion and to see that they did not follow their religion. In fact, in many ways, they were complete hypocrites and the exact opposite of what they enforced upon us. So for us indigenous folks in the New England region, I like to say that we didn't have a problem with the Christian religion, we had a problem with the Christians. And that remains in many ways and has passed on to larger American society. As you will hear today, many of the things that were done to New England Indians were done under the auspices of being good for us or good for the community as a whole. But of course, this simply was not true. And what it really was, was a front for land theft and destruction of indigenous ways of life. So with that context shared, I offer this prayer today. The prayer will include elements of both traditional indigenous beliefs and those of our Christian beliefs, which many of us hold today. And I respect the ways of all, and in our way, we respect each other's ways. So I mean no offense by this, I just offer this prayer in honor of my ancestors and the experience that we have had in these lands. As I close out, I want to say to you all, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being here for this very important discussion. And I do hope that what is shared today will motivate you all to not only be more concerned and more interested in what happened to indigenous populations here in New England, but throughout the US and worldwide. Because in many ways, what took place here in New England is kind of the format and the strategy for how colonization was employed in other places as well. So with that said, I offer this prayer. And as is traditional, if you are a male in our audience wearing a hat that does not have an eagle feather on it, I would ask that you remove it. At this time, I will present this prayer. 
I will say it in the traditional Nahigansa dialects and then repeat it in English. And once I am done, I will turn the microphone back over to our moderator so that we can move forward with our day. I will begin. Katapatush, Yahweh, Katantuit, Numanituma. Katapatush, which he can wuni. Katapatush, which he kinamu, Yeshua. Katapatush, which he wami, no money took, no took swak. Kosota yumu, which he can, musukin ka, kawayanto. Kinita to, to botni. Ninwayan, Yahweh, Katantuit, Numanituma. Ninwayan, which he chusuta. Ninwayan, which he can wuni. Oh. I said, thank you, Yahweh, great spirit in the sky, our heavenly father. Thank you for you are good. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And thank you for all of our relations. You are the leader for you are wise and great. You are my friend and that is enough. I thank you, Yahweh, great spirit in the sky, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for listening to me. I thank you for you are good. I hope many blessings and much honor once again to our symposium for this very important topic this year. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ray. That was wonderful. We really appreciate um, you sharing your prayer and your thoughts um, as we open this symposium. Um, so now I would like to ask the Roger Williams University School of Law Dean, Mr. Gregory Bowman, to say a few opening words. Yes, thank you, Hannah. And uh, thank you to, to Ray for that, that very um, moving and meaningful start to our, to our day. So welcome everyone uh, to our symposium on Uncomfortable Truth, Indigenous Communities and Law in New England. Uh, this is really an exciting day of symposium and uh, we have some wonderful scholars and practitioners with us uh, from across the country and the New England region and we're really proud to host this. And let me say a great big thanks to the law review editors at the outset. Uh, law review symposia are a centrally important part of what we do at law schools and it is a way that our, our, our law students really provide meaning and impact uh, and advance uh, the causes of knowledge uh, and, and justice through their work and through bringing in uh, leading commentators on important topics. Um, and this is certainly a very important topic. Uh, it is one that is years and indeed centuries overdue and we're proud to, to host it. So at the beginning of this day, uh, I want to read a land and labor acknowledgement. Um, I want to do that before we begin to reflect on the lands in which, uh, on which we reside. Uh, we are coming here today from many places, physically and remotely, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous and native peoples who have been here since time immemorial and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. Roger Williams University School of Law is located in Bristol, Rhode Island. And so we acknowledge and honor the Narragansett and Poconocet people and Soams, the original name of the land that our campus resides on. We also acknowledge that this country would not exist if it weren't for the free enslaved labor of black people. And we recognize that the town of Bristol and the very land our campus resides on have benefited significantly from the trade of enslaved people from Africa. Uh, the economy of New England, Rhode Island, and more specifically of Bristol, was built from wealth generated through the triangle trade of human lives. During this time of national reckoning with our history of slavery and the disparate treatment of black people, we honor the legacy of the African diaspora and the black lives, knowledge and skills stolen due to violence and white supremacy. While the movement for justice and liberation is building, and we are witnessing the power of the people, many are still being met with violence and even being killed. As upholders of justice, our hope is to become agents of change for members of our society who have been met with violence, physical, mental, emotional, through our privilege. And as upholders of justice, we believe that our students who will soon be practitioners of law and our colleagues can be and already are 
agents of change as well. And for those of you who are not familiar with this practice of reading a land and labor acknowledgement, why do we do this? I want to share with you a statement from Northwestern University's Native American and Indigenous Initiatives, which explains it much better than I could. And I quote, it is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements and labor acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. So again, thank you for being here. I look forward to this day. I look forward to learning. I look forward to listening. Uh, and I look forward to personally and professionally growing. Thank you again to the law review. Thank you to all of our guests who are participating and enjoy the program. Hannah, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Dean Bowman. So before we get into our speaker series, um, I would just like to reiterate um, a few of the words that Dean Bowman said. Um, this is a very important topic and we titled this symposium, An Uncomfortable Truth for a Reason. Some of the conversations and topics that we may discuss today can become quite uncomfortable, but part of a symposium is learning. And so I ask that each of you today take the time to listen and reflect and feel in those uncomfortable feelings and take what you learn today um, back, in your, back into your everyday lives um, and into your scholarship and into your practice. Um, and again, um, if you're just joining us, uh, my name is Hannah DeVoe and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Roger Williams University Law Review. I will serve as your moderator today. I ask that um, if you are not speaking, you remain muted with your microphone. Um, if you would like to unmute during the question and answer period, please use the hand raise function so that we are not speaking over each other and we allow each of our peers the opportunity to speak um, when it is their turn. If you would prefer to ask a question without unmuting your microphone, I ask that you please send your question in a direct message via Zoom to me so as not to disrupt any of the speakers or their presentations. Um, as the day progresses, I will briefly introduce each of the speakers and their topics, um, but I do ask that you allow each of the speakers a moment to further introduce themselves at the beginning of their topics. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I will put my email in the chat to everyone at this time. So if you have any questions during this uh, symposium, any technology issues that I can help with um, or any concerns or questions after, please feel free to reach out to me um, and I can get you linked with the right person to answer your question. Um, okay, so let's get started with our speaker series. We are a few minutes early, which is always great. Um, and I also would suggest to each of you that you view this symposium in speaker view to get the best experience possible via Zoom. So our first speaker today is Dr. Taino Palermo, a third year law student at Roger Williams University School of Law. Dr. Palermo is the chief of the Baramaya Guiana clan, a federally non-recognized tribal nation indigenous to the area now known as Pons, Puerto Rico. Dr. Palermo will be presenting his research paper focused on a legal framework for federally non-recognized tribal nations acquiring ancestral lands. I will allow Dr. Palermo to further introduce himself, but please warmly welcome Dr. Palermo as our first speaker. So Taino, if you would like to share your screen and take it away from here. Great, thank you, Hannah. Let me uh, screen share. All right, does that work? Okay, yep, that's so, okay, great, thank you. Um, so as Hannah said, my name is Taino. I am a third year uh, law student here um, at Roger Williams uh, School of Law. And um, I'm uh, known to my people as Amaguatu, which is Taino for river of fire or fire river. Um, and I am uh, native to the region, you know, today as Ponce, Puerto Rico, which is the Guania region of Borinquen, which is uh, the Taino name for Puerto Rico. So today I say Hahom Itaigue, which is to say thank you and good day to you all. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak to you all today. I, I must admit, I'm 
very intimidated by our powerhouse of lineup speakers uh, today. And uh, I'm just honored to be given the privilege to kick things off. And so before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank the key players responsible for helping this day come to be. I, I just want to emphasize how important today is um, and, and what this means for the law school um, and Indigenous people's legal rights. Um, and so I'd like to start with thanking the late Roger Williams uh, president, Don Farish, who four years ago uh, convened a meeting with all of the local chiefs in the area and initiated a dialogue and relationship with the indigenous communities of Rhode Island that laid the foundation for where we are today. Um, I'd like to thank former dean, uh, the former dean of the law school, Professor uh, Michael Yanoski, for taking the time to meet with Ray and I uh, all those years ago uh, to listen to our wild idea of leaving our careers to come to law school full time and um, try and establish a, a, a Indian law, indigenous law. Um, uh, initiative at the law school and um, and he without hesitation uh, was supportive of our efforts and continues to be to this day um, and I'd like to thank our current president uh, Giannis Miolis and our current uh, dean um, who you just heard from Dean Greg Bowman for not only continuing your predecessors efforts and, and honoring their commitments but um, taking those commitments and and supporting uh, indigenous lo law and legal efforts and ALSA's efforts uh, to a whole new level. And um, and we're just getting started to say the least. And so um, finally, it would uh, I would be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the final piece of this puzzle, uh, so to speak, which is, uh, and I thank the creator for bringing him to us is Professor Jim Diamond, um, who came to the law school at the perfect time. Um, and so he has opened my eyes and mind and exposed me to aspects of the law I never knew I needed to know and, uh, and to incorporate into my fight for my people. Um, much of what you will hear and see today is due in large part to Professor Diamond's influence. So, um, so let's get started. So this, this legal research that I uh, conducted um, is, is uh, called Returning Home and Restoring Trust. And it's a framework I hope to kind of elevate the conversation around what it means to uh, reclaim ancestral lands um, and exercising indigenous people's rights under uh, federal law and international law. And so let me start with a little context as to why I even engaged in this research. Um, uh, I, as Tainos, we are constantly fighting the narrative that we are extinct. And uh, my parents named me Taino uh, and my sisters, Guanina and Saray, uh, Taino names, so that we never uh, forget who we are, but also by forcing the world to say our names, the world would never forget Tainos still exist. Um, and so I grew up with Taino language, food, culture, practices, uh, but was always considered Puerto Rican um, and never Native American in the eyes of the federal government. Um, so we're not federally recognized. However, Taino tribes are recognized in a variety of states across the country, uh, including right here in Rhode Island. You can sign up today at the Department of Health for a COVID test or a vaccine. And when you choose your race and ethnicity and choose American Indian, you can choose Taino Indians as your tribal affiliation. Um, and you know, we're represented in the, U in the United Nations in a variety of capacities. Um, and in fact, the, the research director at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, Jose Barrero, is, is Taino. Uh, nonetheless, though, without federal recognition, um, Tainos and American Indian tribes similarly, similarly positioned as we are, are completely cut off from land rights and protections that flow from federal recognition. And so that means we can't access things like NAGPRA, the, Na the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act to, at a minimum, protect and preserve our ancestral burial sites. Uh, as I mentioned, Taino's ties to our land is well documented. Um, so, you know, it's not a, it's not a matter of, of mythical existence. Uh, we are prominent in, in, in other uh, uh, traditional forums, uh, institutional forums, governmental forums. So, um, you know, and even if we were recognized, the process to secure ancestral lands are often slow, convoluted, um, and without and, and don't afford full sovereignty over those lands uh, equal to that of a, a fee simple possessory interest of, of uh, 
of real property under U.S. law. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but you know, recognized tribes with lands held in trust by the federal government have this possessory interest known as Aboriginal title or the right of occupancy, um, which is uh, different than a fee simple ownership. So, in, in, in most cases, when substantive development or use of the land uh, when a tribe wants to do something, it, in many cases, it may have to be approved by the federal government. So I wanted to dig into that messiness of the law as it relates to tribal nations like mine and, and how we could reclaim our ancestral lands and control our lands as a fully independent sovereign nation. And so and so I dug in and, you know, one of the first areas I explored was how the trust relationship works between the federal government and land holding tribes and, and where Tainos fit into that relationship, if at all. And, and so there exists a special trust relationship between the federal government and the American Indian tribes. It's often referred to as the trust responsibility. And so one narrow interpretation of that scope of the trust responsibility is that like the actual legal trust instrument instrument that's created when the federal government takes tribal land um, into trust in uh, fee simple own, and ownership to manage that land for the benefit of the tribe and and and, um, and support the tribe's uh, uh, sustainability on that on that land. And so, without federal rec recognition, native communities uh, like Tainos have no access to this trust relationship, let alone the ability to have the federal government take lands into trust. So, you know this this. Uh, that, so as I continue to dig in, you know, this timeline here, we can see how this how this uh, uh, excising of Tainos out of the uh, uh, scope of uh, recognition and Native American uh, um, rights as it relates to those who are recognized. Uh, we can see how this kind of takes place, um, starting from uh, the United States uh, adopting the the narrative that was built by Spain when they colonized the. Uh, the Caribbean and the Indies um, in first contact, they historically uh, under under reported um, Indians. The, the Spanish census used to uh, enumerate slaves and, and disaggregate slaves by black and Indian. Um, and so the Spanish uh, the Sp Sp Spanish co uh, conquistadors would would under report Indians in their census to Spain to the Spanish crown as a method to justify the importation of more African slave labor. And that's a whole, you know, separate day long symposium about that those practices and using the census as a tool, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and, and so um, in 1830, we see the Indian Removal Act signed by President Jackson. And this allowed the government to start dividing land west of the Mississippi to give Indian tribes uh, in exchange for the land that was taken from them. Um, and so this, you know, was the precipice for the Trail of Tears. Um, in 1851, Congress passes the Indian Appropriations Act, which effectively created the Indian reservation system. And at that time, Indians couldn't leave reservations. Um, in 1871, Congress passes 25 USC Section 71, which is essentially saying no Indian nation after March 3rd, 1871 can enter can be acknowledged or recognized as an independent nation uh, by which the U.S. could enter into treaties with. And so it's kind of the, the federal government's uh, kind of land, uh, first line in the sand saying, you know, we're done recognizing and acknowledging uh, uh, tribal nations um, as independent sovereign for like foreign powers. Um, and then the, the you know, real nail in the coffin, so to speak, uh, is the Dawes Act or the Allotment Act in 1887, which, uh, which divided and broke up uh, large tracts of Indian land into these smaller plots for uh, individual Indians. It was also intended to convert possessory interest in, this, in Indian land uh, from that of the Aboriginal title or the, the right of occupancy that I mentioned to that of fee simple under um, after 25 years, the, the title would convert and the land would be free of all encumbrances. And uh, I think it's safe to say that never panned out the way they thought it would. Um, and so all of this is, you know, among many other uh, court cases and, and statutory schemes that uh, broke down and, and decimated, you know, uh, uh, indigenous people's uh, native land um, uh, on, on the mainland U.S., by 1899, the, the, the 
um, the U.S. is in this uh, uh, empire building uh, uh, mode, so to speak. It's the, you know, the Monroe Doctrine era. And so this is when um, the Spanish-American War comes to an end and they, and in 1899, the, P the Paris Treaty is signed, um, which uh, gives uh, the U.S. control over Puerto Rico. And in 1899, they, could, they conduct the first census in Puerto Rico in which they, they uh, have an entire section dedicated to Tainos. Um, and so, uh, and I'll, I'll show that in a second, but you have to understand by the, by the time the U.S. takes over control of Puerto Rico, the, they are, the mainland Native Americans are in the thick of land thefts, subjugation, boarding schools, assimilation practices. So um, by the time the U.S. takes over these territories with its own indigenous peoples, um, you know, they didn't stand a chance trying to uh, advocate and stand up for their rights when the U.S. had already had decades, generations of practice subjugating mainland indigenous peoples. And so um, that's not even to, you know, speak for the faction of Puerto Rican nationalists who wanted independence from Spain and the U.S. And so um, and so you see how it's uh that it's essentially completely erased as the tainos were um as time goes on through uh at 19 in 1900 the foraker act implements a territorial government um and installs a u.s form of government in 1910 they take that for uh, a second census and completely rebrand the term native. Um, and then 1907, they naturalize everyone. 1917, they naturalize everyone through the Jones Act. And then in, in, in 1924, we see the Indian, Indian Citizenship Act here in the mainland where they naturalize all um, Native Americans. But you also see the Racial Integrity Act. And I mentioned that because um, the Racial Integrity Act or what we know as the one drop rule is uh, the precipice for the whitening of Native Americans and categorizing them from their identity as uh, Native to either white, black, colored, uh, mulatto. Um, and so, and so uh, it's important to just understand this historical timeline because this is all the precipice for uh, property rights. And so um, in that first census that I mentioned, um, it, it, there's an entire section, of course, at the, uh, dedicated to Aborigines, um, which are the Tainos. Um, just to drill this point even further, uh, they say, you know, there are a few traces of them remaining. At least the census has not discovered any. Um, but then they go on to say that uh, they quote a, a general's report from a captain who said that while working, uh, work was being done on the roads, they had the occasion of watching seven, crowds of 700 or 800 men uh, gathered above the pay tables like labor, gathered about the pay tables like uh, laborers um, waiting to get paid. And they said the frequency of the Aboriginal type was very noticeable. The type can be seen everywhere in the mountain settlements. And they even noticed a woman whose color, hair, and features were true Indian as seen in the Southwest of the United States. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're there, but we're not there, uh, according to them. And then in the second census that I referenced is when they redefine the term native and, uh, and they do, they or, or do away with the, with the classification of mestizo. So in that first census, um, in 1899, they enumerate mestizos, and that was a, 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 a formal classification for someone who had one parent who was native. And so um, in 1910, they, they do away with that classification and, uh, and term anyone native to Puerto Rico as someone who was born on the island. Um, and foreign born is someone born off of the island. And so at that point, you're either white, black, uh, or mulatto. And these are the instructions given to the census uh, uh, the census takers um, on the island. And this, is, this has been well researched uh, around the actual intentional uh, instructions given to census takers um, in Puerto Rico around uh, reclassifying uh, indigenous people as, as mestizo or mulattoes 
Um, and then eventually uh, the, even changing the racing and going back over to change people into a white um, category as opposed to anything um, non-white. And so uh, this is uh, over, uh, this was an extensive study here conducted over 30 years of of census instructions taken in, in Puerto Rico. And see on the graph on the right, you see that red line, that's 1910. And so you see as how, how fast and vastly uh, white Puerto Rico becomes after 1910 um, as a direct uh, consequence of the intentional um, census reporting uh, or, or misreporting. Um, and to just kind of drive this point a little further home. Um, this is my <clears throat> uh, second great and third great grandmother um, at the top in 1910, Isabel Palermo and Alejandria Maria. Um, they're both listed as MU for mulatto. On the far right, you see the racial category um, MU here. Um, and so 20 years later in the 1930 census, um, my grandfather, Ernesto Palermo, seems to be the only person of color in this entire household who is now all white. Um, and so this seems to be uh, a possible uh, erasure and, and fix from Isabel, who was mulatto here. And maybe somebody came in after and changed that to a B for Blanco. But um, this is an example of how one person can, you know, in, in this case, two family members races can change from one to the from one census to the other. Um, and so all of that history is uh, is why uh, Tainos were effectively carved out of any kind of legal pathway under federal law to receive federal recognition and pursue a trust relationship with the US. And so so no recognition means no ability to secure lands with the federal government and no trust relationship could be established between Tainos and the federal government, which leads me to this proposed legal framework. And so um, a key kind of assumption before we get into the, the meats and potatoes of this framework is, um, is the tribal nation that's exercising this framework. And so this isn't by any means some uh, a, a required list of, any, of anything, but this, this helps uh, exercise the framework in a more um, in a in an easier way uh, when a nation a tribal nation doing so has uh, you know well documented ties to the lands uh, they are hoping to reclaim and there is at least a functioning tribal government um, uh, ideally bound by some tribal constitution or code uh, with a functioning tribal court um, or some sort of dispute resolution system and um and under federal law as uh coming out of the uh supreme court case montoya versus united versus the united states um having at least meet meeting federal common law requirements um of continuity leadership territoriality which is you know uh land ties to enjoy the same sovereign immunity from from suit enjoyed by enjoyed by federally recognized tribes and so um Assuming that a tribe attempting to exercise this legal framework um, is, is, is at least meeting these criteria, um, we can now uh, you know, have a, a foundation by which we can try and wrap our heads around this, this framework. So this is, this, is, this is it. I mean, this is the, essentially the, the, um, the, the structure of this framework. So in practice, it operates as, you know, the tribe or an agent acting on behalf of the, the tribe uh, purchase, purchases and acquires title to their ancestral land um, uh, in fee simple as purchase from the free market, right? And so this is assuming this, the tribal lands are available for, um, for purchase. And so the, the bona fide purchaser is, is, is then transfers that real property to the tribal nation by forming an inter vivos foreign trust. And, the, and the, the, the distinguishing element here in this framework is this foreign trust instrument. Um, by making the, uh, so therefore by making the, the, this process makes the bona fide purchaser, the, the trust settler, um, the tribal council or the functioning equivalent as the trust managers. And then the, obviously the trust 
uh, the tribal members would be these, the ascertainable class of beneficiaries. And so this foreign trust structure is kind of this uh, distinguishing element from other models, which I'll, which I'll also talk about in a minute. Um, but any trust can be deemed a foreign trust so, so long as it meets the requirements of a valid, validly executed trust, which I just went through. Um, and, and it also fails either the control test or what is known as the court test under, under federal law. And so the court test is satisfied if a U.S. court has jurisdiction to supervise the trust's administration. The foreign trust formed under the proposed framework would fail this test because the tribal nation's tribal court would have exclusive and sole jurisdiction to, su to supervise the trust administration, not a U.S. federal court or a state court. Uh, and the control test requires that one or more U.S. persons have the ability to render substantial control or decision-making authority over the trust. And so the foreign trust formed under the proposed framework would fail in theory under this test as well because the tribal citizens of, that, of the tribal nation, which is a separate sovereign, effectively uh, classified as, uh, or thought of as dual nationals, dual citizens, uh, all, all trust related stakeholders would assert their tribal citizen status, the, their constitution ideally would, would uh, uh, dictate um, choice of law in that way in which tribal law is, you know, the uh, primary and supreme authority. And so they, would, it, they wouldn't be operating under their U.S. citizenship status. So for all decision making authority over the trust matters would be for tribal members in their tribal citizen status, not U.S. citizens. And so the foreign trust structure is also analogous to the tax exempt status of federally recognized tribes as income generated by the foreign trust from non-U.S. sources is exempt from federal taxation. So this means any income generating economic development initiatives with non-U.S. nation states uh, would be tax exempt and therefore the tribe's financial autonomy is unaffected by U.S. tax codes. Um, and then issuing constructive notice will make clear that the tribe has reclaimed possessory interests over their ancestral lands under both federal and international law. They are the fee simple title holders in uh, uh, operating under a federal trust, but also um, operate as, in, in, as in, uh, indigenous tribal nations with inherent rights under international law, which I'll get to the, the, the legal authorities in a second. Um, and, and from there, the assertion of their dual title holding status is where kind of my research concludes, leaving this conversation open for uh, you know, further analysis and, and, and scrutiny, um, because this is a different type of dual uh, nationality uh, than that, that exists um, as opposed to uh, federally recognized tribal citizens and U.S. citizens, uh, and being U.S. citizens. This is more so similar uh, to a situation where you may have citizenship, say uh, you are an Irish national as well as a U.S. national. You have, you have citizenship in, in two separate complete sovereigns. Um, and so the legal authorities kind of... Uh, uh, supporting this framework uh, really begins with, you know, again, Professor Diamond influence, you know, of the uh, uh, Felix Cohen um, belief uh, doctrine that perhaps, uh, he says, perhaps the most basic principle of all Indian law is that those powers lawfully vested in an Indian nation are not delegated powers granted by express acts of Congress, but rather inherent powers which have never been distinguished, uh, extinguished. Um, and so in 26 CFR section 301 is the statutory scheme for the formation of foreign trusts, which dictates the control tests and the court tests that I mentioned. Uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People or UNDRIP, Articles 3, 4, 10, 25, 26, all speak, uh, as well as the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, ADRIP, uh, Article 6, 19, and 25 all speak to inherent property rights of indigenous peoples and the responsibility of nation states uh, to return ancestral lands um, in their entirety to the indigenous peoples of their nation. Um, the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man affirms many of the same rights as those in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, Article 2 states all persons are equal before the law and have the rights and duties established 
uh, without any distinction to race, creed, sex, language, or any other factor. Uh, Article 23 um, says every person has a right to own such property as meets the essential need of decent living um, and, and helps to maintain the dignity of the individual in the home. Um, the Organization of American States is a, uh, a chartered entity that um, houses the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and, and their authority is based on the OAS charter. It's comprised of seven independent experts. Um, they can issue state reports, theme reports, and adjudicate individual group and interstate complaints, most notably being um, Mary and Carrie Dan versus the United States. Um, this is a case having to do with the Western Shoshone, um, whose land has been, you know, systemically stripped from them by the federal government over uh, decades and decades and generations. The Dan sisters successfully petitioned the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to hear their case, and the commission ordered the U.S. government to halt all actions against the Western Shoshone people, and uh, it's, a, it's a mandate that has unfortunately largely gone ignored. And so, um, and so these are the legal authorities supporting this framework. Um, now, of course, you know, it also uh, raises the issue of whether or not the federal government acknowledges uh, or will be beholden to um, the provisions and articles in UNDRIP, ADRIP, um, these international instruments. And, you know, such is the, uh, the proposed um, theory behind this framework. And so there are models of purchasing ancestral land. Um, you know, especially recently, we hear a lot around land back initiatives. Um, and so uh, some of these models uh, walk the line of the proposed framework, but not, not quite. Uh, but they do help us wrap our head around, you know, um, kind of how this could look um, in, in practice. Um, the Esalen tribe in California uh, purchased this beautiful tract um, along the Little Sur River with a $4.52 million grant from California's uh, Natural Resources Agency. Um, the Esalen are not federally recognized, uh, but they are state recognized. And so the purchase of the lands were conducted at, um, uh, and were acquired under a, a nonprofit or corporation that they formed. Um, so as you as you can imagine, there you know the control of that land is subject to you know land holding nonprofit um, uh, rules and regulations, and so um, it isn't essentially the same kind of uh, uh, approach the framework is proposing, but it is um, an example of a tribe purchasing their their land. Um, similarly, the Yurok tribe, also in California, um, was made possible with funding from California's Clean Water State Revolving Fund as part of a carbon offset program. And possession of this land is subject to contractual obligations that the tribe must adhere to, such as like submitting a forest management plan to the state uh, and, and approval and registration of the land sale uh, must uh, had to be approved by the BIA. And one of the provisions in that in that uh, contractual um, obligations is to waive tribal sovereign immunity from suit should these obligations not be met, um, which is you know they have certain um, obligations to maintaining the land. And so um, again, not an exact uh, uh, um, model of the framework, but again, purchasing a model of purchasing land. Um, uh, outside of the traditional ways of taking, you know, lands into trust and things like that, which I'll get to in a second. Um, closer to home, the Possum Possumacuati tribe in, in Maine uh, purchased uh, Pine Island, uh, which is their ancestral um, land. Um, they purchased this from the free market. It was for sale. Um, and the tribe had a treaty with Massachusetts when, that, when Massachusetts extended all the way up through modern day northern New England. Um, and when Maine became a state, they renamed Pine Island and didn't recognize that treaty. And so, um, and so the Passamaquoddy lost uh, their access to it. And so the Nature Conservancy, a, a global co conservation organization, gave the tribe a grant equal to the purchase price of the island, providing them the funding to purchase it. And so 
Um, the Passamaquoddy are federally recognized. They own 143 acres of the uh, 150 plus acre island. Um, so um, it's likely those lands were added into their existing trust managed uh, lands with the federal government. Uh, but I think what may be the closest to this approach is the Squamish nation in Vancouver. The Squamish uh, ha have complete control over their land within the city of Vancouver. And what you see here are uh, renderings of a uh, massive um, housing development complex that they are building uh, in, in the next, within the next year or so. So it's been approved and all that. These are the, the renderings uh, pre-development. Um, and they are not subject to any of Vancouver's zoning laws or building codes as they build and, and develop this land within the city of Vancouver. And so this is a real example of an, like an independent nation within an independent nation. And so think of Vatican City, which operates as an independent nation within Italy, um, a, a separate independent nation. And so this is kind of the closest um, example uh, in support of this framework. And so this framework is different in a couple of ways than existing uh, approaches to taking land, um, reclaiming land and, and, the, and the models I, I just went through. Um, because there are in those models, there are still restrictions to a degree with the exception to um, the Squamish um, on the possessory interest of the tribes who, who purchased those lands back. So either by the nature of the purpose of the purchase or the structure of, of the title once acquired or, or both. And so, you know, some of these existing models include section five of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, which is the, the land into trust process, which gives the secretary of the interior discretion as to whether to take tribal and individual lands into federal trust status um, which is also referred to as discretionary takings. This process is convoluted. It's very difficult to navigate. It's a huge backlog. Um, current Interior Secretary Halan has tried to clean up this, this um, severely backlogged process by delegating that discretionary approval now to regional BIA officials rather than having to personally uh, have her office review every petition. Um, and there's the, the land buyback program, which is the uh, byproduct of the Cobell v. Um, Salazar um, class action suit um, that resulted in a, a settlement for $3.4 billion. And the land buyback program is, is, is meant for uh, uh, addressing the fractionalization, a fractionation, excuse me, of, uh, of these allotments where you have several heirs to one tract of land that, um, you know, you, and oftentimes you need a, a consensus from those uh, different heirs of this one tract of land to do anything with. And so it, it's um, an attempt to kind of consolidate that process. Um, and again, though, both ways do not afford tribal nations to maintain this kind of dual title holding status. Um, under international law and federal law. It's just another way of, um, of securing tribal lands with, with federal oversight. Um, so this framework by you know, uh, 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 applying this theory uh, forces a nation to nation relationship with the US in, 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 in ways that uh, were you know, originally uh, how the federal government approached um, tribal nations free uh, the constitution. And so um, it also applies to tribes like myself um, and Indians like myself who uh, are, are either not treaty bound by um, with the federal government because we never entered into a treaty, um, but are native to US territories, um, similar to the Chamorros from the Marshall Islands and Guam and, you know, even formally recognized or disenrolled tribes for whatever reason um, who, who are no longer bound by a treaty may be able to exercise this, uh, this framework. And so um, 
Now, there are also key concessions and considerations. Of course, you know, the, ex, the, the, the land needs to be available on the free market. Um, that's that's uh, kind of a biggie. And this is also, you know, you see in the other models, financing is obviously a, a major issue to be independent um, without uh, economic development um, support system um, is hard. And so a lot, that's why some of those models had to uh, have third party advocacy, conserva conserva uh, conserva conservatory agencies um, supporting them um, or had to set up nonprofit structures to house uh, or be able to take out um, large loans um, and finance the, these purchases. Um, and so assuming those hurdles are, 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 are um, crossed, these, these, uh, there's still, you know, this is new, this is different. This is, uh, could, could always be seen as some sort of threat economically or as a sense of national security. You know, if this is, I mean, imagine if, if, uh, uh, we hit the lotto tomorrow and I buy a track of land in Ponce from the, from the water ocean front to the mountains. Um, and I enter into a development deal with a, a German resort company and they build a resort on, in Ponce and I had have nothing to do or did, did nothing to, uh, confirm, verify, validate with the federal government or ask for their approval because I bought that land, I own it in fee simple. And so um, if that were to be the case, you know, then it becomes a matter of, of uh, exercising the international legal authorities, which the federal government would have to, you know, acknowledge, and they very well don't have to. And so it's about, you know, understanding the, the, the this could be perceived as a threat in some sort, some way, um, but uh, it's just something that must be considered. And, you know, there's always the, the case of land holdouts, which is, you know, folks who may be part of a large tract of land purchase um, who do not want to move or relocate. Um, and, you know, in the housing world and in uh, the world, the community development world that studies gentrification, this is, this is uh, on a smaller scale, you know, in the world of eminent domain, you see these kinds of things, but this is certainly a case uh, here. Um, the that similar to the the threat issue is the conflict of laws issue. I mean, you know, the a, a, a tribal nation has the ability uh, and the inherent right to to self govern, um, and if they can do that, irrespective of uh, asking the federal government for help, um, then and and are exercising their their sovereignty. Um, then you have this conflict of laws issue between whose who's law trumps whose. Um, and then, again, this concept of dual citizenship, um, separate and apart from how we understand tribal citizens and, and, and their relationship to the, to the federal government as, U, as U.S. citizens. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, uh, uh, a different type of classification um, and a different way to think about um, tribal citizens and tribal nations as separate sovereigns. Um, and so, you know, where do we go from here um, is, is uh, I think, uh, probably uh, 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 one of the broadest sweeping ways to um, support this framework is codifying um, any one or all of these articles from UNDRIP or ADRIP through congressional action. Um, and this, all of this isn't also to say that Tainos or any other similarly situated tribes um, couldn't be federally recognized and exercise the land into trust process. Um, and, you know, whether it's an act of Congress or presidential recognition, uh, but um, that's, that's, that's not to say that that couldn't happen as well. This isn't to say, you know, this framework is, is not an either or, but rather a both and. Um, and so um, that's also a possibility as well, as well as enforcing the Mary, the Mary and Carrie Dan decision um, and, and signaling to the, the um, OAS and the Inter-American 
um, Commission on Human Rights that the United States takes their authority seriously. Um, so that is, I believe, where I will end it. And so I want to say how home, which is to say thank you, open it up for questions. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me and ask me any questions. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't make a plug for Elsa. Please check us out, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and I will stop there. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you, Taino. Um, so if anybody has questions, um, please feel free to use the hand raise function or type them in the chat to me um, and ask away. All right, well, while people, oh, um, Ray, it looks like has a question. Ray, do you wanna unmute? Sure, so not so much a question, but just a uh, fantastic work, Chief. I've had the opportunity to work with the Chief for a number of years. He's uh, the reason why I was able to make my way into the law school at Roger Williams. So I just wanted to honor, say great uh, work on that uh, research he did. And I also want to just give a little context to his uh, dual citizenship. Uh, this is primarily through 8 USC 1401B, which is the Indian Citizenship Act codification, and in particular, the uh, what we're calling tribal property clause. It says in summation, um, US citizenship is extended to all Indians born within the territorial limits of the US, so long as it doesn't interfere with their rights to tribal property or other property. So uh, it's primarily through interpretation of that, uh, that we're looking at the uh, acknowledgement of the dual citizenship status of American Indians under US law. Um, and the good doctor has just taken that to a whole new level. So I just wanted to say much respect to you, Chief. It's a pleasure and an honor to be working with you. And um, this symposium is definitely starting off on a great foot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Um, so I do have a couple of questions um, in the chat that I'll read. So the first is, how do you believe the potential admission to statehood for Puerto Rico would affect the rights of the indigenous there? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I am very uh, cautious of not conflating Puerto Rican independence with the rights of ta Tainos um, because, you know, they are separate just like we see um, the, the the dual fight around independence in Hawaii from and their indigenous people as well. And so um, I, I don't necessarily think one impacts the other. I mean, even if Puerto Rico become were to become a state, it would uh, the, the fight for the Tainos would still be uh, directed at the federal government. Um, you know, at the end of the day, Congress has plenary power over Indian affairs. And so um, and so I don't necessarily think statehood would impact um, the fight either way. However, if Puerto Rico were to become independent, then the conversation to, is directed towards the Puerto Rican national government, which, you know, because now the U.S. is out of the equation. So, um, so yeah, that's a good question. Great. So I think the next question is along the same lines. It's What's the intersection of the independence movement in Puerto Rico with the indigenous movement? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 similar. Um, you know, you see a lot of um, and, and it's, it's it's really the byproduct of colonization. You see a lot of independent Puerto Rico flags with Taino symbols on them. Um, you know, you can go to the Puerto Rican Day Parade in New York City, and it's uh, heavily, you know, symbolic with Taino symbolism. Um, and so, you know, there's there's very clear people uh, who and communities that are Taino first and Puerto Rican second. Um, I would put us in that category, but um, you know, it's 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 kind of. It's 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 messy. It's a it's the byproduct of colonization. So I can't even say you know how much uh, independence and and the and would impact or or uh, influence um, the Taino's fight. I mean, it's still they're still fighting for the land, regardless of 
a Puerto Rican government or a fe or U.S. government controlling it. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is more of a question about your personal research here. So um, the question is, did you learn anything in your research creating this paper that either shifted or more narrowed your mindset about um, the research that you were doing? And was there any information that you wish you had known before starting your research that may have changed your research question? Um, that's a great question, but I don't, I don't think so. And the reason is, is because I, before going into this research, I was well aware of my, my history my personal family history. And so that's actually kind of what um, in, uh, initiated the, in, the, the, um, the research because uh, my grandmother um, about 10, 15 years ago uh, created an oral history as far back as she could remember. And this is pre uh, ancestry.com and created an oral history of, of as her great grandfather and she died at, last year at 98 uh, sharp as attack. And so she has a very clear history um, of, our, of our family lineage. And so um, I went on a pilgrimage uh, about three years ago to Puerto Rico to trace all of these things, quote, triangulated with ancestry.com documentation, which, which I, I found actually a lot. I found microfilms from Spanish census of our family uh, names being categorized under um, uh, slave enumerations as Indios, which is Spanish for Indian. Um, and then the, the, the US census that I showed you um, of my family. And so, uh, and all of my historical documentation and oral histories all sent, uh, 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 go back to Ponce, Puerto Rico in particular. So. I had a very sound understanding of my history. I was interested in learning how the law was associated with that history. And, and then um, it just kind of confirmed a lot of things. It made a lot of things make sense, I think. If I was surprised at anything, it was really about how, how, how clear I was able to fill in the gaps through you know law and history of how and why we were, you know, erased administratively through documentation. I mean, I have books by anthropologists, uh, you know, world-renowned scholars that that are that say Tainos don't exist. Um, and so, uh, you know, it just kind of confirmed a lot of what I I knew to be true. Great, that's great. So we have a couple of more questions, um, if you don't mind. No. <laughs> Um, so the first here is, what truly would success look like if the Taino peoples were recognized by the U.S. federal government, and how would such recognition change the lives of the Taino people? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, it is uh, restoring our land. Um, you know, we have uh, the first, the, the best kind of, I think, easiest place to think about for, um, you know, non-Tainos, non-Puerto Ricans is, uh, but you've been to Puerto Rico maybe is El Junque, the rainforest, the, the big rainforest, which is a national park. Um, and so it's protected in that sense as a national park, but parts of El Junque right now are up for private sale. And so when you're up for private sale, you know, you, you and not protected by the federal government, it is uh, anything could happen to your land. Anybody, they could, a, a forest agency could come into and deforest it, you know? And so um, I think federal recognition um, provides a sense of security. It shows that the federal government has skin in the game, so to speak, to ensure the, you know, economic viability, the sustainability of Tainos. Um, I think it signals that they are recognizing the uh, uh, oppression and attempted erasure of Tainos, as I showed you through census uh, tools and things like that. And so um, I think it, it has profound impacts to be federally recognized um, by protecting our lands and allowing us to restore our cultural practices, protect our ancestral burial sites. Um, but it also signals to the world, I think that the federal government 
is uh, is has again like some skin in the game and has interest in in acknowledging and protecting the indigenous people, especially of the their the territories, which are you know it's not even like we are a state, you know we are a territory, so we're in this funky place between having the rights of citizens, but you know the Jones Act in 1917 to this day still taxes Puerto Ricans on imports from the mainland. And so, you know, we see the effects of Hurricane Maria, things like that. Um, and so, you know, uh, if, if even without the Puerto Rico becoming a state, but federally recognizing Tainos and protecting land in uh, on the island um, and re restoring land to Tainos on the island puts more US skin in the game for broader uh, protections for all Puerto Ricans. And so um, I think there are major implications there. I don't know how close that is to becoming a thing, but um, yeah. Thank you. The next one is, what would you say are the rights of unenrolled individual indigenous people vis-a-vis -vis the US as opposed to their rights through federally recognized tribes? Uh, well, you know, unenrolled, federally non-recognized Indians, not part of a tribe are, are for all intents and purposes like any other US citizen, like uh, you and I. And so, um, and so that there is the distinction. Um, the federal, federally recognized uh, enrolled tribal members have a, a federally recognized tribe by which they can uh, seek supports and have, you know, uh, a separate, um, nation to exercise their cultural practices and their uh religious practices and and um you know this it's a lot of it's it's, it's uh almost the the equivalent of you know uh being excommunicated from the church in medieval times of you know if you're not part of the church you're not part of you're a nomad you're roaming society tribal wise you know the, in in terms of federal recognition the disenrollment essentially put you in this non-tribal category as any other US citizen. So, um, you know, that means you don't have access to a lot of the benefits and, and um, privileges of being recognized, so. Right, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, I would just say that if anybody who asks these questions has follow-ups, um, please feel free to send those as well or uh, hand raise and unmute so we can make sure that your questions are answered to the fullest extent. Um, so the next is, what do you believe we who are listening and participating can do to move this conversation forward, expand it to a larger audience, and join others who are fully engaged in recognition of indigenous peoples and their inherent rights? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there are uh, you know, we are trying to expand that visibility for indigenous peoples here at Roger and on the East Coast, but there are major institutions like Michigan State University and University of Arizona. I mean, these these law schools and institutions are are actively, you know, uh, supporting, advocating for um, uh, similar and and not similar, but broader indigenous people's issues. And so, um, so it, it's, it's, those are things that are easy to plug into, I think, uh, on this side of the, of the Mississippi, so to speak, you know, we, we are looking to continuously expand our uh, presence in New England as a law school and as a, as a law community engaging in indigenous people's rights. And, um, I think things like this, things like ELSA, um, helping, you know, so eventually we want to uh, create a, um, a lobbying effort around Congress uh, codifying UNDRIP, ADRIP articles that um, could help non-recognized tribes um, and shift that dialogue. So I would say, you know, there are institutions doing this work um, and we are looking to expand that work. So I would say stay connected to ELSA, stay connected to the law school in that way, because as I mentioned, you know, we are, this is, this is really the beginning of the work we hope to do in this area. I mean, um, as we will hear from, you know, Professor Diamond and others, you know, this, 
uh, uh, the interest in Indian law and tribal courts courses is is overflowing and there's a there there and people are interested in this and we need to feed that hunger um and there are tribal communities that want that help and so um i would just say stay connected and we will be sure to you know uh last far and wide through our socials through our our, our networks um opportunities for engagement and so um just be on the lookout for those calls to action Great. That's great. Um, love that answer. Uh, so the next one is a, a little bit similar in terms of involvement. Um, I would love to know if others are involved in researching the Tainos, or are you the only one at this point? Also, is Cabinet Secretary Deb Haland supportive of your efforts? Um, so to answer the first question, no. I, I'm, I'm the most recent to the party, uh, but there are uh, scholars like Dr. Lynn Guitar, who is now retired, but um, does a lot of research of, of the Spanish underreporting of Tainos, specifically in Quisqueya, which we know today as Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, and so uh, her focus is, uh, and that, that is where um, the first Taino treaty with the Spanish crown was signed in, um, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, with Cacique Chief Enriquillo, which is uh, which was the the first resistance to uh, Spanish colonization, and so um, and so like I mentioned, the the, the research director at the um, National Museum of the American Indian in D.C., the Smithsonian, is is Taino Jose Barrero, um, uh, Roberto Barrero, Roberto Mucaro Barrero is the uh, uh, the Chief of the United Confederation of Taino Peoples. He is the uh, United Nations liaison um, and is a, a, a speaker for the United Nations and leads a lot of indigenous peoples efforts globally on behalf of Tainos. And so um, there is a faction of Tainos in, in Massachusetts that just held a massive indigenous peoples day in, in, in Newton. Um, they were the ones who uh, forced the uh, Boston Athletic Association to acknowledge the Indigenous Peoples Day when they rerouted the Boston Marathon through Newton and forced the Indigenous Peoples Day event to relocate um, because of the rerouting of the marathon. They didn't acknowledge them that that inconvenience or disruption at all, um, just be, you know, as you would imagine, because who cares? It's Indigenous Peoples Day. Their lobbying efforts and advocacy efforts uh, forced the BAA to acknowledge them and and um, and also be more intentional about um, the race being ran on that day. And so um, and so to answer the first question, I'm you know I'm just joining the fight, um, and I'm happy to bring my my legal um, expertise to that to that fight um, because this has predominantly been from an academic, anthropological, historical context. Um, and has been falling short at the, you know, pursuing legal, actionable um, um, advocacy. So, um, so I'm I'm joining the fight in that regard. And uh, the second question I think was um, Deb Halan, Secretary Halan, um, and that is I think kind of where uh, feed, you know, off, uh, to go off of the first response is is what I think. I hope to bring to this advocacy effort for Tainos um, through our efforts at the law school, uh, having a law degree, being able to navigate um, indigenous people's rights and international law in that way and tribal law um, so that we can start lobbying the secretary, the Department of Interior um, and, and getting legislation on the floor um, and, and seeing how we can uh, move the federal government in that way. You know, they're not going to move on their own. And so uh, that's what I hope to be able to kind of push that dialogue. Great. Um, so the next is, who qualifies as Taino in this day and age, given the mestizo racial qualification? Yeah, so, I mean, first, let me answer that question by saying, um, uh, race in and of itself is a colonizer created concept. And so 
Tainos, even Taino scholars know, you know, there are, there's well recorded history and uh, artifacts and evidence around Tainos uh, communities in and around the Caribbean having uh, Mayan Aztec influences. There was a lot of trade happening through the, uh, through the, um, the, uh, that region in the Caribbean. And so, um, you know, the Tainos were not exclusive to themselves in the, you know, in this kind of isolated world. They were part of a, a, a regional um, economy uh, and trade. And so um, there are remnants of Tainos in, in, uh, in parts of South America, Southern Florida, as well as indigenous peoples from those regions in uh, Taino territory. So let me just start by saying, you know, uh, there isn't a blood quantum to reach. Um, to, there isn't uh, an authority saying you are Taino, you are not. I describe it as, you know, this is who I've always known uh, me and my family to be. I have the oral history of my family. I've substantiated that history with documentation. I, I know our legal rights. I've created the kind of structure through uh, uh, a constitution and um, uh, I took the initiative to join a confederation of other tribes that are not recognized or um, are bands of recognized tribes that were disenrolled um, the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of the Americas, FANA. And so uh, we've taken these efforts, we've advocated at the United Nations for our, for our rights. And so we have established who we are. We have, you know, through things that I mentioned in my presentation, established our legal authority to assert our sovereignty. Um, and and, and uh, barring a, a dispute between another tribe, no one can tell me who I am and where I'm from. And so because I know it and I can prove it. And so I would say, you know, you could uh, to to identify or or deem yourself Taino is to is to is to say that you have always or or at least, you know, have a uh, uh, an understanding of our of our culture and our practices and have, you know, I, I what I refer to as those kind of, that key assumption, those elements of that key assumption in my framework of having, you know, a, a documented history to the land. Um, you know, the federal common law requirements are are a kind of a good basis to think of as there always been continued leadership. Are you held out as an Indian and a tribe recognized by other Indians and tribes? Um, you know, is you know, ethnicity is so like not and no, not any Tom, Dick, and Harry can just say, I'm gonna buy this land and then exercise these laws because you know that's that there isn't a blood quantum, but there is blood ties to land that substantiate your indigeneity. And so um you know, I couldn't do this. I personally, my people couldn't do this here in Rhode Island, which is Narragansett land or in Bristol, which is Poconoke land, you know? So, um, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a combination of your ancestral familial practices and, and culture and identity and, um, and how much, you know, of a tribal structure and tribal nation you operate under, if at all. Great, um, there's a follow-up question. So if you either don't have access or maybe the historical record doesn't exist anymore, um, what would you say about an individual who just doesn't have that, that record? Yeah, I would say that's, that's tough. Um, and you know, I happen to be uh, uh, fortunate in that um, I was able to find a lot of documentation. Um, you know, but I also had oral history. And so I had something to go off of, you know, and, and in an international arena, um, oral history is, is just as valid as documented history. I mean, uh, oral elders in, in tribal communities maintain the his, history of the tribe through oral uh, tradition. So, um, you know, at some point, oral history is is uh, a valid form of documentation, but I've been able to substantiate it through 
other documentation and, and you know, birth records and, and things like that, land deeds. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's about what you can substantiate to make that claim. And, and, um, and that's hard, you know, I mean, it's, it was a practice of burning churches and, and which housed uh, family records and marriage documents. It was uh, a practice to, you know, uh, uh, to completely disregard any Spanish census and documentation um, to implement a new U.S. census and change racial classification. So it's, you know, it was an intentional um, erasure. So it's, it's hard to unerase that. Thank you. And um, there are two more questions and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, but this one is, what is the relationship between the Taino people and the, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this, but the El Yunque National Forest? Mm -hmm. Well, El Yunque, Yunque is a uh, Taino word. It's the, um, it's the rainforest in Puerto Rico um, that uh, is responsible for a lot of the ecological um, terrain and, and ecosystem in Puerto Rico. And, um, and it is also um, a very sacred place for Tainos. And so, um, you know, El Yunque, but Borinquen in, in its entirety is, is important to Tainos. So um, I think, as I mentioned, part of the property, um, part of El Yunque is up for private sale right now. So, I mean, you know, it is it is important what happens, whose hands that transfers into, and um, right now Tainos are in, aren't in a position to petition the federal government to try and take that land into trust, um, all because of you know recognition. So, um, uh, short of of a Taino tribe buying that land themselves off the free market, exercising this framework, um, you know it's it's we have to stand by and watch it. And so, um, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's critically important just as the entire island is. All right, and our final question, if the Taino regained their ancestral lands, would all of Puerto Rico become a Taino nation? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on how and what parts of the, the island are reclaimed, you know, similar to the, the Pine Island, um, model um, example I gave in Maine, um, that that entire island, I believe, spans 150 plus acres, and they were able to secure 143. Um, and so uh, it's it's not all Passamaquoddy land, although it is, but it's it's not all uh, their land under, you know, property law, because the another trust actually can, maintains the other uh, you know, 10 acres or so. So um, that re reclaiming land in, in Puerto Rico does not necessarily translate to the entirety of the island. Um, so. Okay, great. Thank you. So those are all of the questions that we have um, in the chat and um, pretty much have time for today. But um, Taino, is there any way that um, some of our guests could potentially reach out and ask more questions or follow up on your research. Do you have um, places to, to keep in contact? Yeah, I'll put my email in the chat as well. So I'm, I'm happy to um, share my slides with whomever or um, answer any follow-up questions. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was absolutely wonderful. Um, okay, so um, again, thank you, Dr. Palermo for speaking today. Um, our next featured speaker is Professor Bethany Berger, a well-known scholar and professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law. She is a widely read scholar of property law and legal history and one of the leading federal Indian law scholars in the country. Along with teaching um, American Indian law, tribal law, and conflicts of law, Professor Berger has also served as a judge for the Southwest Intertribal Court of Appeals. Today, Professor Berger will be presenting on Mohegan women, missionary women, and the survival of the Mohegan nation. Um, but I will allow Professor Berger to further introduce herself. Um, but please welcome Professor Berger as our next speaker. And um, you can take it away and share screen. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm so happy to be here today. 
And let me share my presentation. Um, slideshow. In the beginning. Um, and I, I, I really want to thank um, the Roger Williams Law Review for putting on this symposium. Um, this, I have worked um, in New England Indian country for couple of decades now, um, given my time at UConn Law School, but I've never actually written anything or published anything about the tribes of this area. Uh, my background is in working in Indian country is on the Navajo and Hopi reservations um, and during law school on the Shine River Sioux Reservation. So I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, and I want to acknowledge, also grateful for this opportunity to publish this work. Um, this began um, as a project for my race and property in US history course um, that I encouraged my student, Chloe Sherpa, who graduated in 2021 to complete um, and encourage her to try to get it published. Um, and she being a law student have, didn't have time to do that. So I'm going to transform it and I already have somewhat to publish this with her. And so I think in addition to Taino's wonderful work that we've already heard, um, I think this hopefully this will encourage the law students out there to think about how they can play an important role in these conversations. And so I am speaking from near Roger Williams um, in Connecticut, um, in Hartford, Connecticut, which is about here. Uh, and Connecticut is named after the Algonquian word for the Connecticut River. Um, and all the peoples of this area organize themselves in part about the rivers of this area. Um, but some of the ones that were particularly um, close to me are the Podunks, the Tungsis, the Wangunks, the Quinnipiacs. Um, but my talk today is going to focus primarily on the Mohegans. Um, and in the spirit of the land and labor acknowledgement that the dean very thoughtfully gave us, it will incorporate part of the relationship um, between treatment of Native peoples and African-American slavery um, in this area. So the kind of small story of this talk is how did this, a little congregational church built on less than half an acre of land um, in 1831 lead to this, lead to the modern federal recognition of the Mohegan nation um, with and most visibly at Mohegan Sun Casino, but more important for the Mohegan people, uh, the full recognition of them as an indigenous people entitled to recognition of their sovereignty and their land. And to get to that story, I think we see the ways that the tribes of New England have gone through many of the things and tried many of the strategies that indigenous peoples across the United States have tried. And just like indigenous peoples across the United States have come up with the, the hard hand of law and politics um, that the governments that they were dealing with both distorted 
their own statements and documents, um, and even when they made promises to the Mohegan people, they broke it, broke them, or failed to enforce them. And so, in a nice parallel with what Taino talked about, um, the Mohicans tried many strategies to preserve their land. Um, they tried military alliance. They actually tried um, an early form, what some people call the first form of trust status. They petitioned the local government, the colonial government. Um, they petitioned the central government, as today tribes petitioned the federal government, but then it was the British government. They used missionary societies. Um, they petitioned them and worked with them in order to get um, their own goals met. Um, but e when, even when they won, non-Indians ignored the results. And by the 1970s, when the Mohegan Nation submitted formal petitions for federal recognition, the land that the Mohegan Congregational Church was on was the only land that was owned by the tribe itself. And some of the relatively little land that was in tribal hands. I mean, sorry, little land that was in the hands of any Mohegans in the area. It remained in Mohegan hands by using the appearance of assimilation, but really appropriating non-Indian tools for Mohegan ends. Um, and I think when we look at tribal peoples, and particularly tribal peoples of New England, there's often an argument that they are assimilated. They are no longer Indian because they act too much like non-Indians, or they look too much like non-Indians racially. As Taino said, they look either um, to non-Indians like they're white or black and therefore cannot be Indian anymore. But I think one thing that we get from the Mohegan Congregational Church story is the way that tribes are using those tools for their own ends, for appropriation rather than assimilation. And just to get to the early background um, and one of the first strategies tried by the Mohegan people, um, the, one of the first strategies was military alliance. Um, so the, what, the groups that we know today as the Mohegans and the Pequots um, came from um, the same Algonquian group. Um, they split with them um, over political disagreements, um, in part just about political power um, and land, but also about whether the strategy of allying with the um, English was one that was useful. Um, and because of the, and the Pequots at the time were the most powerful tribe uh, in this area. Um, and in particular, they had somewhat of a monopoly on wampum trade from Long Island which was a key currency used by the English um, because it gave them access to the fur trade. And at, so when the English began a war against the Pequots, the Mohegans and the Narragansetts um, allied with them in part for their own reasons. But even then, the Mohegans and the tribal allies were uncomfortable about the brutality of uh, the English activities. They told them that their way of fighting was 
um, too furious. It killed too many men, but it continued. And the war ended with what I've shown in this picture here, that the English and their Indian allies surrounded the Pequot fort at Mystic and burnt it and killed those trying to flee. And between 300 and 700 um, Pequots were killed then. Uh, those that survived, often the English simply killed the men. Other men, they sold into slavery far away, uh, perhaps in the Caribbean. In fact, and this gets to the labor part of the acknowledgement, um, they sold the Pequot men far away because they didn't want them um, to be there to fight with the English. And they traded them for black slaves who didn't have those kinship ties um, and so couldn't as easily run away or form alliances. Pequot women, who they saw as less dangerous, they sold into slavery or, or indentured servitude around New England. So this is an early tradition of slavery in this area. As a result of that military alliance, um, Uncas, the sachem of the Pequot, of the Mohegans, was granted a great degree of land. Um, but immediately there was encroachment on that land and Immediate, and later the English would twist even the meaning of that military alliance to say that because the Mohegans and the Pequots had once been one people, in defeating the Pequots, the English had conquered the Mohegans as well. So this is just an example of how the words can be twisted. And over the next century, the Mohegan leaders tried everything to hold on to their lands. Um, a lot of these early deeds, well, a lot of these early deeds look like the Mohegan uh, leaders, um, Ancus, um, later Oaneco, are simply giving away all those lands to the English. What, but even the English didn't treat those land claims as lost to the Mohegans. And I think what historians generally believe was that this was an early attempt to create a trust, to say, if we give you certain rights in these lands, then you have to acknowledge our Mohegan right to the land and protect it on our behalf. And this becomes particularly clear when um, jo Major John Mason, longtime ally of the Mohegans, the year before his death, donates back or entails back 20,000 acres of land um, to the Mohegans that the Mohegans had previously created a deed to him. And so I've shown here one, ah, I mean, hold off on first, but so after John Mason dies and after Uncas dies, the encroachment on Mohegan land gets even worse. Formerly, there was at least the pretense of deeds, but now the Connecticut government just starts granting Mohegan land to different Connecticut towns like New London, Norwich, without even getting Mohegan consent. And so the Mohegans are going to plant their lands because as we know, um, the New England Indian peoples were accomplished farmers, another fo form of currency used by the English um, in the New World was Indian corn. 
and English are coming and breaking down their fences and driving them off the land. And so what I've shown here is a 1703 petition to the colonial government. Um, that is complaining about this, saying, hey, this is our land that has been promised to us, um, that you promised we would always have a sufficiency of land and we are being beaten off of it. And when we protest, uh, the English tell us that if we come back again, they will kill us and scalp us and make money by selling our scalps. Another thing I wanna point out about this document which is true of all the documents that I'm going to show you, is that if you look at the signature line for the Mohegan signatures, um, in the middle, uh, and you probably can't see this from here, you will see like small drawings, marks. And these were the marks that the Mohegan people used to refer to themselves um, rather than signing their name because they could not write. So any deed that you see here, as complicated as it is it us, for us to read um, through this script, it would have been impossible for the Mohegan signers to read, which leads to a lot of what um, one tribal leader, not in New York called pen and ink witchcraft. We think we are signing one thing and instead the English transform it into something completely different. So after these repeated appeals to the colonial leaders, um, Oaneko, uh, the Mohegan Sachin who replaced Uncas, um, and assisted by Samuel Mason, appeals to the centralized government. Just as today, and just as in the 1830s in the Cherokee cases, uh, tribal nations appeal to the federal government to say, protect us from these violations of law by your people, by your state governments today. And so the advocate for Oneko goes to London to file an appeal with the British um, Privy Council. He publishes a letter from Oneko um, regarding their situation. Um, and if you can read any of this, you will see that Oneko is presenting this as a statement of a sovereign speaking to another sovereign with whom he is in alliance. Uh, referring to um, their soil and royalties of our dominion um, long before the English came to this country. Um, and raising the broken promises the Queen Anne um, agrees to send a royal commission. The royal commission investigates the issue and rules unanimously in favor of the Mohegans, um, saying that promises have been made, promises have been broken. They are a, a considerable tribe or people and they've been wrongfully dispossessed. Connecticut didn't even bother to show up for the commission. They said the tribes within these borders are just our affair. You have nothing to do with it. And so those of you that are familiar with 20th century and 19th century Indian law, this is a claim that states continually make that almost led to the collapse of the government after the Cherokee cases in the 1830s. 
But so here in this Mohegan case, Connecticut is making it very early. When the cases decide against them, they appeal. Uh, the Royal Commission agrees that they can appeal and have a new Royal Commission, but then nothing happens. And although they've initially said that the Mohegans' costs should be paid for this appeal, they take that back. So the Mohegans, impoverished from the loss of their land, are trying to press this case. And Connecticut's not interested in pressing this case. And England's not giving them much help. Um, finally, Oaneko, is it Oaneko? No, uh, Maramomo. Um, goes to England to seek the appeal um, in the 1730s. He succeeds, but he dies of smallpox there. A new commission is appointed, dominated by Rhode Islanders, I may say, who uh, I think everybody believes was kind of biased in favor of Connecticut. They rule in favor of Connecticut this time. But then that judgment is reversed because it's found set aside as very irregular. Yet another commission. This is much more divided. And this commission too says that the Mohegans are a people whose claims can be heard by the centralized government. But they find for um, the Connecticut based on those same kind of confusing deeds that I spoke to you about. And the Mohegans are still pressing the appeal until it's finally, finally dismissed in 1773, which is the time that uh, England is starting to lose its control over the colonies. So shortly after that, we've got a new nation and a new set of law violations. But this time, we don't have that government fully outside of the colonies to try to be a neutral arbiter. So in its early days, the United States said, try the same thing that Connecticut had been trying. Okay, all you indigenous peoples, you are a conquered nation, so you don't have any rights anymore. Very quickly, that real they realized that that was a really bad thing for them and took it back. They even said, you know, we were wrong, sorry about that. We're going to recognize tribes. But they didn't, recognize the tribes of New England, except for those that were large enough still to be able to be a significant military force against them. Early days, one of the, in the first Congress, they enact the 1790 Trade and Intercourse Act, and one provision of the Intercourse Act is what I've got up here, which prohibits any sale of land um, by any Indians or any nation or tribe of Indians within the United States um, to any persons to any state um, without a public treaty held under the authority of the United States. So that would suggest that no more lands can come from tribes like the Mohicans. That's, it's not practiced that way. They leave the most of the New England tribes subject solely to state guardianship. And even for tribes like the Iroquois tribes of New York, who have treaties, who are of a substantial size, um, the states are violating that law. They're going and claiming bunches of Iroquois land, treaty lands, 
And when the government in Washington says, hey, that violates the law, states like New York are saying, come and make me. So if even for the Iroquois, this law is essentially a dead letter, for the Mohegans, it's even more so. And so by this point, the 20,000 acres um, plus more that had been guaranteed um, in, to the Mohegans is much, much less. Uh, probably a, a few thousand. At some point in the 1700s, it was 4,000 and it kept going down. Um, and so what's happening with the people at the time? What's happening in particular with men and women? And one of the realities of the life of New England tribes was that the men very often were not on tribal lands. Many had been killed um, in early wars, had been sold into slavery as those Pequots had. They had also been conscripted to fight in the American Revolution. Um, and even when they survived, they often had to leave tribal lands for work. So in Algonquian society, um, men and women worked in different places. The women were responsible for, for the planting, for the growing primarily, while the men were tended to be responsible for hunting. But in this period, men like the Mohegan men whose 1703 petition I showed you began to be told, if we catch you in the, your hunting grounds, we're gonna think you're an enemy and we're gonna scalp you. They say, just stay on your planting grounds um, if you don't wanna get killed. And so that role of hunting and that way to make money for your family, to support your family by hunting, that was often taken away from men. So they had to leave the lands um, in order to support themselves and their families. As just a side, one of the significant ways that Native peoples in New England supported themselves was by joining whaling ships. Um, between the whaling was a very significant industry in New England. Um, and it was a place where indigenous people could really play a significant role. Um, so this is Amos, I believe his name is Hoskins, um, uh, who was in the 1830s, I believe, became the first indigenous captain of a whaling ship. Um, this is Samuel Mingo, it's a bit later, the 1860s, um, with his wife. And if you look at the pictures, particularly of Samuel Mingo, you'll see something that refers to what Taino said, um, which is that Often, indigenous peoples at this time in New England um, were marrying with and incorporating um, free blacks and also runaway um, blacks, um, in part because many men had been killed, um, in part because the remaining tribal lands were a place of relative freedom. Um, and relative equality for 
uh, for free blacks in New England society. Um, and so if you look at early records of this time, they often refer to Indians and mulattoes or just mulattoes. And if you look into the histories of the people that they are referring to, by mulatto, they don't mean, as we often imagine today, white and black. They mean indigenous and black. And so these are indigenous communities strengthened by um, African-American members um, that blend together. So what about the woman? I've told you that women played a key role here, um, but you don't see it very much in the records. And this is because the records were drafted by uh, English, who did not look at women as having political power or property rights. As I've told you, um, women were responsible for farming, uh, land passed matrilineally. And I see that Amy Den Uden, who has done wonderful ethno history on uh, the Mohegans and New England Indians is on this call. So she knows more about this than I do. So I'd love to hear her talks. Um, but, and so a lot of this is drawn from her book um, on uh, the Beyond Dispossession. Um, on the Indians of Connecticut. Uh, but the English thought that only men mattered. So when they counted tribal populations, so Taino had referred to this, those censuses. So these censuses, this counting, how many Indians are there, is starting very early on. And in those censuses, they often only count men. They might say, oh, and there's a bunch more women. There's 33 men um, and there's a lot more women, but they don't even bother to count. And if they, because men is who they thought of as having political power and particularly military power. And if there were too few men, they said the tribe no longer existed. Um, there are a number of women leaders among the indigenous um, New England people, but they're often referred to only as squaw sachem, which the English understood as simply being somebody's wife, not having political power or authority in themselves. And some of these people refer to a squaw sachem, turns out actually weren't even married to the leader they're talking about. Uh, that they had independent authority, maybe they were a daughter um, with connections to a related tribe or so on. And this may be one example of it. So this is a document that I have not managed to decipher this crazy script yet, um, but it is signed by Uncas or Pokan, um, the important uh, Mohegan leader of the 17th century. Um, and by his squaw sachem. And again, you're seeing these, they're not just X marks, they are a mark in, through which um, these people are defining themselves specifically, and they are differently, different. So why would just a wife be signing at this deed? Under English law, Wives didn't have rights in their husband's property. In fact, even in their own property, once they got married, husbands got full property rights, could control it and sign it away without the wife's consent. And so this dual signing to me suggests that this is the Mohegans recognizing 
um, the authority of women over the land, um, even when the English are going to dismiss it um, as he's just bringing his wife along. And so women are staying on the land. They're often keeping the records of the land. They're often participating in petitions for the land. And this brings us to another group of women, missionary women. So if you've studied Indian law, you know the importance of Christianization efforts. Um, and New England was a center of this effort to train missionaries to go to indigenous peoples and make them be Christian. Uh, so Connecticut, where I am, at, was the center of the American Board of Missionaries. Um, schools like Harvard and Dartmouth originally founded to train missionaries to the Indians. Um, and in fact, there's a very famous indigenous missionary, Mohegan missionary, Samson Ockham um, of the 18th century that worked uh, to promote uh, recognition of indigenous rights as well, but mostly off the reservation, off of tribal lands, along this pattern that I'm talking about. For American women at this time, women didn't have much authority. They weren't mi middle class, upper middle class women did not work. And missionary work became a way to play a significant role um, to have power in this kind of conscripted world that they're in. And I think that this, that Sarah Huntington, who is a significant person in the building of the Congregational, uh, the Congregational Church, is part of that. She go, lives in Connecticut, goes to work with the Mohegans, sees herself as providing an important role um, in enhancing the government of these untutored, untamed beings. Um, how much we might do by devoting an hour every day to some employment for them. We have not money, but we have time and strength and the got talent which God has seen fit to bestow upon us for which we must account. So she's seeing the Mohegan people as wholly in need of help, um, as not powerful in themselves, somebody that even a woman could help. And so she's teaching them um, and she starts raising funds and petitioning to build the congregational church. Uh, soon after the church was built, she marries another missionary um, and on the way to a mission trip in Syria dies in a shipwreck. But so that's her perspective on what's going on. This is all part of the assimilation and Christianization mission. But, and we don't have as good records of what is going on from the Mohegan perspective. What we do have though, is this deed for the church. Um, and this was a deed that my student Chloe Sherpa um, originally got. So you can go out, you students, to land records um, that are public records and get these amazing things. Um, and so it's Lucy Tacomas and Cynthia Hascott, um, her daughter, in exchange for just one dollar, are releasing their title to this small piece of land. It's less than half an acre. Um, to build a church, but the key thing is this legal strategy. They assign it to the Mohegan tribe forever. So they're not trying to give it to some missionary, some 
uh, non-Indian group anymore, um, and placing this restriction on sale of it so that neither we, the said, nor grant grantors, nor our heirs, nor any other persons have claimed, challenged, or demand any estate, um, right, title, interest of or into the presence uh, premises of any part thereof, so they can't be sold. Whether this is, a, is legal um, as a matter of undue restraints on alienation, I don't know, but it was respected, and so this land didn't get sold. And again, we're seeing that they're signing with X marks. So they're not able to write these words, but here they're using words that become powerful for them. And the church in the next century and a half becomes a center for Mohegan traditional and political life, but it's under cover of assimilation. It's under cover of this women's work, which the Connecticuters don't look as threatening. So in 1860, this becomes a place where what they're calling the Wigwam Festival or the Welcome Festival starts again. It starts by the Mohegan Sewing Society. Sounds like the most innocent, sweet lady thing. Um, but in fact, this is a resurgence of the Green Corn Festival, a key festival for the Mohegan and other peoples in the area. Um, and so, the Mohegan Sewing Society or the Lady Sewing Church Women's Sewing Society becomes a place of leadership for these women. Um, Emma Fielding Baker, who resurrected the Wigwam Festival um, and preserved tribal records. Um, Gladys Tantquigen, uh, who was vice president of the Sewing Society, who in the 1900s became an anthropologist, founded a museum built near the church in 1930, um, preserved tribal records, genealogies. Um, and so this becomes key once the tribe is beginning to petition for recognition. So, in the so in 1978 the federal government creates a formal recognition process for groups that didn't have treaties that had been treated as if they didn't have sovereign status they can petition to the bureau of indian affairs to seek formal recognition of their status um and to do this, though, they have to show they've existed as a distinct community from historical times to the present, and they maintain political influence or authority over its members from historical times to the present. Now it's a B and C or only from 1934, but you can see how incredibly difficult this would be in the face of those records um, that are written by non-Indians. Um, and I'm going to skip through this because I think I'm getting short on time, but the petition was initially denied in 1989, um, but was on reconsideration, was um, acknowledged in 1994. And the work of women, the informal female leadership, and the community activity on the grounds of the Mohegan Congregational Church was central to that final recognition finding. And that led immediately that year, the Mohegan tribe was able to enter into a settlement recognizing their land. It's still a bit of a sad story from that 20,000 acres or even that 5,000 acres that the tribe had in the 1700s. The current reservation trust lands, I believe is less than 500 acres. Um, and the tribe had to give up all other claims, but at least they finally have some land that is 
permanently theirs. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to questions. Great. Thank you so much. That presentation was, I mean, just beyond. <laughs> um, so if anybody has questions, again, please feel free to use the hand raise feature um, if you'd like to unmute and ask, or um, feel free to just pop them in the chat and I can read them out loud. Um, I did receive a question during, so I guess I'll start there. Um, this question was pretty general, um, but as we, as an audience, continue our research and continue to educate ourselves on this topic, do you have tips or suggestions on how to ensure that our research does not continue to um, ignore or overlook the works of women um, in various tribes? Yeah, um, and so, Fortunately, there are a lot of scholars that are going to enable you to take a second look at these documents and seeing what see what's going on. I mean, for me, I was, I was turned on to this topic because I take my Indian law class to Gladys Kantwijen's uh, museum, and her descendants. Um, will give us this great intensive tour of both the museum and the church. And so I learned about this from, you know, talking to tribal people. Um, and I think, you know, just as Taino mentioned, talking, um, you know, his grandmother's, learning from his grandmother, his family work, the, the role of women is preserved in the oral tradition of indigenous peoples here. So the more you can be led in your work by the indigenous peoples of New England, I think the more you will see where you have to poke harder to not just take the written record and assume that that's accurate. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, my um, chat just disappeared. Okay, here's another one. Um, so I think you might have just answered this question um, in your answer to the first question um, about your uh, class that you teach, but um, this question refers to how did you personally get involved in federal Indian law and was it what you anticipated when you started your legal career? No, um, and I, I love this question um, because it, I think it's helpful for law students to think about the wonderful accidents that can happen in law school. So I started law school uh, thinking that I would do international human rights law. Um, and I actually was committed to women's issues from the beginning. I spent my first summer in Thailand working on sex work and human rights. Um, but I felt frustrated by that in part because when you're in law school, you know, I fell in love with case law you get these great stories and then the use of case law, if you know how to use it, you can put it together and say, hey, this is the law, so do what I say. Um, and international law often doesn't have that um, feeling like I can use this to, um, to get a clear result. Um, in addition, I felt that some of the work um, I was doing with groups far away, the the cultural difference was significant enough that I worried about doing more harm, about not understanding what the needs were. Um, and so my second summer, I went to work for the Attorney General's Office of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and fell in love with both with the questions of overlapping sovereignty that Indian law and international law have. Um, but also with the importance of history. How, um, and I came back and I wrote my big student paper on Indian women in legal history between 1830 and 1934. So this is kind of all back to, this paper is a bit back to my origins for me. Um, and yeah, then went out to Navajo and Hopi when I graduated. So happy accidents in law school. No, that's great. I think um, I think anyone who is a legal scholar might um, 
understand the, <laughs> those happy accidents. So thank you. Um, we just have one more question in the chat. So if anybody has questions that they want to raise their hand, we do have some time set aside. But um, this question goes back to the um, role or the, I guess, difference in respecting women in their role in property. Um, and I guess, do you know, or just does anyone have information on whether that respect for women and their ownership of property has continued or had been in the past and that was like unsurprising? Or was that something that was completely new and, and more of a um, more of a stand up for those women? Um, so I don't know. Um, I think that there, are, you know, what scars like Amy Denny have done great work. There's been, I've seen less work on Mohegans in the late 1700s and 1800s. Um, and so I'd really like to see more kind of anthropological work on that. Um, my sense though, uh, from uh, talking to people now, um, like Melissa Tantquigen Zobel or Zobel Tantquigen, um, uh, is that that's been a continuing um, but hidden process. I mean, so I would love to know, and I hope before you know, in doing this paper, I can find more answer. How did Lucy and her daughter Cynthia come to be the owners of this land that had the ability to grant it in perpetuity to the Mohegan tribe? Why was, did people like Uncas even have authority to grant these deeds without the agreement of Mohegan women? So these are somewhat open questions for me, but my sense is that it's um it's been a continuing current great thank you um so this question how does the eastern pakoi tribal nation gain full access to furthering this conversation as it speaks to the land claims and establish dialogue between all non-federal recognized tribes in the state of connecticut yeah um so i think maybe the questioner may have uh some ideas about that. Uh, so the in Connecticut, um, the only federally recognized tribes are the Mohegans and the Mashantucket Pequots. Um, and the Eastern Pequots and the Skagakok suffered from a really terrible history um, that uh, had actually gained a proposed finding of federal acknowledgement through this BIA process. And then administrations changed from, I believe, the Clinton to the Bush um, uh, administration and the uh, there was a lot of political pressure from uh, Connecticut politicians, both Democratic and, non and Republican, um, against their recognition, and that finding was reversed. Um, and since that initial reversal, there has been a, the regs have changed um, to make the process somewhat easier, only require you show continuity since 1934. But tribes that had already petitioned were prohibited from restarting that process. So I don't have ideas that I think that would work for federal recognition. Um, you know, maybe go into Congress, but that's a real uphill battle there, as you can see. Um, but one of the things of the story is the creativity of tribal peoples in trying different methods. Um, and I think the questioner suggested a possibility in, in building more political connections across uh, uh, non-recognized tribes in 
developing land ownership, finding creative legal means to get some kind of authority outside the federal recognition process. So I don't have a, an easy answer to that. Doesn't, doesn't seem like there should be an easy answer, but <laughs> um, we do have two more questions and that's just about what we have time for. Um, so this next one, what was the most difficult aspect you found of researching the paper genocides against New England's native communities? I mean, so, and I'm relatively at the beginning of this, but one difficulty is just reading that handwriting. <laughs> um, um, so for, you know, I could read the deed basically, but to transcribe it, I asked um, my a secretary to, and I don't usually ask her to do very much. And she came back and she said, here it is. This was hard. <laughs> um, and, there are some, and it's really hard. Um, but another thing is how, little the written record actually shows, how li how inaccurate it really is. I mean, so as I said, I think that historians pretty much agree that those deeds from the 1600s do not mean and did not mean to the Mohegans what we, what they look like they mean. They were written by non-Indians for non-Indian purposes. Um, and I think folks are developing better anthropological techniques to look at the land, you know, how the land is used, what remains to get behind that. Um, but I'm not an anthropologist, so I'm relying a lot on other people's work. That's great. Thank you. Um, so the last question here, um, is there any hope that a change is possible in the federal recognition process would allow historic tribes to be recognized where there was a break in continuity in one place at one time? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Mohegan story actually um, is one of overcoming a break in continuity. Uh, so part of the reason for that initial, that proposed initial finding of non-recognition was that the, they said there was a break between 1941 and 66. Um, and then they went back and developed the records, particularly the records of the Women's Sewing Society, and also said, you know why we didn't have a lot of male leadership um, at this time? What time was it in the 1940s? It was World War II. Um, and so there are ways to fill in those breaks and explain them. Um, sadly, how that political reasons rather than anthropological or historical reasons. Okay, great. So we're about um, at time, but is there a way that um, our audience could reach you if they have follow-up questions um, or possibly um, stay in touch um, after the symposium? Sure, and I welcome emails after this and like I you know, will put my email in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank that you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so um, now it's about 11.15. Um, we're going to take a quick break. Our next speaker um, will be Professor Diamond. Um, that will start promptly at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you could um, either log out and log back in or just stay on the line, um, we're just going to take a very quick break. Thank you. Okay, as we are getting close to 11.30, um, I just want to welcome everyone back. Um, if you stayed, thank you. If you have just joined us, um, I'm just going to go over a couple of things that I know I've said um, a few times already. But if you could just remain muted, please, um, while we have our speakers doing their presentations, um, just so that they're the one in speaker view, that would be great. Um, during our question and answer period at the end of every speaker, um, I'll give you the option of using the hand raise function um, or direct messaging me your questions um, and I'll read them out loud, but you are more than welcome to use the hand raise function and ask the questions yourself. Um, just so that 
everyone is aware, our previous two speakers, Taino Palermo and Bethany Berger, have shared their email addresses in the chat. So if you come up with follow-up questions or would like to um, stay in touch with them and their research, um, you're more than welcome to email them directly. I mean, if you do have any questions or thoughts um, about the symposium during or after, my email is also in the chat and you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, and finally, I do recommend that um, as you're watching the symposium, you view this in speaker view um, so that the speaker is the largest one on your screen. Okay, so it is now 1130. Um, again, welcome back. Um, our next speaker will be Professor Diamond. Um, professor Diamond is a professor at the Roger Williams University School of Law. He currently teaches federal Indian law, tribal courts, and law and government, among other courses periodically. Professor Diamond is certified by the National Board of Trial Advocacy as a criminal trial specialist with extensive criminal trial experience. He has a profound background in Indigenous people's law and education of the topic. Professor Diamond has been instrumental in assisting the Roger Williams University Law Review and myself in hosting this symposium. And I am pleased to introduce him as our third speaker while he presents An Uncomfortable Truth, Law as a Weapon of Oppression of Indigenous People of Southern New England. And I would like Professor Diamond to further introduce himself. Um, so take it away and feel free to share screen. Can everybody hear me now? Okay, that's better. The old, sorry, I muted thing. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah, I'm so uh, honored to be here and pleased to be here. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, so far, this has been amazing. Thank you, uh, Hannah, for that introduction. Um, and Hannah, uh, thank you for everything that you've done uh, to bring this uh, symposium uh, to, uh, to light and to, and to become a reality. Um, it's what's so interesting about this is that uh, this symposium, in fact, everything, uh, all indigenous studies going on at, uh, at Roger Williams University Law School, uh, the activities, the studies, the scholarship have all been originated from the students. Um, it, you know, and you see that. I'm so proud to have my students participating. Uh, uh, a Taino, uh, it makes me so proud uh, to see one of my students uh, presenting uh, groundbreaking scholarship uh, here uh, and to take learning from uh, from law school classes and uh, and take it another step further and then you know use a creative process uh, to try to solve this problem of uh, intractable problem of, of uh, erasure uh, and uh, and and uh, and uh, you know and, and de dehumanization subjugation and try to try to try to solve that uh, in, a, in a creative, thoughtful, legal uh, way. Uh, the speakers here uh, today uh, so far, uh, Taino uh, and uh, Professor Berger at UConn, um, just inspiring uh, and, uh, and, and uh, fantastic uh, research um, and, and presentation. And, uh, and so it's so honored for me to share this sta virtual stage uh, with them. Uh, along with speakers you'll be hearing from a little later, um, like uh, Professor Matthew Fletcher, uh, who uh, has been an inspiration to me uh, when he visited at uh, University of Arizona uh, Law School and taught tribal courts uh, class that I teach uh, now at, uh, at Roger Williams. Uh, he's been a, an inspiration and a friend. So uh, thrilled to be, uh, to share the stage uh, with him, uh, along with, uh, uh, Bethany Sullivan, uh, who was a colleague of mine at Arizona as well, where we both taught uh, clinics, uh, and her and uh, Jen Turner will be talking about Carcheri versus Salazar, uh, and uh, uh, so happy to, to share the stage with them. And also uh, my student, Two Hawks, 
uh, who gave us a um, an Algonquin welcome and uh, and, and prayer um, and prayer. So uh, my my topic uh, today is in fact the uncomfortable truth uh, of, of law as a weapon of oppression of the indigenous peoples of of southern New England um, and my um, the inspiration for my talk um, came from uh, what's going on in uh, in Providence, um, where uh, Mayor uh, Jorge Alorza uh, commissioned a study, uh, a matter of truth, a struggle for African heritage and indigenous people people's equal rights um, in in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, uh, and so. Um, my article uh, talks about uh, indigenous peoples and um, and law and, and and across the United States, um, peoples across the United States, um, with more of a focus on the Northeast um, and the greatest focus of my article uh, being on here, right here in Southern New England, uh, as you heard from Professor Berger, uh, Connecticut but also Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts uh, as well. Uh, but much of what I have to say focuses on, uh, on the rest of the country as, as well. Um, what I'm gonna talk about um, this morning is uh, mostly about, uh, you know, one at one, I uh, wrote about, which uh, we talked, which we heard from Professor Berger a little bit about, uh, but the history of the philosophical basis for Indian law, um, and that's what that's what I'm going to talk about mostly this morning. Whereas my article for the uh, journal that's, uh, that's that we're publishing will also talk about um, uh, the modern era and how law continues to be used to oppress. Indigenous peoples of uh, New England, uh, like uh, tribal membership processes and uh, use of quote unquote blood quantum, uh, uh, and uh, along with the rec recognition process. But also, uh, my article talks about how states continue to, uh, uh, states in New England continue to battle Indigenous people uh, in every, at every step whether it's recognition or the uh, efforts to show the, uh, that uh, land was taken away from them uh, illegally uh, in the early uh, era of uh, non-intervention uh, statutes, uh, et cetera, but continues, uh, continues on. And so um, uh, it's, the, it's the premise of, of my uh, talk and article um, that, law, that law in fact uh, is, is a weapon uh, of oppression, uh, and um, and that it all started in what sounds like very very old uh, history, uh, but it continues to influence the law. In fact, be the law uh, um, today. Uh, so, in fact, when the when the settlers did land in uh, in in Plymouth, in what's now Massachusetts, in 1620, um, they uh, they were engaged in a period of military battles and wars, which Professor Berger referred to also, um, for about a 50 year uh, period. But following uh, in Southern New England, about 1675, um, uh, the Southern New England uh, uh, colonies changed strategies and implemented the primary new weapon, which was not warfare, and that was law. That was law. That was law used to maintain control, uh, to oppress and to subjugate them. And what the, what the, the uncomfortable truth is that not, not only is it uncomfortable that, that it is law and legal processes, legislation, uh, judicial decisions, uh, treaties, uh, treaty violation, not only is it that it's law itself uh, that is uh, implemented uh, to subjugate the indigenous uh, peoples of, 
uh, New England, but that it is done and was done and has been done from a, 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 a position of racial uh, a superiority, a belief of racial superiority. Um, and this, this, uh, this, is, this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable uh, for lawyers to talk about, to learn about, to recognize. Um, and this oppression of the legal processes to oppress um, and continue to oppress uh, has never been acknowledged uh, by states, um, never uh, been acknowledged by courts, by st state legislatures, uh, never recognized by the organized bar, um, nor has it ever has been, has been an attempt in New England to remedy it. And so it's my position in the article that what we've created is a New England exception to Indian law. That progress is, is being made, slight progress elsewhere, but uh, not in Southern uh, New England. Um, and so this belief that the indigenous people were racially inferior, right? Um, is at the heart of conquest, of the conquest. Um, and th that they considered themselves that the, uh, that the uh, settlers, the Puritan settlers of uh, New England uh, considered themselves superior. Um, th th you know, so did the, uh, the other Christian European settlers from Spain and Portugal and Holland and Great Britain. Um, but it's my position that the, uh, the colonization of, of New England and North America can only be properly viewed and understood as a continuation of the Catholic Church sponsored crusades to the Holy Lands and the Middle East from the 11th through 13th centuries. The, uh, the crusades were a broad-based campaign by the Catholic Church and uh, Christian European military leaders to implement the papacy's theoretical universal authority over non-Christian people beyond Europe. And it was the Crusades that generated legal doctrine that justified to them uh, legal conquest uh, of non-Christians. Uh, and so I know this may seem like, uh, you, you know, we're, we're dwelling on ancient history, but it's not ancient history. And it influenced the law, uh, the Indian law of today and continues to be the law of the land. So let's talk about where this, church-based doctrine uh, of superiority and a racial inferiority of indigenous people uh, came from. Um, among the uh, leading church scholars who developed um, uh, canon doctrine was Pope Innocent the uh, Fourth. And uh, Innocent uh, was, uh, before he took on that uh, papal name, uh, he was a, a canon lawyer. He was a lawyer, okay? A canon lawyer uh, named uh, Sinibaldo Fieschi. Um, and uh, as, a, as a lawyer uh, and philosopher, legal philosopher, um, he was one of the most influential figures in development of Christian infidel uh, relations, as it was, uh, it was called. And he becomes a uh, pope in uh, 1243. And as Pope, Innocent uh, wrote that, the, that Popes had the authority to conquer infidels. In fact, they had the, uh, the duty to conquer and punish infidels wherever they found them. And, uh, and so he asks the question here, 
asks the question, um, is it licit, is it permissible to invade a land that infidels possess that belongs uh, to them? He says, yes, you know, Pope has jurisdiction over all men. And he says that um, the Pope has the power um, and he, he to, to lawfully punish the infidel, he says, and he's, he quotes, you know, uh, uh, Old uh, Testament Bible, you know, he quotes and compares it to, uh, to, to God punishing uh, the inhabitants of Sodom who sinned against the laws of nature. So he says, just as uh, uh, God's judgment is an example to us, I don't see why the Pope, who is the vicar of Christ, can't do the same. In fact, he ought to punish the infidels um, as long as he has the ability uh, to. And so, uh, so innocent, uh, uh, you know, influences the, uh, uh, the, the crusades, which then uh, continue. And uh, not, af not many years after the, uh, the medieval crusades, which were brutal, right, in killing uh, non-Christians, right? Um, uh, explorers like Columbus um, and John Cabot and uh, de Verrazzano uh, of Italy and, and uh, Block of, of Holland and, and Hudson of Great Britain. So they embark on uh, lengthy uh, and difficult missions of exploration, sure. But they do so with uh, royal charters from European kings and queens. And so what we get is a coordinated campaign, a coordinated campaign between the church, uh, European governments, their military leaders, and the explorers. Well, now the, um, the kings also uh, viewed the indigenous people as inferior. Um, and here's their observations. This is one. Uh, uh, Duarte, king of Portugal, who was giving his view of the inhabitants of the Canary Islands in 1436. He says, look, they're not unified by a common religion. They don't follow law. Um, they, they, they live in the country like animals, he says. No contact with each other, no writings. Uh, they don't have money. They're not, you know, they're not, they're unsophisticated, unsophisticated. No houses, no clothing except palm leaves. Um, they run through the woods uh, barefoot and uh, naked, uh, hidden in the uh, caves. And this was, you know, continuing this uh, view of the indigenous peoples as, uh, as inferior. So the uh, church gives the, uh, the explorers papal uh, direction to conquer non-Christians and, and then seize their villages, okay? You find non-Christians, uh, seize their villages. And here is another example of this papal um, uh, directive to uh, find the, uh, the infidels in your exploration and, and seize their uh, villages. So says uh, Pope Alexander in 1493, moving along a little in, in history. Uh, by the authority of God conferred upon us uh, and the vicarship of Jesus Christ. Um, I tell you, well, you your envoys, your captains, um, I assign to you the lands you find, uh, you know, with all the dominions and their cities, their camps, their villages, uh, seize them. Um, and so uh, that's where this, uh, this, this, this church campaign of conquest uh, comes from. So that, you know, the explorers then take it a step further, and we get to uh, the colonial uh, era. And so the belief of, of Indian inferiority was directed by the church um, and uh, uh, followed by the, the military uh, leaders into uh, the European colonies uh, here uh, in New England and then, and then beyond. Well, uh, in the first few years, um, there was relative uh, peace, but it didn't last for long. Uh, I'd say there were, in southern New England, approximately about 50 years 
of warfare. Uh, when we saw um, the, uh, the Pequot War that Professor Berger talked about from 1637 to 1638, and the King Philip's War from 1665 to 1676, with brutal massacres, um, like Professor Berger talked about at Mystic, but also uh, the Great Swamp Massacre here in Rhode Island in 1675. Well, those wars uh, did uh, really decimate the indigenous peoples of New England. Um, and many of the uh, survivors were in fact enslaved. Um, warfare continues in, in the Northern part of New England uh, further into the next century, like the, the wars with the Wabanaki Confederacy uh, well into the 18th century. Um, and it's important to note that the warfare uh, uh, was not the only significant cause of, of death in, in New England, but in fact, it was also uh, epidemic of uh, infectious diseases, which is interesting uh, from a historical point of view and what we're going through uh, today. Uh, but the, um, the, the seamless transition from military weaponry uh, to erase and dehumanize the, uh, the American Indian to a reliance on law and legal processes is summed up by none other than uh, General George Washington. And uh, Washington in 1783 recognizes that, you know, and questions, uh, why should we uh, continue uh, to be fighting these wars uh, with the Indians? It's expensive when we could purchase their land much more inexpensively. Um, and uh, here's what he writes, um, and what is um, what is so uh, troubling is that um, and revealing is that this colonial era of political belief from Washington, the preeminent colonial military leader uh, of the Indians, he compares them to uh, the wolves. Uh, you know, he says, uh, "Look." We could keep chasing them, uh, you know, into the forest. It's like driving the wild beasts into the forest, but they're just going to come back um, uh, when the gradual extension of our settlements will certainly cause the savage as the wolf to retire. Here's the here's the offensive, most offensive language, um, both being beasts of prey, though they differ uh, in, in, uh, in shape, um, he, he says. Um, and so, whereas the military warfare, um, you know, ends in Southern New England, um, about 1680 or so, the shift is then to, uh, legal institutions and, uh, colonial and then subsequently U S law, um, continued this philosophy uh, uh, of the European theocracy and the church um, continued from the, from the popes, the church, to the, uh, ex to the monarchs, explorers, to the, to the, to the colonists uh, and to the settlers um, as, 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 as an inferior uh, people. Um, so now um, the, uh, the policy of, uh, of, of law in Southern New England uh, had many common attributes. Um, while inconsistent, uh, it was in fact a, a policy um, uh, to diminish them, defeat them, but assimilate when that couldn't be done, but to make them invisible uh, has been, uh, as Patai uh, talked about, separate them in New England into what was called praying towns, in Massachusetts, plantations uh, in Rhode Island, or reservations. Well, the policies were, in fact, uh, implemented to either eliminate them, uh, to uh, deny their existence, or make them uh, invisible. Um, and this was wholly consistent with uh, the theme, I, I, I believe, uh, of that colonization is just a continuous continuation of church-sponsored uh, subjugation 
uh, uh, and to either eliminate them or to convert them to Christianity. Uh, but we see in colonial legislation, um, many examples of continuing to treat uh, the Indians uh, as inferior. Um, the, um, let me just stop my slide for just a second. Yeah, the, uh, it, the, the laws in Southern New England uh, treated them as, as wholly inferior. And now um, it's, it, it, it's a overly simplistic for me to describe these without going into a much more complicated explanation of the relationship uh, between the, uh, the indigenous people and the settlers and, and, and what was going on in law. But let's, let me just give you some examples of legislation that was enacted, laws that were passed in the colonies uh, dealing with the indigenous people here in Southern New England. Well, here in Rhode Island, um, uh, the law was uh, used to make it difficult for them to survive because uh, it restricted their ability to hunt, uh, banning them from taking uh, deer. Um, native culture was banned in Rhode Island uh, in 1729. Uh, native dance was banned, referred to as disorderly dances. The position of tribal sachem was banned in uh, 1729 in Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island made it illegal for, uh, for Indians to be out in public at night. It made it, uh, one statute uh, ordered all the uh, resident, the Indians of Portsmouth to leave Portsmouth and live in the woods. Um, the lands of the Narragansett by statute were ordered to be seized. Uh, one Rhode Island statute uh, declared the Indians a menace to Providence. In Massachusetts, uh, statutes restricted the sale of boats or horses to Indians, making it difficult for them to, uh, to exist. Um, Native culture in Massachusetts also banned, powwows banned in Massachusetts in 1633. Um, 1675, Indians uh, walking around uh, freely uh, uh, could be captured or killed the bounty on their head. Massachusetts, um, Indians couldn't move about freely. Uh, in 1675, Indians weren't permitted in Boston. And non-Indians were not allowed to socialize uh, with them. In Connecticut, the policies of separation and domination took a slightly different approach. In 1650, the general court enacted legislation that uh, prohibited Indians from living with non-Indians. Um, what the court did was appoint what was called overseers of the Indians um, in Connecticut, which was euphemistically said would counsel and advise them, but it turned out uh, to be a, a little different. Um, the uh, role of the overseer um, expanded and an overseer was appointed to each tribe in, uh, in Connecticut to mandate uh, that the affairs of Connecticut Indians were managed properly. I think I do have a slide with uh, some of these overseers. Let's see. Hold on. No, hold on. Let's go back. Here we go. Yeah. Um, the uh, overseers uh, were um, uh, overseers like, uh, like attorney, Connecticut lawyer, William uh, Williams, um, who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. But most of the overseers um, showed very little interest in tribal matters. Others of them were corrupt and profiteered, uh, made profit from their overseeing, like one William Morgan. The Pequots sought to fire Morgan, claiming he wasn't suitable uh, to manage their affairs. The uh, legislature, uh, uh, then passed a statute, state statute called the Act for the Preservation of Indians, also uh, a misnomer um, because that legislation uh, made it possible for the elimination of much of the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation. Uh, Morgan and other overseers divided up Pequot lands, reserving just 180 acres for the Pequots. Um, let's turn our attentions to uh, how the courts have used law uh, as a weapon of oppression, but also um, how what I was talking about earlier as the church-based imposed uh, notion of, of Indian inferiority continues 
uh, into U.S. law and, in fact, is the basis for, uh, for U.S. Uh, uh, law. So, in fact, I maintain that there's a direct line uh, uh, of, uh, of philosophical belief and, and underpinning of, of from the popes to the kings uh, to, the, uh, to the explorers, to the, to the colonists, to the U.S. Supreme Court, to the U.S. Supreme Court. And that the United States Supreme Court was explicit about its belief that the Indians were inferior and of European superiority as the European, uh, as, the, as the legal justification for diminishment of Indian rights. And so the next case, the case I'm going to talk about is very uh, famous. Uh, and we get, we get the, um, let me just give this a full, full uh, slide share here. Hold on. Um, I'm sorry. Struggling with the slides a little bit. Uh, hold on. Okay, it's okay. Um, so in, in 1823, Justice Marshall, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, invents something called the Doctrine of Discovery, which is, uh, which is very well known. Um, and, and he says, you, you know, that due to the precedents of, uh, established by the explorers um, and quote unquote discovery of North America um, and then conquest, um, that, that property title uh, belongs to the nation which quote unquote discovers the new land. Uh, and as a result of this uh, principle is the diminishment of natives ability to dispose of the lands uh, subject to uh, uh, the natives could live on it but could not transfer it. But the language uh, of the decision makes it clear that we're still operating on a basis of racial inferiority. Uh, and of superiority of, of the colonizer um, on the discovery of this immense continent, uh, the great nations of Europe so eager to appropriate to themselves as much as they could acquire. Um, and, uh, but look, look at the, the, the next uh, uh, sentences, uh, which are sometimes glossed over, um, the character and the religion of the inhabitants, the indigenous people, um, afford an apology for considering as them a people or the superior genius of Europe can claim ascendancy, can claim superiority. Look, he's referring to the character and religion uh, of the inhabitants. Uh, he, refer, they are referred to, uh, as, in fact, as inferior. Uh, doctrine of discovery um, is then uh, imported to Canada and Australia, uh, New Zealand. Continue this. This case continues to be cited uh, all, by, by the U.S. Supreme Court all of the time. It's the basis for federal Indian law, with several other cases: the Cherokee versus Georgia, uh, Worcester versus Georgia. Those uh, Marshall model of Indian law. The doctrine of discovery. Um, and the immense power of Johnson versus McIntosh um, uh, find their way again into uh, a court case, uh, Beecher versus Weatherby, in the uh, 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 by the Supreme Court. Um, and here again, they uh, talk about um, you know it's presumed that the uh, the United States would be governed by such considerations of justice as would control a Christian people in their treatment of an ignorant and dependent race. This is how the United States is talking about the United States Supreme Court in 1877, 50 years later, uh, after Johnson versus McIntosh um, as a ignorant and dependent race, uh, clear, clearly, Again, continuing the notion in Johnson of a European superiority and of the church uh, uh, a doctrine uh, uh, as, uh, as the duty to, uh, 
to, to, to conquer uh, those who are uh, in, inferior. Um, and so that's 1870, uh, 1877. Um, and the, the doctrine of discovery heavily influences uh, the law in, uh, in New England. Uh, it is, um, it's cited uh, here in uh, Rhode Island in, uh, in 1898 in a case called uh, uh, In Re Narragansett's where the, the uh, Rhode Island Supreme Court is called upon to, uh, to answer the question of whether or not the Narragansett tribe still exists or have they been terminated by law. Uh, and in a, what I think is centuries old tradition here in Rhode Island of, 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 of trying to say the Narragansetts don't exist, uh, the, uh, Chief, the not, uh, Associate Justice uh, um, uh, Horatio Rogers of the Rhode Island uh, Supreme Court says, uh, you know, uh, they're, not, they're not even really Narragansetts, they're just a decayed remnant, decayed remnant. How insulting is this to a sovereign people? Decayed remnant of the Niantics. And we think uh, tribal relations uh, can be and were in fact terminated uh, by, uh, by Rhode Island law, he says. Well, uh, in, uh, in you know, moving back to US Supreme Court, um, uh, a few years uh, later, the uh, Supreme Court uh, says that it is, uh, it's uh, never been questioned that uh, the United States can break treaties with the Indians. Never been doubted that uh, we can break treaties with them. Why? Um, you know, uh, we, we entered treaties with them. It's because they're Indians, right? That's why. Um, uh, it was never doubted that Congress had the power to uh, break the treaties with the Indians, and that's what uh, the law of the land is. Uh, Congress has the right to abrogate treaties, to break treaties, to go back uh, on its word. Uh, they said in Lone Wolf versus uh, Hitchcock, and that in fact uh, too uh, is still uh, the law of the land. And after, uh, after that, um, they went on to uh, abrogate uh, treaties, which were obstacles to continued uh, seizure of, uh, of, of land. Well, um, the, uh, the Supreme Court then uh, 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 continues to um, you know, look at indigenous justice. Um, and uh, in, a, in, a, in 1886, um, they are uh, extremely uh, dissatisfied uh, with indigenous justice and pass the Major Crimes Act. Um, and uh, and then uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a case called United States versus Kagama, when, it, when deciding uh, whether US law um, uh, can supplant indigenous dispute resolution uh, in criminal court, uh, in a case called US versus Kagama, they again uh, refer to uh, the Indians as uh, uh, weak and helpless. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, says in uh, Kagama, um, from their very weakness and helplessness, uh, uh, so largely due to the course of dealing with the federal government, uh, there arises a duty of uh, protection. It refers to them, again, as weak and helpless. So let's, let's see where we've been here already uh, this morning. Uh, we've got uh, you know, a church uh, originated notion of superiority, a uh, view of Indians as inferior. Uh, we've got the U.S. Supreme Court uh, saying, uh, you, you know, that they are in fact uh, inferior to the European genius. Um, we've got conquest, we've got military conquest, they're decimated, they uh, are dispersing uh, in southern New England and New England, um, going elsewhere, there's very few of them remaining, which uh, brings us uh, to the, into the, uh, the modern era. And in the modern era, uh, things um, sometimes change uh, and are changing in other parts of the country. 
but I maintain that there's, there's still, there's an exception to Indian law uh, in, uh, in New England. So um, national legal policy in the 20th century goes through many swings of the pendulum from periods of well-intentioned New Deal uh, era reforms like the Indian Reorganization Act, only to see bitter retrenchment in the 1950s with a policy of Indian termination, um, language like you saw for, in, from the Rhode Island Supreme Court. Uh, the pendulum swings back again, more recent times, with a period of what was, is referred to as self-determination. Uh, but, but again, the tribes of Southern New England uh, are for the most part, and the peoples of Southern New England, largely unaffected by national trends, unable to break out of centuries of discrimination uh, implemented under the color of law. And uh, Professor uh, Berger talked about the recognition uh, process a little bit. Um, and indeed, uh, it is a steep mountain to climb in New England uh, based on the, uh, on the history. Um, the history of erasure, of elimination, uh, of conquest, uh, and, and, uh, and, and 400 years of, of law. Well, those five tribes that have been recognized indeed uh, in, in uh, Southern New England uh, are the Mohegans and the Mashantucket Pequots, the Mashpee Wampanoag and Narragansetts and the Aquina uh, Wampanoags uh, in Massachusetts. And obviously there uh, are the, the Wabanaki, uh, several tribes of the Wabanaki uh, Confederacy further uh, north. So how are uh, the tribes um, and indigenous peoples of New England being treated uh, today? Well. Gone is the overt um, racism of, uh, of in the court language um, that that you saw in in the legislation and and in uh, judicial uh, decisions, um, but the campaign to erase and eliminate them continues in a much more uh, subtle uh, way. And uh, I'll just briefly touch on this, uh, but indeed the uh, recognition process. Um, in fact, makes it uh, nearly impossible for indigenous peoples. If there has been uh, a, a break in continuity, um, the recognition process does not allow tribes that historically existed um, to, uh, to, to come back together um, if, if they have not continually existed in one place, in one time, uh, one people, one place since uh, before, uh, since European uh, contact, which is extremely hard uh, to do. Um, I think also uh, membership uh, law, which um, defines who is an Indian and this uh, notion of measuring Indian blood, which is uh, demeaning, uh, insulting, uh, and really designed to negate and divide uh, uh, indigenous uh, people also. Uh, makes it uh, exceptionally uh, uh, difficult to be. So you have to be, you know, a, a member and uh, defined as a member uh, of a recognized uh, tribe. Um, it makes it difficult. I also think that the states uh, of Southern New England, uh, like many states, have continued to litigate against the indigenous people. Um, and, and for example, when the uh, native uh, nations uh, in New England um, uh, sued to say that you know the uh, the seizure of their lands was a violation in the colonial era of the Non-Intervention Act, uh, the states all fought them rather than uh, to uh, enter into a a thoughtful process and, and dialogue about Aboriginal land. They just fought to defeat them. In court, what ended up happening was uh, uh, in the Northeast uh, and in New England was this the enactment of these settlement acts, which brought state jurisdiction and state power into uh, Indian country, uh, rather than uh, limiting it like it does in the rest of the country. It invited it in. It gave uh, judicial uh, 
uh, jurisdiction to courts, to state courts uh, in Indian country, which is the exception, not the rule uh, in the rest of uh, the country. Uh, continuing States continuing to go to court to fight the tribes uh, when they seek to uh, expand economic uh, development. Um, and, but here's the, uh, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Uh, Indian law rests on this bedrock of these decisions, uh, like uh, Johnson versus McIntosh um, and uh, the other uh, Cherokee cases uh, that are based on a notion of racial superiority of the colonizer and inferiority of the indigenous people and, the, and, you know, and, that, and almost uh, uh, them being not human. This is the bedrock of law. And those cases have not only have they've never been reversed, they've never been repudiated, they've never been acknowledged as racist, um, and 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 it can and they are the law and they are cited uh, today uh, as the law. Um, and uh, you know I think that uh, that's 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 you know so part of this of this problem is in fact you know recognizing. Uh, this uncomfortable uh, truth. And so rather than uh, continuing to fight uh, the, uh, the indigenous people every time they uh, propose economic development or, or taking back some land, uh, land back as uh, Taino talked about, they continue to, uh, to wage uh, a battle of subtle, continued, uh, what, I, what, what Professor Robert Williams calls, you know, uh, um, playing to savage anger. Williams, uh, uh, esteemed professor who uh, wrote this book, Savage Anxieties, you know, uh, so when the Indians sue to, uh, to say their lands were seized illegally in violation of the Non-Intervention Act, you know, uh, attorneys general go to court and what they're, you know, saying is, you know, these Indians are coming for your land. Um, you're, you know, and and, and it, these are scare tactics employed to scare people that you know that the Indians are coming for your land. Rather than try to find land that for, that could be given back to the tribal nations, um, they uh, try to scare people and, and and impose these you know settlement acts that can continue to diminish. And these settlement acts. Did in fact, uh, uh, you know, open up tiny, tiny reservations uh, in New England, very small land. Then they fought again. The New England states fought them again, and uh, you'll see in a great, great talk uh, later this afternoon uh, from uh, from Bethany Sullivan and Jen Turner. We're going to talk about how Rhode Island states fought um, fought the tribes you know, from being able to take land into trust, which is, which is the national process for tribes getting land back. It's the New England tribes fighting. Uh, Carcieri, you know, Carcieri, you know, was the governor of Rhode Island uh, and uh, fighting the tribes being obstacles to a, uh, you know, reversing, a reversal of, of history. Well, uh, we have seen, you know, some positive signs around the country uh, in, in the last few years. Like, for example, um, when Gus Justice Gorsuch a few years ago uh, decided uh, McGirt versus Oklahoma, Supreme Court said, in fact, a large swath of Oklahoma is, in fact, uh, Indian country. That was a big win. And recently, uh, uh, Bay Mills versus uh, Michigan, as uh, Professor uh, Fletcher uh, knows a great deal about uh, recognizing the uh, strength in tribal sovereign uh, immunity, uh, but much more uh, legal doctrine and the abuses of law as a weapon uh, of subjugation uh, needs to be reversed, acknowledged, and apologized for apologized for it. Well, I think that, um, you know, in, uh, in Maine, um, they are uh, at least, you know, starting 
it started a process of truth and reconciliation with how uh, law has been used to oppress indigenous uh, peoples in Maine and especially uh, children. Uh, and that's happening in, in Rhode Island as well. At least it's begun to happen. I give uh, great credit to Mayor uh, uh, Lorza and uh, this is a, a reconciliation, at least a discussion. And that's uh, what we're doing here. That's what we're doing here all day. Um, is that we you know, need a process of, of uh, unveiling recognizing uh, you know, the hidden truths and how law has been used to oppress. Before we can reverse it, we have to recognize it and acknowledge it, maybe, maybe apologize for it. But in fact, despite uh, all of this, the uh, indigenous peoples uh, in uh, New England uh, you know, have persisted, uh, are you know, still here, they have survived. They are not disappearing. You are still here. Um, and we recognize and acknowledge and honor you. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and native culture um, exists here. Uh, and there's, you know, we can only uh, um, move forward. Uh, but the place to, and here's a, just a picture of some of my friends in, on Martha's Vineyard uh, who uh, celebrate indigenous uh, ritual of Cranberry Day uh, on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the Wampanoags on Martha's Vineyard are true survivors, uh, true survivors. And, uh, uh, but in fact, it's real, it is important for us um, to, uh, to recognize what the role has been of law, it's important for us to, uh, lawyers at every level, federal, state, municipal lawyers, uh, the organized bar, law professors, state legislatures, state attorneys general, town and village lawyers, and the courts to acknowledge what has been the role of law uh, to subjugate and dehumanize and oppress a people. The first thing we can do is to expose what has been hidden, to talk about it, to reveal it, and maybe, maybe start to make reparations. Only then can we start to heal the deep wounds that have been inflicted by the law. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Diamond. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, and we do have some time for some questions. So um, the first one, um, I think really ties into what you were, you were just talking about, about um, reparations and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Um, so this one says, um, what do you think can be done to remedy all the harm that the courts and federal government have done to indigenous people like, what does justice look like to address the oppression? Well, there is no limit to what can be done in law and what has been done by law and, and the courts uh, to remedy some of these harms. I'll just give you a couple of, uh, of you know, examples. Um, in the 1970s, um, the United States Supreme Court said that uh, Indian tribes uh, cannot assert criminal power, criminal jurisdiction in their tribal courts when non-Indians commit crimes in Indian country. No power. You go on to a sovereign nation's land, they have a tribal court. Uh, and, and you can't police it, you can't uh, impose regulation over it, you have no jurisdiction over it. Uh, and this is, this, has, uh, this is harmful and destructive. Um, Native nations always had, all nations have power to 
uh, to um, impose their nationhood in, 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 in jurisprudence over those who came onto their land and, and uh, were a, an impediment to public safety, public health and safety. Uh, and that uh, decision, Oliphant versus Sukamish, should be reversed. Uh, and, and, and should be reversed um, and Indian, should be, Indian tribes should be given jurisdiction over, over non-Indian offenders. We've seen a little bit of progress, a, a pilot program uh, which recognizes that uh, um, um, uh, Indians uh, are victims of crime and, and largely indigenous women are, uh, are victims of crime by non-Indian uh, non men, of domestic and sexual violence. Uh, and, and, and yet there's, there's, a, there's a difficulty in prosecuting those cases uh, for lots and lots of reasons that I can go into. Uh, and so there's, we're beginning to give Indian tribes a little bit of authority back into prosecuting those cases to fill a void in, uh, in, 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 in prosecution and some justice for uh, victims. That's in, you know, uh, that could occur. Um, reversing, um, making it easier for indigenous people to get recognition. Um, uh, you know, and, to, and, and a lot, look, what you're seeing throughout Southern New England uh, is indigenous people saying, we're still here. And, and whether we can gain, uh, can, meet, can mount the, the obstacles of uh, federal recognition now, uh, you know, we're still here. And so, for example, allowing historic tribes to reconstitute themselves, um, you, you know, I think is, would be a, uh, an important change. Uh, their policies say that they can't reconstitute themselves, even if they're a historic tribe who can show that they existed at contact. Um, but look at what happened to them through war, through conquest, through, uh, through erasure, disease, et cetera, um, uh, through, uh, you know, uh, legislation, dehumanization, um, you know, and, and so it's nearly impossible for so many of them to get recognition. Make, the, make, that, uh, make that, you know, make those, uh, make those changes. Um, the state should stop fighting them should look for ways to solve the problems rather than fight them. Um, I look for parcels of land that may exist that are contiguous with reservations uh, that are held maybe in parkland um, uh, and assist them in buying the land back rather than uh, being an obstacle uh, uh, to, to that. Um, uh, can work with uh, non-recognized uh, people uh, in, in lots of ways, in health and welfare and Indian child welfare um, as well, uh, recognize the realities uh, in, in New England and uh, elsewhere. Um, and and, and, and um, perhaps recognize the, the policies of, you know, of erasure uh, as well, uh, erasure as well, of not counting them uh, uh, based on blood quantum and et cetera. That's a couple of ideas. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is whether you think that these studies and your research only have a place within the concentration of indigenous law or to what extent you think it could be integrated into doctrinal curricula, especially in property law. Well, um, well that's, a, that's a great question. I, mean, I think that um, discrimination on the basis of race that exists in, in jurisprudence, um, who, you know, wherever it exists and whatever people it has been used to subjugate should be exposed and discussed and taught rather than glossed over and say, you know, rather than glossed over, and deny it, uh, it should be uh, it should be acknowledged and and taught um, everywhere. Um, 
you, you, you know, uh, and it, it much of um, what my research uh, shows in the legislation is that, you know, many of the statutes that we find in the colonial era referred to, uh, to, to blacks uh, and, and the, you know, the former slaves the same, in the same sentences uh, and treat the indigenous people and the you know, descendants of, of slaves um, in, the, in the same way, same exact way. And that should be revealed and exposed um, as well uh, and taught uh, in, in property law and in criminal law uh, in family law as well, uh, because um, it, you know it'll it will continue to be denied uh, uh, or or not recognized as a problem unless it's taught uh, to the next generation of lawyers. I have great hope in the next generation uh, of lawyers. You guys uh, look like like uh, we you know the like Taino and and. Uh, and Ray and so many other of my students uh, who are here in the room, um, uh, you 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 guys you know asked for this learning, um, and I'm signing up in big numbers for the classes. Uh, I'll just give you an example. Um, this week at Roger Williams University Law School, we had registration for next semester. Tribal courts, tribal law, tribal governments class has never existed here before last year when I taught it. Class that uh, Professor Fletcher teaches at Michigan State University. It opened, uh, this class opened up a registration on Monday and filled on Monday with third year students, not giving any seats to second year students. It filled up. And so we opened, we've opened it up for more students, but students are showing up. Students are are saying they want to learn this, they want to talk about it, you know, they want to, they want to learn, and, uh, and, you know, and are organizing not only classes and schools, but programs like this, and the law review, Hannah, and your law review, students on law review saying, you want to do a symposium on this, this has never happened before, so I have great faith in the next generation, uh, in, in, that learning will occur, pedagogy will occur, and we can expose uh, the, the hidden truth uh, in, in, in not just Indian law cases, but in wills and trusts, in family law, uh, in, uh, in, interna in, cases of, in, in classes of international law, criminal law, and beyond. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a couple more questions, if you don't mind. I know we're a couple minutes over 1230. Um, but this next one says, since Christianity is so entrenched in U.S. society, how can we get a national and meaningful acknowledgement of the Christian responsibility for the destruction of Indian nations and culture? Well, I'm not a Catholic, um, but you know, I think that it's not you know it's not and it's not just the Catholic Church. Uh, it's not just the Catholic Church, but I think that there needs to be you know, um, uh, recognition. And, you know, I think um, I've explored in my research um, the power of restorative justice, the power of, of reconciliation, the power of atonement, and, uh, and you know, a dialogue, um, and, 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 uh, and, you know, asking for forgiveness, but not just asking for forgiveness, not just making a land acknowledgement, which is all, which is all important, which is all important, but a commitment to change, a, a commitment to recognizing the role uh, that you've had. So, if the church, you know, um, it, you know, uh, um, sought colonization as a way to defeat the infidel, acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge that the role that that had in, in causing death, enslavement, pain, suffering, and take responsibility for it, accountability and responsibility. Uh, and so if, if we, you know, if, if we have a dialogue, 
and we can engage. Look, the Pope has never apologized for those papal bulls and papal doctrines that were used uh, as a, a campaign of, uh, of, of, of warfare and oppression. The Pope, Pope has never apologized for it uh, and, uh, and sought the very atonement that the, that the Bible talks about um, uh, and forgiveness. And, I, and it's, at least it's a place to start. Great, thank you. So we do have one more question. Um, if the law is a weapon of oppression, how do law professors approach their curriculum, approach to their curriculum, perpetrate this, perpetuate this this discourse? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, I, look, I, I think that um, a lot of lawyers and law professors don't know that this is the history of where law comes from. And, and you know, because it's been hidden, buried. Um, and so you might study some of the cases, um, but when it comes to that paragraph about, you know, European superiority and a weak and dependent uh, Indian nation, maybe it gets glossed over. Or maybe, maybe not a great deal of attention is paid to it. Um, and, and, you know, I think the other problem is that it's a really difficult problem about what do you do now? You know, and so, you know, judges wrestle with it. Well, what do you want me to do now? You know, there's, there's what do you do now? Um, but you know, it should be taught. Um, and, and so we, we don't have a chance of recognizing it uh, if we don't, you know, if we don't teach it, right? We don't have a chance of reversing it. Uh, well, look, I, you know, I don't know how, you can't write a brief on Indian law without citing Judge Johnson versus McIntosh. So, you know, at least acknowledge it, um, acknowledge it. Uh, and and teach the full implications of what of what the doctrine is you know is all about um, and uh, you know and and the Supreme Court and federal courts can acknowledge it as well uh, can acknowledge it as well that it sits on a bedrock of unsound uh, unsound philosophy. Great, thank you. Um, so that basically wraps up your time today. So thank, thank you, you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and like I've asked the other speakers, is there a way for the audience today um, to get in contact with you, either with follow-up questions or um, to stay in contact about your work? I'm going to uh, put my email address up here on the screen. You see it? Yes. If you, do you mind zooming in just slightly, potentially? Well, I'm so, not sure how to do that. Yeah, I don't know how to do that either right now because <laughs> I've got my whole screen open. Uh, that's, that's okay. Um, let's see. Can, uh, yeah, I make it bigger. How about that? That would be great. Is it little? Is it tiny? There we go. Okay. okay. Hannah, thank you so much. Sure. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so to the audience, um, we are now going to take a quick uh, lunch break, um, or if you're on the West Coast, I guess, coffee break. Um, and we will start with our next speakers, um, Bethany Sullivan and Jennifer Turner, promptly at 1.15. So either stay on um, or please log back in. Um, we have three more wonderful speakers this afternoon. Um, so thank you. And I will see everyone at 1.15. Okay, everyone, as we round out to about 1.15 p.m., um, I just wanna welcome anyone who has just joined us this afternoon um, and welcome back those of you who were with us this morning and thank you for attending this symposium. Um, I wanna take a quick minute to reiterate some of the um, sort of policies, I guess, about the question and answer period. So um, as I've mentioned before, um, I will act as your moderator for the rest of this symposium.
Uh, my name is Hannah, if anybody has any questions. Um, but for the Q&A period, that will happen at the end of every speaker's opportunity to share um, and present. I ask that you still stay muted. Um, and if you would like to ask a question, um, use the hand raise function and I will call your name to unmute and ask your question. If you would prefer to not unmute, you can send me your message as a direct message um, so as not to disrupt the presentation or the um, speaker who is presenting. Um, along with that, um, please do not message during the presentation. Um, it'll pop up on everybody's screen um, and it'll sort of disrupt. So please refrain from using the chat function in that way. Um, but if you do have any concerns or questions, please feel free to direct message me. Um, and then finally, I do encourage all of you to view this presentation um, in speaker view on Zoom so that the speaker and their presentation are um, consistently the largest on your screen. All right, now that it is 1.15, again, welcome back um, to our afternoon session of this symposium. Um, our next featured speakers, who I believe have both joined us, um, are a duo speaking on the carcieri decision. Um, Bethany Sullivan is a senior associate attorney with Meyer Pfeiffer, Kim Geary and Cohen, LLP. She advises broadly on tribal governance, economic development, free to trust land acquisitions, gaming and business transactions, and other matters involving tribal, federal, and state law. She was the founding director of the Natural Resource Use and Management Clinic at the University of Arizona College of Law, and has since worked with a variety of clients, including tribal governments, and taught courses on natural resource and administrative law. And Jennifer Turner is the assistant city attorney in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, prior to this role, Ms. Turner was an associate at Fry and Kelly PC and served as an assistant solicitor at the U.S. Department of the Interior Division of Indian Affairs. Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Turner will be providing an update on the Kersiari decision following the 2019 publication of their article, Enough is Enough, 10 Years of Kersiari versus Salazar. Um, please help me welcome Ms. Turner and Ms. Sullivan as our first afternoon speakers, and I will let them further introduce themselves and share screen as desired. All right. Well, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. We're really excited to have been invited. Jim, it's good to see you in the corner there on my screen. Um, yeah, so Jennifer is going to be the tech expert in our presentation. Um, she'll be the one running our PowerPoint. Um, so I, maybe we can give you a moment, Jennifer, to, to get that up on the screen. One minute. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Should be sharing my screen any minute now. And I'm going to hit from beginning. Um, Zoom never works when you want it to. It only works when there are small children and dogs making inappropriate appearances on your work meetings. So um, I'm hoping, there we go. Okay, can everyone see our presentation? Great. Great. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, Jennifer and I both have worked on the Karcheri uh, issue very closely uh, during our time at Interior. We were involved in sort of the development of the two-part framework and its implementation. Uh, we played a hand at drafting um, some of the departmental criteria determinations, and we certainly were very involved in litigation defending many of these decisions. So it's um, an issue that's very close to both of us and we're both very passionate about. Um, so with that being said, I will hand it over to Jennifer, who is actually my boss at Interior. And just so you know, we're going to handle this so that each of us is kind of addressing various slides, um, but we have a tendency to interrupt each other. And hopefully that'll make for a more robust discussion here. So just be forewarned. Thanks, Bethany. And thanks um, to Hannah and to everyone for inviting us to speak today. Um, just the sort of standard disclaimer is the views that we'll be expressing um, this afternoon are our own views and do not reflect the views of our employers or of our clients or of the Department of the Interior. 
So with that said, today we'll be speaking about the continued impact of Cartieri on the restoration of tribal lands in New England and beyond. Um, and just an overview of our presentation. Um, first, we'll be talking about land into trust and why it matters um, before moving into a discussion of the Cartieri v. Salazar decision. And then we'll be talking about its aftermath, including the Department of the Interior's response to the decision through the Obama, Trump, and Biden administrations. Um, and then we'll be discussing um, how Cartieri has impacted New England tribes um, before ending with our recommendations on where we go from here. So what is the fee to trust process and why does it matter to tribes? Um, to answer that question, we really need to look at the allotment area era in federal Indian policy, which really started in 1887 when Congress enacted the General Allotment Act to break up tribal lands and divide them into 80 and 160 acre parcels for individual tribal members. And the policy of the federal government at that time was um, to break up tribal land holdings and open those tribal lands to settlement. Um, and also really there was a policy of assimilation whereby tribes and um, uh, individual Indians were trying to be held to the Western ideals of the independent farmer and rancher. So the allotment um, policy was a, a catastrophic failure um, and resulted in huge losses of tribal lands, um, uh, over two thirds, in fact, from roughly 138 million acres to 48 million acres. Um, reservations were left checkerboarded as a result as well. So to address the failures of allotment, Congress in 1934 enacted the Indian Reorganization Act, also known as the Indian New Deal. Um, its purpose was very broad and it was to establish machinery whereby Indian tribes would be able to assume a greater degree of self-government politically and economically. And um, one of the things that the Indian Reorganization tried to do was to start the restoration of tribal homelands and the tribal land base. And so key to that was section five of the IRA, often described as its cornerstone. And section five authorized the secretary to um, acquire lands and trust within or without existing reservations for the purpose of providing land for Indians. And the land would be held in trust, as I mentioned, for the benefit of the tribe or individual Indian. And so what does that mean? What does trust land mean? Um, many things, but um, critically, those tribal trust lands are under tribal and federal jurisdiction and largely removed from state and local jurisdiction and taxation. So um, as we mentioned, the policy of the United States was to open these Indian lands to settlement. So we have here two advertisements trying to um, sort of convince uh, white settlers to settle on those Indian lands. So, and then here I have a map um, of tribal lands in the United States currently. This is prepared by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 2018. And so there are currently 574 federally recognized tribes. Um, 229 of those are in Alaska. The remainder are in 35 of the lower 48 states. And you can see they're mostly in the West. There's not too many reservations or trust lands in New England. Um, and there are actually many tribes that don't have any land at all. Um, and currently the department holds about uh, 56 million acres of land in trust for, um, for tribes and individual Indians. So interiors fee to trust process, which is relevant to uh, the Cartieri decision. So it's set forth in regulations at 25 CFR part 151. Um, and there's a handbook as well available online. It's a detailed 16 step process for trust acquisition. And if you make it all the way through to the end, which many don't, but if you do, uh, those challenges may be challenged pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act. 
And in making a fee to trust decision, there's a long list of factors that Interior has to consider. And one of those things is the impacts on state and local governments resulting from removal of the track from tax rolls and also jurisdictional problems and potential conflicts of land use. And I mentioned earlier that um, that what trust land largely removes it from state and local jurisdiction and so state and local governments have the opportunity to comment but they don't have veto power they wish they did sometimes over trust land acquisition but they don't um, some tribes but not all enter into intergovernmental agreements to resolve jurisdictional conflicts with local governments and in making these decisions, Interior has got to comply with NEPA, which adds a whole other level of, of review and time and resources to fee to trust decisions. So Cartier v. Salazar uh, is a Supreme Court decision in 2009, and it involved um, the Narragansett Indian tribe of Rhode Island. Um, the tribe, just a little history about it, occupied much of present day Rhode Island since time immemorial. Rhode Island's policy of detribalization caused the massive loss of tribal land base, um, and the tribe's uh, lands were sold to the state in violation of a statute called the Indian Non Intercourse Act. And that act is relevant to all the New England tribes because it um, prohibited the sale or conveyance of tribal lands without federal approval. And sales of New England tribal lands all happened without um, federal approval. And so um, that act led the, and this illegal sales led the tribe to file a land claim lawsuit against the state alleging statutory violations leading to Congress enacting the Rhode Island Indian Claims Settlement Act of 1978, settling those land claims. Following the act, the department formally acknowledged the tribe in 1983, and then um, Interior acquired an 1,800-acre uh, reservation in Charlestown in trust in 1988 for, um, for the tribe, and that was pursuant to the act but only 225 of those acres that it acquired were suitable for um, development. And just one other note, um, something the act did, which kind of distinguished the um, lands acquired from how lands are held in the, the rest of the country is that the act provided that the reservation shall be subject to the civil and criminal laws and jurisdiction of the state of Rhode Island. So turning to the decision, um, it started off as a dispute between the tribe, the state of Rhode Island, and the town of Charleston over land use regulation. And it involved 31 acres of land acquired to provide low income housing to tribal members. And so um, the state and the town of Charleston actually sought an injunction against the tribe to prevent the tribe from constructing the housing without obtaining a permits and approvals under state and local law. So, so why does that matter? You might ask, why would the tribe oppose having to get permits from the state and local government? Um, it's because the tribe wanted to build 50 units of housing and local regulation limited it to 15. And so trust acquisition would um, free development from local regulatory constraints and the opposition of the, the state and the town. So the tribe requested and BIA agreed to acquire the land and trust pursuant to section five of the IRA. Um, the governor, state, and town uh, challenged that acquisition all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And they argued that there was no statutory authority because the tribe was neither recognized nor under federal jurisdiction in 1934. So where does that language come from? Well, it goes back to section five of the IRA, which authorizes trust acquisition for quote unquote Indians. And then section 19 of the IRA defines Indians to include members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. So the state said, look, uh, the tribe can't meet either of those requirements. And so there was no authority for Interior to act. Um, and so it's kind of important to note that 21 states filed a brief in support of the state of Rhode Island and complained that the trust power has the capacity to change the character of an entire state. So in Cartieri, it was about statutory authority, but really it was about um, the land and trust process generally. And there was a lot of opposition by state and local governments to it.
So turning to the Supreme Court, it agreed with the state that the term now um, in the definition was unambiguous and referred to the IRA's enactment in 1934. Um, I call this the now means then holding. Um, and what that meant was that the secretary's authority to acquire land and trust under the first definition was limited to tribes under federal jurisdiction in 34. And the court held that the parties had effectively conceded that the tribe was not under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And therefore the secretary was not, um, did not have authority to take the parcel into trust for the tribe. And so that rested on a sort of obscure rule of Supreme Court practice, um, which is rule 15.2, which says that a brief in opposition to a cert petition should address any perceived misstatement of fact or law in the petition. Um, and so the court said, look, uh, Department of the Interior, you did not um, address the state statements that the tribe wasn't under federal jurisdiction in 1934, so you've effectively conceded it. Um, the court also noted that the evidence in the record was to the contrary of the tribe being under federal jurisdiction and cited the notice of federal acknowledgement of the tribe from 1983. And why that matters is because the tribe was, the court was sort of suggesting that because the tribe was recognized in 1983, well, obviously it couldn't have been recognized or under federal jurisdiction in 1934. Um, so those are just interesting things to know about the decision. There was a concurring opinion by Justice Breyer, which becomes very relevant to um, later actions by Interior. But importantly, he noted that a tribe may have been under federal jurisdiction in 1934, even though the federal government didn't believe so at the time. So um, we wanted to provide a little bit of context and the real world impact of the Cartier decision on the Narragansett tribe. Um, there were a lot of conspiracy theories that, well, of course the tribe just wants this land so they can open up a casino because that's all that tribes want is casinos. And the reality is, is that it was the purpose of this was for low income housing. And this is um, from the town's property records and it shows a picture of one of the houses. Um, again, it's low income housing. Um, and it, it shows a pretty, <laughs> pretty nice house, not a casino. But um, turning to the next slide. So um, this is a picture from a couple of weeks ago of the housing development. Um, and uh, it shows, obviously, it's in disrepair, it's not being used. And this really goes back to what the Supreme Court's decision meant for the tribe. Just to interject, I wanted to give a shout out to Lindsay Coso, who is on the law review, and she was also a law clerk for my firm this past summer. Lindsay is awesome and agreed to take time from her busy law school schedule and run out and take these pictures for us, um, which we were really appreciative of because I think this makes it a lot more clear that this isn't just sort of academic discussion, but these are really major issues that have practical implications on the ground. So thank you, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision, um, I think across Indian country, it, it was viewed as, as devastating and there was a lot of concerns. Um, professor, professor Matthew Fletcher, who will be speaking to you this afternoon, um, he noted, rightfully so, that lawsuits related to Cartieri would force some tribes to undergo the strange and humiliating process of earning a kind of federal recognition all over again. And why he said that is because a tribe would basically be forced to prove up its history and its existence um, to make the showing that it was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And so there was, a, as I said, a, it was a lot of concern about the decision. It upended decades of Interior Department practice. And um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very difficult. So Congress um, tried to act, sort of, and um, since Cartieri decide, was decided, there have been 17 clean Cartieri fixes introduced in the Senate and House. And what's a clean Cartieri fix, you might ask? Um, that would be a change to the Indian Reorganization Act to eliminate the under federal jurisdiction in 1934 language and clarify that all tribes, all federally recognized tribes were eligible for land into trust. 
So there were 17 fixes introduced. Um, it passed the House twice in 2010 and 2019, but never passed the Senate. Um, there have been countless committee and subcommittee hearings on the matter. And there's been so much opposition from state attorney generals, um, as well as the Rhode Island congressional delegation, because really what's happened is the debate about Cartieri has turned into a debate about land into trust generally, and also gaming acquisitions. And so a lot of um, parties have crawled out of the woodwork to use Cartieri to challenge trust acquisitions generally. And that includes state and local governments, gaming um, opponents, um, as well as citizens groups. So again, uh, it still hasn't passed um, in this Congress, despite having Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate, um, a Cartieri fix has not even yet been introduced. So Interior's response, um, as I mentioned, it upended decades of Interior practice. Um, Interior said, rightfully so, that it created haves and have nots, tribes that were eligible and tribes that potentially weren't able to show that because of their history. Um, Interior under Obama and Biden have strongly supported a clean um, legislative fix. And Interior also held tribal consultations on um, how to respond to the decision when it first came out. So Congress has consistently pressured Interior to come up with lists of tribes who were under federal jurisdiction and were not the haves and have nots. But Interior has consistently said, no, there's no lists um, because Cartieri impacts all tribes. And the, how it does that is by complicating and slowing down the already cumbersome fee to trust process and requiring tribes and Interior to spend scant resources to establish statutory authority. Um, uh, preparing a Cartieri decision takes hundreds and hundreds of pages often of research and work and some of the decisions are uh, dozens and dozens of pages and so it really requires a tremendous amount of effort by everyone involved. Yeah, um, and can I just tack on to that a little bit because I think this is like such a critical point. Um, this has imposed an incredible burden on tribes who have already gone through so much to get to the point where they could even submission to add land and trust. And by imposing this under federal jurisdiction 1934 requirement, they have to hire historians who go into the federal archives to gather federal records on in order to submit them back to the federal government, proving that the, these tribes are under federal jurisdiction. So you have, you know, these can take years to put together and you're hiring historians, lawyers, et cetera. It's massively expensive. It's extremely frustrating. Um, so it, it truly creates a, a major obstacle for most tribes. Thank you, Bethany. Um, so Cartieri has been weaponized by states, local governments, citizens groups, individuals, corporations, and even other tribes to challenge the exercise of tribal sovereignty through the acquisition of tribal lands. And some of these challenges have actually suggested that the tribes at issue aren't really tribes at all. Um, and, and that's just, it's beyond disheartening to, to see that for obvious reasons. Um, so as part of its response, Interior developed a two-part Cartieri framework for um, addressing the first definition of Indian under the IRA. Um, and it did that initially in the context of a fee to trust application by the Cowlitz Indian tribe in Washington for a gaming decision. Um, the Cowlitz were formally acknowledged in 2002 and they, at the time of their application, had no land base whatsoever. And so in examining their application, Interior considered, exhaustively considered, the text of the Cartieri decision, the IRA's text, legislative history and implementation, as well as fundamental principles of federal Indian law. And so, um, and it concluded there was no plain meaning of under federal jurisdiction and that it would apply a two-part framework to decide whether a tribe qualified. So that framework that was set out in the Cowlitz decision was then incorporated into a solicitor's office M opinion, 37029. And what's an M opinion? Well, it is um, an opinion of the solicitor that is the formal legal interpretation of the department on a particular issue. And it is not quite like a regulation. It doesn't go through notice and comment 
rulemaking, but it does carry the, the weight of the department on legal questions. And so Solicitor Hillary Tompkins issued M37029 with this two-part framework, um, which has the first question is whether there is a sufficient showing in the tribe's history that the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in or prior to 1934. And the question is, had the United States in 1934 or earlier taken an action or series of actions through a course of dealing or other relevant acts for or on behalf of the tribe or in some instances tribal members that are sufficient to establish or generally reflect federal obligations, duties, responsibility for or authority over the tribe by the federal government? And then if the answer is yes, then you move to the second part, which is whether the tribe's jurisdictional status remained intact in 1934. And the absence of federal actions did not necessarily reflect the loss of federal jurisdiction. So the types of evidence that are relevant um, as determined by Interior is the negotiation of or entering into treaties, um, approval of contracts, enforcement of the Trade and Intercourse Act, and then education of Indian school, Indian children at BIA schools. And so we wanted to point this out because there's a lot of attention right now being paid to the, um, the, the troubled legacy of federal boarding schools policies. Um, Secretary Holland recently an, uh, enacted a federal Indian boarding school initiative to look at some of these issues. And we wanted to note that there's really no more extraordinarily assertion of power over tribes than to take away their children from them and their families and ship them off across the country to a boarding school. Really, in our view, that really demonstrates the assertion of jurisdiction over, over a tribe and its members. And so um, kind of we hope going forward that Interior, in looking at these eligibility determinations, considers gives particularly close attention to the boarding school issue. Um, and then one more piece of evidence that Interior has found particularly relevant is a, a vote under Section 18 of the IRA on whether to opt out of the IRA. Um, Interior's held that that is dispositive and why that's so important is that there's a list, the Haas list um, from the 1930s that has over 200 tribes um, on it that voted whether or not to accept the to opt out of the IRA. So if you're on that list, Interior has held that you were under federal jurisdiction in 1934. Um, and also evidence of federal officials disavowing responsibility does not terminate federal jurisdiction. So if Interior said, no, we don't know who you are, we're not acknowledging you um, in a letter, for example, that's not that's not dispositive of a tribe status. And then lastly, recognition in 1934 is not required. Now only modifies under federal jurisdiction. And then other statutory authorities. So there are some statutes that authorize fee to trust acquisition for specific tribes, and that would eliminate the need to determine whether a tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 34. So litigation aftermath of Cartieri, um, <laughs> it's, it's been epic. So Interior has issued under the Obama administration approximately 80 eligibility determinations since Cartieri was decided. And there have been dozens of federal and administrative appeal cases um, addressing those challenges. And so the DC circuit and the ninth circuit have upheld the two-part framework and the Supreme Court denied cert from those holdings. So, so, so far, federal courts um, have upheld Interior's two-part framework and actually no court has rejected an Interior determination that a tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And then um, there have been other lawsuits challenging decades old trust acquisitions on the basis of Cartieri. So citizens groups and states have come along and said, we know Interior, you took this land in trust 50 years ago, but we still think we should be challenging it now um, uh, under the Cartieri decision. And courts have rejected those as well. So we can't understate the impact, sorry, I can't overstate the impact of Cartieri, but Interior's approach has been consistently upheld. So that, that sounds great. 
except um, recently under the Trump administration, they have ignored the old maxim, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and taken a new approach to Cartieri, which Bethany will talk about. Okay, and you can keep clicking through the slide. There are a couple of bullets. Um, yeah, like you can stop there for now. Okay, so as Jennifer mentioned, um, Karcheri was a massive blow to Indian country. There was a lot of confusion afterwards about how it would be implemented and how it would affect tribes. Uh, but Interior was able to kind of carve a path forward and the federal courts uh, were supporting Interior's interpretation of the statute and application to individual tribes. So things were looking really good at this point. Um, and then, things shifted. Um, as we all know, there was a change of administration. Um, so the original framework was uh, created and implemented during the Obama administration. President Trump comes into office um, and, you know, towards the end of his administration, uh, there's a major shift. So in March of 2020, the solicitor at the time, Dan Giorgiani, issues M37055, which withdrew this two-part framework in M37029. Uh, it was accompanied by a lengthy de deputy solicitor memo that provided the underlying legal analysis, looked at all of the same things that had been carefully examined in the original two-part M opinion, uh, but came to a different conclusion about what they meant. So at this point, the department said, we interpret the entire phrase recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction to include tribes recognized in or before 1934 who remained under federal authority at the time of the IRA's enactment. Um, so what that means is that tribal recognition in 1934 or before became part of the Karcheri analysis, um, which then begs the question, okay, so what does that mean in practice? And you know, something that has been sort of a struggle throughout this process is not only figuring out what does under federal jurisdiction mean, but also what does recognition mean? Because um, it can mean a lot of different things in sort of like an anthropological sense, uh, political sense, et cetera. So um, it wasn't entirely clear from the legal analysis what the practical impacts were going to be. Uh, oh, if you wanna click, maybe one or two more times, stand the slide though. Um, yeah, so it wasn't totally clear from the legal analysis. Um, however, it was accompanied by a document called the solicitor procedures. Um, and so that's really where sort of the, the practical process was laid out. Um, and then you can do the final slide. I just wanna reiterate that the shift occurred basically in the dead of night. Nobody knew it was coming. There was zero tribal consultation, um, no notice in advance. And everyone was very confused as to what was even prompting this, given the success and deference to the department's original two-part framework. Okay, so next slide, perfect. Um, so the four-step solicitor procedure is really laid out um, what this new interpretation was going to mean. Um, and it created this four-step process. So in order to satisfy the new sort of construction of Karcheri, um, Tribes would have to go through each step. If they could satisfy an earlier step, they wouldn't have to proceed to the later ones. Um, so step one asked, is there post-1934 legislation making the IRA applicable to that tribe? Um, and as you might recall, uh, that was a similar part of the uh, inquiry under the original two-part framework. So this wasn't really anything new. And if a tribe had this type of post-1934 legislation, they were good to go, no need to proceed. If they did not, you would proceed to step two um, because the tribe would then need to make a showing that they satisfied the definition of Indian in the IRA in order to access the IRA section five land acquisition authority. Okay, so step two asks, is there presumptive evidence that the tribe was under federal jurisdiction in 1934? Um, and the procedures refer to this evidence as presumptive, but also as dispositive. And in actuality, this, the evidence listed was treated as dispositive. So if you could show this, you were good to go. You were um, under federal jurisdiction in 1934, and I implicitly also recognized. Um, and so this included some of the same types of evidence that had been considered in the two-part framework, such as the IRA Section 18 election, um, an IRA Section 16 election, which is where tribes voted to organize under the IRA and enact a tribal constitution pursuant to that statute, 
as well as inclusion on the 1934 Indian Population Report by the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. However, if a tribe didn't have any of the types of evidence specifically listed under step two, they had to uh, proceed to step three, which asked, was the tribe recognized in or before 1934? And did it remain under federal jurisdiction in 1934? And again, the procedures provided sort of a list of evidence that would presumptively uh, show both of these things. Um, however, you know, it, it was a specific list. And if a tribe didn't have any of the evidence on that list, then they had to go all the way to step four, which uh, provided that if none of the evidence listed for step three uh, is available, then the solicitor's office had to consider the totality of all non-dispositive evidence. So it's really a case by case determination. Um, so as I've said, there are definitely similarities to the two-part framework. It's kind of unclear how this was meant to differ. Um, you know, there were comments from the department that it was intended to streamline the process. And I guess in some ways I could see how it did that, but mostly it just created a whole lot of confusion. Um, it also seemed like there was a de-emphasis on evidence showing uh, federal actions towards individual tribal members. Uh, in, instead, this new approach favored only federal actions dealing directly with the tribe as opposed to services and dealings with individual tribal members. But we'll never really know what this was meant to do, at least not fully, because it was only in place for a year. So if you want to hit the next And slide. so just one note. Um, so the procedures originally said, well, if we've already, if the Obama administration issued a favorable decision for the tribe, we're not going to revisit those and redo that work. And then about three days later, they said, never mind, and started to reissue and re-examine the history of multiple tribes. So apparently hundreds of pages of decisions weren't enough, and they launched into hundreds of more pages of decisions for tribes whose status had already been determined by the department. So there was a lot of extra work done in addition to the um, confusion that Bethany mentioned. Yeah, that is exactly right. So um, as we all know, there was again, a change of administration. President Biden comes into office and early in his administration, interior, um, you know, changes course and issues M opinion 37070, which withdrew M37055, which itself had withdrawn M37029. So the impact of this was reinstating M37029, which was the two part framework. Um, and the department uh, took this action saying, you know, M3055 had been issued without tribal consultation. Uh, it reiterated its commitment to meaningful and robust consultation with tribes regarding the department's interpretation of the term Indian. Um, and so those consultations are actually occurring now. Um, but for the, you know, currently what is in place is we're back at the two-part framework um, that had originally been developed, 80 plus decisions issued under it, and uh, it's been deferred to by the federal courts. So that's where we are at this point. Okay, so next slide. So at this point, we are going to kind of walk through the unique situations of the different New England tribes. And so we have a map here um, from the EPA kind of showing roughly where these tribes are located in New England. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jennifer. Okay, so we're going to start uh, our discussion with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and spend a bit of time on this because they've really had sort of the most action in the last several years. Um, so there's a lot to sort of unearth here, but um, a little bit of background. The Mashpee are located in southeastern Massachusetts, uh, including the town of Mashpee. So as you can see, the town is named after the tribe, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the tribe has been there since Time immemorial, certainly it is, uh, presence there has been documented since the time of contact. It's been referred to um, throughout history as like a self-governing Indian town or Indian district. Um, so it's certainly, you know, the tribe and the town are just kind of one in the same. Um, and the Mashpee, uh, similar to other New England tribes, were subject to colonial government rule, which after the United States was founded, um, was more or less assumed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so we see 
a history developing here where the states were sort of uh, asserting primacy over Indian affairs, even though under the law, the federal government holds that authority. Um, and the federal government essentially let these states do so without much interference. So uh, this brings us to the 1970s and the tribe tried to bring a non-intercourse act claim um, for its lands in Massachusetts. Uh, however, its litigation was not successful as a jury found that the tribe did not continuously constitute an Indian tribe for purposes of the act, so the tribe lost. Um, as a result, there was really no leverage for it to obtain a Congressional Settlement Act like other tribes. Um, and so it was many years since that litigation until the tribe achieved formal uh, federal recognition through the Part 83 acknowledgement process. Next slide. Uh, that same year, the tribe submitted a fee to trust application for 170 acres in the town of Mashpee and 151 acres in the city of Taunton. Uh, the Mashpee parcel was to be used for governmental services, cultural preservation, and housing, whereas the Taunton parcel was to be developed into a casino resort called the First Light Project. Um, and in 2015, so took the department quite some time to process this application, uh, but it finally issued a decision to acquire both parcels into trust. Um, this 2015 decision was really unusual because unlike the vast majority of other land acquisitions under the IRA, the department relied on a different definition of Indian, which we referred to as the second definition. Um, and I just wanna point out this picture here, um, sort of signifying uh, that you're entering the town of Mashpee, but really kind of demonstrating the close ties between the tribe and the town. So if you wanna go to the next slide. So a uh, little bit of a, a reminder of sort of some of the things we've done over already, but in the IRA, uh, the term Indian is defined in several ways. And so the first definition is all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction. So this is the definition that was um, at issue in the Carcheri litigation. And the, this is the definition that most tribes when submitting a fee to trust application um, rely on in order to show that it qualifies for uh, section five of the IRA. However, this definition is immediately followed by another definition, which states, and all persons who are descendants of such members who were on June 1st, 1934, residing within the present boundaries of any Indian reservation. So we refer to this as the second definition. Um, there had been sort of sparse references to it in departmental history, but there really hadn't been uh, a clear reliance on it for a trust acquisition, and it was um, untested at the time that the 2015 Mashpee decision was issued. But it was a good definition. Um, well, Mashpee was a good test case for this definition, given their incredibly long history at the town of Mashpee and its identification internally and externally as sort of this, this Indian community. Um, and there had been land restrictions, land was held in common, uh, couldn't be freely alienated. So it really sort of looked, felt, smelled like a reservation. Um, okay, next slide. So in issuing its uh, decision for Mashpee on the basis of the second definition, Interior had to grapple with a number of statutory ambiguities, um, the primary one being how to interpret the phrase such members. Uh, so one way of interpreting this phrase would be to incorporate the entire first definition which would include that under federal jurisdiction language. However, Interior declined to interpret it in that way, finding that it would render the second definition superfluous, uh, where if that were the case, anyone who qualified under the second definition would have already qualified under the first definition. Uh, and it also found it redundant because the second definition provides uh, that you know they must be Indians living on a reservation that is inherently a sign of being under federal jurisdiction, there would be no need to further state that they were under federal jurisdiction. Um, and so Interior issued this interpretation uh, and found that rather than incorporating the entire first definition, 
such member should be interpreted to only incorporate members of any recognized tribe, so not the now under federal jurisdiction language. Following the 2015 decision, uh, it was litigated by a citizen group uh, comprised of citizens from the uh, city of Taunton in the United States District Court for District of Massachusetts. And the court issued its decision in 2016, disagreeing with Interior. And the court found that such members incorporates all of the first definition. Uh, it applied no Chevron deference uh, to the agency, despite you know, the ambiguity in the language and the agency's uh, clear expertise in this field. Um, and so the result was that Mashpee must be under federal jurisdiction in 1934 in order to qualify for a trust acquisition under the IRA, whether it's pursuant to the first or second definition of Indian. Um, and this uh, decision was affirmed by the First Circuit in 2020. Next slide. So what this meant was uh, the, the issue went back to the department on remand and they had to consider whether the Mashpee were under federal jurisdiction in 1934, which they didn't have to do the first go round. Um, so this included extensive briefing on, on that question and it also raised related issues that I think impact New England tribes in general as to the import of the state exercise of jurisdiction and what that means. Um, does that mean that federal jurisdiction is precluded? Uh, is it possible to interpret state jurisdiction as a surrogate for federal jurisdiction? These are some of the questions that were explored. And the, the plaintiffs from the first case participated in the agency remand proceedings as did the Aquina tribe. So in 2018, uh, the department finally issues its decision and finds that the NASHP were not under federal jurisdiction in 1934. And it reviewed each piece of evidence, basically found it irrelevant or insufficient to prove existence of federal jurisdiction over the tribe. Um, interestingly, the department, even though it was specifically asked by the Littlefield plaintiffs to overturn the two-part framework, it declined to do so yet. Uh, but as we already know, two years later, it said, nah, let's overturn it. So um, at this point, the tribe sued the department over this decision, filing in the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. Okay. Um, so at issue in the litigation was whether the department fairly considered the tribe's evidence in light of the two-part framework and um, the you know, pretty substantial departmental uh, precedent for other tribes and their criteria determinations. So the parties fully briefed um, the matter by the end of 2019, there was a little bit of a lag because a new judge was appointed to the case. So we kind of had to get up to speed. Um, in March, uh, the department revokes the two-part framework and replaces it with the new four-step procedures as we discussed before. However, it did not notify the court that it had chosen to do so. And then um, shortly thereafter, uh, the department informs the tribe that it will be removing the reservation from trust status. So just sort of as an aside, back in its original 2015 decision, um, finding in the affirmative that it had authority to take lands and trust for the tribe, it actually did so. So those lands were transferred into trust status and they remained in trust status throughout this litigation um, because there had been no sort of final determination made. Um, but in March 27, 2020, the department tells the tribe you know what, we're gonna go ahead and remove the, the reservation from trust status. So this prompted a flurry of activity as the tribe moved to enjoin the United States. Uh, the District Court of BC was pretty displayed with, displeased with the federal government's lack of transparency with everything um, and issued a scathing order, which was kind of entertaining to read if you have the time, uh, but I just took this little excerpt from it. So the court said that it is frankly shocked that the government did not bring this change to the court's attention and discuss its relevance or lack thereof to the pending motions for summary judgment and preliminary injunction. The court was left to discover this change on its own less than one week before oral argument on the very question of whether the agency's application of the M opinion, so the two-part framework, was arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion or contrary to law. Next slide. So I just thought, you know, pictures say a lot more than, you know, sort of dry statutory language or court order language. Um, the department's 
notification that it was going to remove the land from trust status really mobilized um, Indian country, not just Mashpee members, but uh, Native people across the country, uh, allies for tribes and Native issues, and they came to Washington and they, they made their voices heard. And so I just wanted to show um, sort of what that looked like. And it was, you know, it was an existential threat to the tribe. It, it can't be overstated. And so there was a lot of fear and uncertainty about what was going to happen. Okay, next slide. Um, so the court orders supplemental briefing at this time as to why it should even defer to the department's reliance on the two-part framework, given that the government itself has determined that the two-part framework is contrary to law. Um, interestingly and highly uh, unusual, members of Congress filed an amicus brief in support of the tribe. Um, and this included uh, Deb Holland, who at the time was a representative, uh, and she is now as most you know, the Secretary of Interior. So she joined in this amicus brief. And the members of Congress argued that uh, the Congress only gave the department authority to acquire lands into trust. Uh, there is not explicit authority in the statute to remove these lands from trust. Uh, the members of Congress also said that the Secretary has ignored Congress, uh, Congress's clear recognition that the tribe was under federal jurisdiction and by doing so has usurped Congress and its well-established plenary power to define the federal relationship with tribes. So it's really um, speaking strongly on the issue and, and making some um, compelling separation of powers arguments. So in June of 2020, the DC District Court ruled in favor of the tribe, finding that the department misapplied the two-part framework. Uh, it failed to view the evidence in concert it failed to treat relevant evidence as probative, um, things like the inclusion of Mashpee on federal reports uh, that considered their removal west in the 1800s, uh, the inclusion of Mashpee on federal censuses, uh, and the attendance of Mashpee children at BIA boarding schools in the early 1900s, which is very close in time to the IRA in 1934. So the decision is now back with Interior on remand um, yet again. It's going to be really interesting to see how this shakes out given um, the change of decision makers and the fact that Deb Holland participated in this amicus brief. Uh, and now she is the sort of <laughs> overarching decision maker at Interior. You know, the, the decision doesn't come from her directly. It, it comes from the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. But I do think uh, it would be difficult for this administration to find that the Nash Pew were not under federal jurisdiction, um, just given sort of everything. Uh, but it will also be difficult to issue a yes decision because it will most certainly be litigated and litigants would be smart to file in the First Circuit as opposed to the DC Circuit, um, just given that the First Circuit has been more challenging for tribal interests in terms of uh, the IRA and Carcheri, whereas the DC Circuit has uh, deferred to the department's interpretation of Carcheri and application to tribes. So that's where we are now with Mashpee. And then if you look at the next slide, I'm gonna go through, are we on time? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so the other New England tribes, um, so the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, uh, which is known usually as the Aquinnah tribe, they're located on the island of Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Um, they are, they have a settlement act um, that was the result of their non-intercourse act claims. However, um, it doesn't contain any language expressly or implicitly extending the IRA to the Aquinnah tribe. So um, it doesn't appear that they have sort of that mechanism of accessing the IRA section five authority. So what are their options then for acquiring additional lands into trust? Um, it seems like they would have to undergo this full analysis of whether they were under federal jurisdiction in 1934. They are similarly situated to Mashpee. You know, they're all long known people, uh, similar history in terms of the relationship with the colonial government and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and just fewer examples of federal exercise of jurisdiction directly over the tribe. However, a positive decision for Mashpee on the agency remand would bode quite well for Aquinnah. Next slide. All right, so the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation is located in southeastern Connecticut. Um, they also have a uh, settlement act that was the result of their non-intercourse act claims. 
Um, their settlement act includes um, some very helpful language. Uh, the first provision stating that all laws and regulations of the United States of general application to Indians or Indian nations, tribes or bands of Indians, which are not inconsistent with any specific provision of this act shall be applicable to the tribe. Uh, it also contains language stating that the tribe and its members are eligible for all federal services and benefits furnished to federally recognized Indian tribes as of the date of enactment of this act. So um, we know that the, the Machituk and Pequot have um, successfully acquired trust land since the Carcheri decision was issued in 2009. Um, it's uh, whatever Carcheri determination was made doesn't seem to be available in the public sphere, but we assume that it was made on the basis of um, this later legislation extending the IRA to the tribe. So it appears that they are kind of in a good position moving forward um, to acquire additional trust lands pursuant to the IRA. Okay. Next, uh, let's talk about the Mohegan tribe. Uh, they're located in Southeastern Connecticut. They were federally recognized in 1994 through the Part 83 process, and they also have a land claim settlement act. Um, their settlement act provided mandatory trust acquisition authority for lands that were specifically identified in the act, and those lands became the tribe's initial Indian reservation. Uh, however, the act doesn't contain any language that would be similar to like the Mashantucka Pequot. There's no mention or prohibition of trust land acquisition pursuant to section five of the IRA. There also doesn't seem to be any sort of like general extension of uh, federal laws of general applicability to tribes and Indians um, to the Mohegan tribe. So, um, you know, there, there really isn't that sort of post-1934 congressional extension hook here. Um, and as far as we can tell, there hasn't been any land acquired in trust for the Mohegan tribe since the Carcheri decision in 2009. So it seems unlikely that the department has um, issued a Carcheri decision for the tribe. Um, so it, it may be that they are facing some difficulties uh, with proceeding to acquire land under the IRA section five, given the Carcheri landscape. Yep. Next slide. So then Maine, we'll talk about all the Maine tribes together because they're similarly situated. Um, in the 1970s, the United States filed suit against the state of Maine on behalf of the Passamaquoddy tribe and the Penobscot Nation. Again, this is a non-intercourse act claim. Um, and it resulted in the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Act, which extinguished the land claims and ratified the Maine Implementing Act, which was uh, a state statute that addressed the relationship between the state and the tribes. Uh, it also provided for a $27 million settlement fund and a $54.5 million land acquisition fund. Um, it barred land acquisition for tribes or Indians in Maine pursuant to other statutory authority, which essentially means that um, the Maine tribes cannot access the IRA Section 5 land acquisition authority. Uh, and this interpretation of the Settlement Act has been um, sort of confirmed by the Second Circuit. So it would be very hard to get around that. Next slide. Um, the Settlement Act also limited applicability of federal Indian law in Maine. Um, and then a separate Settlement Act afforded the Aristook Band of Micmacs, the same settlement. And sorry, I forgot to mention this before, but the Fulton Band was included in Mixa, sort of. Uh, it's later in the process. And so uh, then Arasu got the same uh, settlement provisions as that band. Uh, and then um, things are continuing to develop though. And there seems to be an interest in Maine in revisiting its implementation act, which um, really provided that tribes were to be treated as municipalities and not as you know true sovereigns. Um, and there's been a task force established by the state legislature uh, that recently recommended that the Maine Implementation Act be amended to permit Maine tribes to acquire trust land pursuant to the IRA. So here's to hoping that that gains traction. All right, so now we're gonna get into our sort of recommendation solutions, hopes for the future section of our presentation. And we'll start with Narragansett. Um, so as Jennifer explained, the Narragansett uh, 
under federal jurisdiction issue wasn't really briefed um, or argued in the Kircherry litigation. And just, it, it was more or less just assumed by the court because of what it deemed a concession by the federal government that the Narragansett was not under federal jurisdiction in 1934. But the department never made that determination. They never looked at the evidence with that sort of inquiry in mind. So it's possible that they could now decide to um, do that analysis and issue a positive criteria opinion uh, for the Narragansett. This would be definitely an uphill battle um, considering the, the precedent set by the Cartieri litigation and not, you know, not being entirely clear sort of what those Supreme Court rules about sort of concessions means for factual findings in the future. Um, oh, sorry, I had something pop up on my screen. Okay. Um, and, you know, it also may be that the Department of Interior and Department of Justice may be unwilling to go this route because it, it is a difficult um, argument to make. Uh, but if they were to make it, it seems like now would be the time to do it because of Secretary Deb Holland. Um, and we know that a positive cartier decision for Narragansett was, it's virtually certain to be litigated and that these plaintiffs would likely file in the District of Rhode Island. Um, we know that the First Circuit appears to be less friendly uh, to agreeing that New England tribes were under federal jurisdiction in 1934. They've, you know, made kind of offhanded comments in litigation uh, that doesn't directly involve that issue, but just sort of saying, oh, yeah, well, but that tribe wasn't under federal jurisdiction or they, they were recognized later. And so there doesn't seem to be sort of a, a fulsome understanding in the First Circuit of what that means. Um, we also know that the First Circuit has declined to defer to Interior on its interpretation of the IRA's second definition of Indian. Um, so a positive criteria finding for Narragansett could lead to litigation, which leads to potentially a circuit split on the deference to the two-part framework. Um, alternatively, we could find uh, that Narragansett is able to lobby for a sort of tribe-specific legislative fix uh, where Congress enacts sort of limited legislation regarding the Narragansett tribe's ability to use the IRA Section 5 uh, Land and Trust Authority. This is, it's always difficult to get legislation enacted, and in this particular case, the Rhode Island delegation um, may oppose. They've certainly uh, opposed this type of thing in the past. Uh, so sort of the last option for Narragansett would be a global legislative fix. And if you want to go to the next slide... Um, so, as Jennifer mentioned, there have been many, many efforts to get sort of this universal clean card cherry fix through Congress, and we are just, you know, sort of waving that flag again, saying now is the time, now is the time to really push for it, um, just given sort of the political dynamics, um, and it would just be such clean, easy language to enact. It's really just the deletion of the now under federal jurisdiction language in the IRA, um, but it should also make that uh, Congress should make this type of amendment retroactive so that it protects all prior acquisitions. And I think I'm handing it over to Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Bethany. Um, and just uh, assuming Congress does not act, although we'd like to be glass half full, assuming they don't, um, the next option that we think would help would be to, for Interior to enact a regulatory fix. So to promulgate um, formal regulations under the Administrative Procedures Act to institutionalize the two-part framework. And so why this would help? Well, first, obviously, as we've discussed, administration to administration has flip-flopped from frameworks to procedures to frameworks to more consultations. And it's everyone has whiplash, especially the courts which raises the question of what deference a court will give any interior decision on Cartieri at this point. And the DC Circuit and Mash, DC um, Federal District Court in Mashpee was just fed up with interior for doing this middle of the night switch. And so by putting it in regulations, first it would make it harder to reverse without notice and comment rulemaking, but also hopefully it would increase the likelihood of getting the magical Chevron on deference, um, which would really help support future fee to trust decisions based on the framework. So we recommend that the legislative history and text analysis of the um, M opinion two-part framework be incorporated into the Federal Register notice for the rulemaking 
and then that the test be set forth in um, text of regulations um, and types of evidence to be considered and their weight would be addressed in those regulations and also some explanation as to why evidence um, is particularly relevant to an under federal jurisdiction determination. So to do this would require tribal consultation, which Interior is doing tribal consultation on fee to trust right now. And then it would require a notice of proposed rulemaking followed by a, um, a final rule. And so it would take some time, but we think given congressional inaction, it could be worth the effort. And then as part of considering changes to the fee to trust regulations, um, Bethany and I actually would recommend that other changes be made as well to streamline the, the 16 step process, um, which really takes an incredible toll on, on tribes um, and their resources, which should be better spent on providing services and not paying their lawyers. Um, so the uh, other changes that we would recommend would be to enact timelines. So um, giving Interior a certain amount of time to issue a decision on a fee to trust um, application. And then if Interior did not meet that, uh, that deadline, um, there would be a process for appeals from that inaction where you basically go up the chain of command to say, look, this decision has been pending for years or however long, Interior take action on that. You have to take action on this request. And then just some other things are, the regulations currently have some paternalistic criteria that the department considers um, evaluating requests. So for example, the Interior considers the tribe's need for land and, and that's not for Interior to decide, that's for tribes to decide. That's the whole idea behind tribal self-determination. And so we'd recommend that things like need um, would be el eliminated from the regulations. And then finally, the uh, right now there's a different criteria for on and off reservations. And for example, if it's off reservation, you have to submit a quote unquote business plan. Um, again, I think that tribes are better than Interior at coming up with their own business plans and deciding whether an acquisition is warranted. And so eliminating those requirements would reduce the hurdles that tribes have to go through um, and would also be more consistent with tribal self-determination and would also um, get rid of the, there's a lot of debate right now in litigation over whether acquisitions are on or off reservation. And by getting rid of that criteria, it would um, hopefully reduce those challenges. So those are just some ideas and recommendations, um, but primarily we'd urge a regulatory cartier fix. And then um, now it's time for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, um, both Jennifer and Bethany, that was wonderful. Um, so as I said before um, their great presentation, um, if you'd like to ask a question um, yourself, please use the hand raise function um, or just put it in the chat and I'll read it out loud. Um, but just to start, we actually had some questions come in um, during your presentation, so I will ask those first. Um, the first one says, any thoughts on the comments offered at the FTT slash tribal homelands consultations thus far? Um, so I, I will be attending one of those sessions. I think it's early next week, but I haven't attended any of the sessions yet. I think uh, we would just reiterate the suggestions that Jennifer made in terms of um, changes that could be made generally to the future trust regulations. I would also add that uh, assuming that we continue in this sort of cartier world uh, indefinitely without a congressional fix, I, I think it makes a lot of sense and it would be in satisfaction of the federal government's trust responsibility to provide grant money to tribes to do this historical research um, or the onus could be on Interior to gather these documents. I mean, like I said before, it's just incredibly burdensome to ask tribes to hire historians and lawyers to find all of these historical documents and piece them together and make the argument that they're under federal jurisdiction. Um, and then those submissions go to Interior and they do their own analysis, but really the burden, the evidentiary burden has been on tribes. And so I think either shift that burden or provide tribes with the resources to do that research. I don't know, anything else, Jennifer? 
No, I think that's well, well stated. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next question says, an individual can prove blood relationship with current and formal tribal members, but is refused enrollment. What is the venue for relief? So this strikes me as a um, sort of internal uh, tribal government issue. You know, the, the venue for relief would be with the tribal government itself. The federal government does not really play a role in, um, in defining membership. I mean, that's an inherent attribute of tribal sovereignty. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And uh, one of the things that came up in the litigation involving the Cowlitz Indian tribe and that's come up with the Hamul Indian Village in California are issues related to enrollment and um, interiors position. And it, it wavers from administration to administration, but it's, it's really that these are enrollment are um, internal tribal affairs and should be separate and apart from the fee to trust process. Great, thank you. Um, this question says, apologies if this is an off point question, but you talked a lot about two definitions of Indian. Could there be considered a third definition? And if so, what do you think that would be? Yeah. Uh, so there is a third definition and I don't remember the language offhand, but it has to do with um, Indians who are half blood. Right, Jennifer, do you remember specifically? It, yeah, I don't have it in front of me, yeah. but um, it does refer to half-bloods, and, and that definition of Indian was used for many years, actually, by the Department of the Interior in terms of organizing tribes, such as the Hamul Indian Village in California. So there is precedent for applying that definition of Indian um, in the IRA, but I, I am aware of one application that was submitted to the department in my tenure there, uh, urging reliance by Interior on that half-blood definition. But as far as I know, no determination has been um, made. I think there's a reluctance at Interior to handle, to address that question. And then finally, there is a definition of Indian. It's been called the fourth definition of Indian, which refers to Alaska natives. And um, Alaska is so complicated and outside the scope of our presentation today. But um, there is uh, an interior determination that that definition of Alaska natives as, as an, a definition of Indian um, supports trust acquisitions for Alaska natives in Alaska. So, so there are other definitions. It was just outside the scope of our presentation today. And I don't know if the question was aimed more so at like what could be an alternative definition of Indian as opposed to what's actually in the statutory language. I, I mean, I'm just thinking off the cuff, but like the, the IRA could simply just refer to federally recognized Indian tribes and their members. And that's the definition of Indian and Indian tribes. I mean, to me, that's pretty simple. Um, you know, as we said previously, uh, tribes are, um, you know, they, they determine their own membership. And so that definition would really stem from tribal law, but it's, it's extremely clear uh, who federally recognized tribes are. The federal government publishes a list every year uh, that specifies all uh, of the 574 recognized Indian tribes. So the IRA's definition of Indian could, um, you know, be amended to simply refer back to that federal register list. Great, thank you. Um, so those were all of our pre-submitted questions, um, but does anybody else as a participant have a question? Um, we have a couple more minutes to answer. And of course, you know, I apologize because we didn't put our contact information at the end. It was at the beginning of the slides and I assume um, the presentations, I, I think they'll be shared. I'm not sure I should check with the law review, but um, feel free to reach out to Jennifer and I uh, after the presentation at some point if additional questions do come up. Great, yes, it looks like there aren't any more coming in, but um, thank you so much. And thank you for um, sharing your contact information and we will um, be sharing the slides and your information for anybody who comes up with um, follow-up questions or would like to follow your research. So thank you very much. Thank you all so much for having us here. Sure. Um, so before we get into our final speaker, um, I am just gonna take a quick break, let everybody um, stretch their legs a bit. And so um, our next speaker, um, Professor Fletcher, will be speaking promptly at um, 2.40 p.m. 
So that's in about 10 minutes. So if you could all um, just hang on the line or stretch your legs um, for about 10 minutes. And um, as I've said before, feel free if you have come up with questions. Um, some of our speakers are still um, logged in or I can um, send you those emails that are in the chat. So you can always add questions to the chat um, as the day goes on. But um, I will see everybody back here in about 10 minutes. Okay, everyone, welcome back. It is 2.40 p.m. Um, and we're gonna jump into our final speaker of the day. Um, before we jump into that, um, I would like to welcome anybody who has just joined us and welcome back everyone who has been with us um, for the day. Um, just a final reminder to please keep your microphones muted until um, I call on you using the hand raise function during our last question and answer period. Um, additionally, if you could please refrain from putting anything in the chat um, as it disrupts the speaker and the presentation. Um, but if you do want to send a question during the um, presentation, please send it in a direct message to me through the chat function. Um, and also feel free during our question and answer period to put anything in the chat um, that I will read out loud um, or use the hand raise function to ask a question um, for yourself. So with that being said, um, Oh, one more thing, um, please view uh, this presentation in speaker view so that you can see um, everything that um, Mr. Fletcher has to present. Um, so at this time, um, I would like to introduce our final speaker today, Mr. Matthew Fletcher. Um, professor Fletcher is a professor at Michigan State University College of Law and the director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. He sits as the Chief Justice of the Pork Band of Creek Indian Supreme Court and as an appellate judge for the Colorado River Indian Tribes, the Hoopa Valley Tribe, the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, and many others. He is a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Professor Fletcher is a highly regarded author of multiple law review articles, appearing in the California Law Review, Michigan Law Review, and Stanford Law Review Online, as well as casebooks such as Federal Indian Law and Principles of Federal Indian Law. Professor Fletcher is a highly regarded scholar in the field of Federal Indian Law and will be speaking on uncomfortable truths about sovereignty and wealth. So please welcome Professor Fletcher onto the mic who will further introduce himself and jump into his presentation. Thank you. Are we back on the clock? Yes, we are. Okay, Whenever you sorry are. about that. No, you're good. Somebody came in and interrupted me. So are we getting started? Did you already introduce me? I didn't even hear it, I'm sorry. No, I did, that's okay. I um, just briefly introduced you. So if you wanna um, give a further introduction of yourself, um, your your role um, here, and then uh, just jump into your presentation and we'll do questions at the end. Sounds good, thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. I, I Like I said, I got called into a meeting. All right, um, hi, I'm Matthew Fletcher. I'm a citizen of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, and that's in Michigan. Um, the Ottawa and Potawatomi tribes in the Lower Peninsula of Michigan were administratively terminated. So we had treaties, uh, federal government declined to acknowledge us for well over a century, starting in the 19th century. So we have a lot of commonalities with the tribes in the Northeast. Um, and uh, there are a lot of differences, of course. Uh, there are a lot of cultural similarities as well. The Abenaki communities, for example, that is a word from an Algonquian word that we use as well to mean dawn land, land of the east, sun rises. Um, so there, there are some interesting uh, commonalities. I'm gonna to try to bring some of that into this discussion today. Uh, I hope you can see the comic book I'm sharing. It is, uh, if you're interested in uh, looking at it at your leisure, I'll put a copy, a link to it in the chat. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit in a second uh, about my framing of today's talk. And uh, I'm sort of putting this together a little bit and I apologize at the last minute. Um, I think this is an, uh, an incredibly important event and uh, um, I wanted to do, do right by uh, Roger Williams and also Jim Diamond is a good friend of mine. So um, I, I applaud everybody for all the hard work you put into this and uh, I'll get going. So uh, let's start with the framing that I wanna do today. And uh, 
what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that was inspired by a talk I gave earlier this week um, alongside April Yuppie Rolls, a friend of mine, who works out in Los Angeles. It's on systemic racism and the uh, wealth gap. And the Federal Reserve is in some process that's not relevant for, relevant for us today, uh, discussing how racism makes uh, uh, people of color poor and, um, and why there is a, a wealth gap. And there's very little discussion of why um, there is a wealth gap between indigenous peoples and non-indigenous peoples in the US. Obviously, it's, it's almost as if it's too obvious. So I'm gonna articulate some very broad uh, case studies of how uh, over history, um, indigenous wealth have been attacked and dispossessed and how I'm definitely using the passive voice. I know that um, it's been done primarily by non-Indian people, exclusively pretty much by non-Indian people, uh, at least up until the last few decades, but I probably won't get into that. Uh, my theory is that, uh, and, and I won't talk too much about it today, but my overarching theory is that um, many, but not all indigenous peoples, and I think it's fair to say the indigenous peoples of Michigan um, and the indigenous peoples of, North, of New England uh, have a certain uh, commonality in terms of their political philosophies, their cultural philosophies. And um, uh, their, the, the views of those philosophies, those understandings of property um, and wealth are, they definitely exist, they are real things. Uh, but they were, uh, in many ways, antithetical to the political philosophies on wealth and property that came from across the sea, um, came from Western political theory, uh, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, all that good stuff. The Declaration of Independence, um, also rooted in uh, Protestant and Catholic political thinking as well, religious thinking. So I'm going to start by doing a shout out to Joe Singer. Um, somebody that uh, is obviously very influential in the field of Indian law. It occurred to me as I was putting together the materials for this, um, this talk that I think, I think the first law review article I read and actually understood anything of as a law student about Indian law was by Joe Singer. And I'm pretty sure it's this article uh, called Well Settled the Increasing Weight of History in American Indian Land Claims. And the article is about a Vermont Supreme Court decision from 1992 called State of Vermont versus Elliott. And the case is about the Vermont Abenaki Nation that and tribal members, uh, citizens of that nation, who decided to go fishing, go hunting, in violation of state hunting and fishing regulations and licensing, um, arguing that they had an Aboriginal right to bring that claim um, as their tribe, tribe's rights have never been extinguished by the United States government. Um, they won at the trial level, but on review, the Vermont Supreme Court reversed. And uh, Joe Singer's article goes into great detail about how that decision was rooted not in law whatsoever, but in the notion of uh, a well-settled understanding of American history, that by virtue of, quote, the incre increasing weight of history, Indian people and Indian tribes can lose their property interests, their sovereign rights, uh, and so forth. This is not unique to the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, those of you also in the Northeast who pay attention to the US Supreme Court might look at that case and say, that's very similar to city of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation, 2005 in the US Supreme Court about the um, uh, Haudenosaunee Nation's uh, tax immunities arising out of their uh, land claims. It's also familiar in some respects to Carcheri versus Salazar, and I'll talk about that momentarily. Here is uh, from the glorious website uh, Wikipedia, a very cool map of what looks to be loosely the traditional territory uh, of the Abenaki Nation. And uh, basically it's Vermont, New Hampshire, and parts of Maine, a little bit into Quebec, I suppose. Um, so the, the discussion basically in, in State, v. Elliot, it, it, State versus Elliot is effectively one of Aboriginal title. Aboriginal title, Aboriginal rights are rooted in, or the discussion, uh, excuse me, the, the legal framework for those rights is rooted in Johnson versus McIntosh, uh, is rooted also in the doctrine of discovery, which was effectively brought into American law by the U.S. Supreme Court in Johnson versus McIntosh. Uh, the theory there, of course, is that Indian people, indigenous people, and indig indig indigenous nations um, have certain property rights that are, sub to, that are subservient to 
and inferior to those of uh, non-Indigenous peoples. Uh, people who came from across the sea tend to have lighter skin, tend to be Christian, Protestant, Catholic, what have you, um, and uh, tend to be a little bit more imperial and colonial in, in mindset than uh, the people who live here already. So the thinking, of course, in Johnson v. McIntosh is still relevant to this day, unfortunately. The thinking is that um, because Indian people have inferior property rights, it's relatively easy to strip those property rights away from those people, um, remove them from their uh, homelands, remove them from their assets and resources. Uh, very easy. All you have to do is um, purchase them at a very uh, um, uh, under, under fair market value or uh, kick them out through conquest. And most of the time, these purchases, these, um, this extinguishment of uh, what we call Indian title or original Indian title or original title or Aboriginal title, whatever you want to call it, um, it was relatively the most efficient way to go about it. So uh, the US and other European nations uh, purchased the lands from Indian people. Um, they created situations through settler, settler colonialism that made it uh, virtually guarantee that it would be an easier purchase, a cheaper purchase than um, if things were, all things were equal. Uh, and you can see, I got some newspaper articles uh, indicating uh, sort of the disgust, I think even in Vermont for the Vermont Supreme Court after the 1992 decision. Uh, this was a long time in coming. There were a lot of tribes in the Northeast in the 1980s that had um, either pending or ongoing land claims brought against the states in which they're located, as well as uh, potentially the United States. Many of those were reached settlement through acts of Congress. We've talked about some of those today. Some of those things are good and bad, but the point being that if you look at this through uh, systemic racism, uh, a lens of systemic racism and a lens of the wealth gap, what you see is a uh, very clear indication and intention to deprive indigenous peoples, in this case, Abenaki, of a right to their own subsistence. And um, subsistence is not exactly wealth. Subsistence is the literal bare mi minimum. Um, and even that was, uh, was too much for the Vermont Supreme Court. Let's move on to the uh, Narragansett tribe. We've talked about them again already today. I wanna thank Jennifer and Bethany for their incredible work um, on the aftermath of Car Cherry, work they've done uh, for tribes directly and indirectly on making clear what the issues are in Carcheri. I worked on Carcheri very tangentially. Um, In-house, I worked for the Grand Traverse Band many years ago when Carcheri was sitting at the First Circuit. I um, actually drafted a little bit of an amicus brief on uh, the Tenth Amendment anti-commandeering principles and things like that. That never really became an issue in the Supreme Court. Um, that's why they gave it to a junior attorney because it wasn't a big deal, so that's how I learned. Um, but, uh, so let's talk a little bit about Narragansett. And, um, uh, before this case really uh, got to the Supreme Court, the Narragansett Nation um, was really struggling. And uh, I saw those photographs of the housing that they were trying to put up. Uh, Narragansett, uh, here's uh, loosely speaking where their, their lands, again, this is a map from Wikipedia, which is no authority on anything, but it looks cool. So uh, we're going to use that. You can see Rhode Island and Narragansett are uh, very close to each other, closely approximating. So way back in the day, Narragansett didn't have federal acknowledgement from the United States, like most tribes in the Northeast and apparently in Michigan as well. Um, and so they uh, brought a land claim and they brought a claim under the Non-Intercourse Act, as many of you know, is a federal statute, 25 USC section 177, that goes all the way back to 1790, one of the very first acts passed by Congress. Uh, basically the act says, thou shall not buy land from Indian tribes without the permission of Congress. Naturally, much land was bought by, from Indian tribes without the permission of Congress. All of those transactions are void, and in the Latin, void ab initio, meaning from their very inception, as if they never happened. Even if the tribe was paid, even if the tribe vacated the land and never went back, um, that, land, that transaction never happened. Now, when you have a situation where um, the tribe has been paid, the tribe has vacated the land, at least partially, um, and maybe the tribe has just more or less gone underground and uh, they're not really uh, very open, uh, available for, for public view, so to speak. Um, that's where wealth transfers happen in an incredibly broad way. 
again, because of the doctrine of discovery, uh, because of the way Aboriginal title is disvalued, or devalued or undervalued or not valued at all, it's easy and cheap to purchase that land. Um, and then to forget that it's all an illegal transaction. Then to later come back and maybe perhaps ask Congress to ratify the transaction or to just say, we're a state government, uh, we're Rhode Island, we're New York, we're Maine. When we buy stuff, it's totally legal, notwithstanding what Congress says. And ultimately, the tribes centuries later may bring a claim saying the land, um, the transactions were void. And uh, you can at least litigate that question. And if you survive a motion for summary judgment, perhaps maybe you can get uh, some bargaining power, get Congress involved. Uh, Department of Justice will never help you, but um, you know, Native American Rights Fund will, or maybe, maybe other tribes, maybe your congressional delegation, even the state and local governments will want to make the case go away and talk Congress into uh, distributing, uh, appropriating some funds to settle the case, maybe some lands. And that's exactly what happened with Narragansett and the Rhode Island Indian Land Claim Settlement Act. You see on the bottom, a news article from 1979, which I find ironic now in 2021, it was ironic when I started practicing law in 1996, 97, uh, land claim settlement satisfies Indian tribe. No, 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 no. That, there, there's never gonna be satisfaction. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, I mean that uh, the value of that land and over the hit time of history, um, no act of Congress, no judgment from court will be, be enough to satisfy that. Um, just making tribes go away temporarily because you give them an influx of cash um, and some some acres uh, is not is not recompense for um, all these 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 centuries of colonialism. So fast forward to the you know the the era after the the Narragansett land claim settlement. Um, that settlement forbade the tribe from engaging in gaming operations. That settlement effectively was a uh, settlement that turned much of the uh, relationship between the trust relationship between the federal government and the tribes over to the state. State of Rhode Island to this day is um, highly, highly uh, hostile to tribal interests. Um, I sat in a meeting just just a, a, several months ago uh, before the pandemic, I guess, so years now, before the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. I was there to testify about an unrelated thing called the Respect Act, but the um, Congress was also considering the possibility of a clean car cherry fix. And Rhode Island's attorney showed up and admitted in uh, open test, open court, so to speak, open congressional hearing, that the real reason that Rhode Island objected to the car cherry fix was because Ro Rhode Island owns a casino and it doesn't want to compete with anybody. That's the only reason. They have, they give no shits at all about the uh, Narragansett tribe and uh, never really have. So they're interested in their own uh, revenue. They're interested in their own sovereignty. So back in 2003, I think it was, the uh, tribe, which had little to no trust land, uh, had some land, um, but no economic development activity um, and just was in a position that a lot of tribes in the state of Michigan were in the 80s and 90s with just nothing. Decided to open a smoke shop and you see a little picture of it on the top here. Um, the governor of Rhode Island at that time is a guy named Carcheri. He sent out the dogs, the state police. He made a big showing of it, like he was some sort of Texas Southern sheriff. Um, you know, with a stogie and a great big, uh, big, great big belly. And he sent the state troopers and they wiped the Narragansett smoke shop from the face of the earth. They beat everybody up real bad, broken bones, concussions. Many of these people were elderly. Um, there may have been heart attacks. It was um, absolutely the worst form of state-sponsored police violence that I've seen in Indian country in a long time. It's happened elsewhere at times. It's been threatened elsewhere, uh, but I don't think anybody's actually ever videotaped the whole thing and created it on TV. So that's, there's plenty of documentation about all of this. Now the Narragansetts litigated over the legality of their tax immunities at the smoke shop and they lost because First Circuit for other reasons as well, um, the, the Settlement Act. Uh, the individual tribal citizens who were beaten by police lost most of their claims uh, for uh, police brutality and violations of civil rights as well because of something called qualified immunity. And uh, this is just what Rhode Island is. Um, there have been no apologies as far as I understand about Rhode Island. Rhode Island is not, again, this is a, a question of wealth and the dispossession of indigenous rights. 
Um, it is very literally a question of wealth. There is no wealth at Narragansett. And the, every effort to um, organize the tribal community to generate wealth um, is quashed in a very violent way. And then of course there is the Carcheri case. Uh, this case went on for probably 15 years. It was the mid to late nineties when Interior decided to acquire land into trust for housing and that picture of the house, uh, the housing you saw before from just a few days ago. This picture is from a newspaper article several years back um, and it's, it's, it's worse shape now, obviously, but it's the same place. Um, really quite depressing. Uh, the tribe here is not interested in gaming. I'm sure they would do gaming if they could get the option, but it's not available at this moment. So they uh, were doing everything they could to develop uh, self-governance capacity, self-determination capacity, the ability to actually provide basic housing for their tribal citizens. Rhode Island is against even that. Um, and their objections are really quite noxious. So um, there's been enough said about Car Cherry, thanks to Jennifer and uh, Brittany Sullivan. Let's talk about Mashpee Wampanoag. So I sit on the Mashpee Wampanoag Court of Appeals. I'm not gonna say a lot about Mashpee and I only certainly say so in my individual capacity, not as a tribal judge there. Uh, but I've learned a lot about, um, about Mashpee uh, and my, my opportunities to visit out there. And uh, here's sort of where they are, they're Cape Cod. So we'll move on, that's very easy. Another picture from uh, glorious Wikipedia. I got another picture from Wikipedia coming up where all the uh, captions are in German for some reason, that's quite hilarious. Um, I learned about Mashpee when I was in law school as well. Uh, Gerald Torres wrote an article uh, and Vine DeLoyer wrote a chapter in one of his books about the, about the efforts of Mashpee back in the 1970s to bring one of those non intercourse Act claims. Um, and they were denied standing to do so because the court was unpersuaded that they actually were an Indian tribe for a long enough period of time um, or a sufficiently uh, consistent period of time to be an Indian tribe in the 1970s. The whole lawsuit was was absolute farce and sham. Uh, not the suit as brought by the tribe, but just the way federal neon law works and the way the tribal or the, the, the federal court uh, judge decided to um, proceed with, with the case. It was tried before a jury of non-Indians, none of whom knew anything about Indian people um, or Indian tribes or Indian law. The judge probably was in the same boat. Um, and they asked questions like, uh, you know, was this person an Indian in 1930? Was this person an Indian in 1940? Um, and then because of census, because of intermarriage, you had uh, stories where, um, you know, one person in 1930 was listed as, uh, quote, mulatto, I don't like to use that word. Um, the next time around uh, in 1940, the person was listed as Indian. And then the next time around, a decade later, the question was listed, the person was listed as black. Same exact person three different racial racial categories. Um, the court says, we don't even know if these people are Indian and uh, ultimately ruled against the tribe's ability to bring a claim. So this tribe is in such a terrible position that he, unlike the Narragansetts, didn't even have the legal standing to bring a claim. And so again, these are all claims rooted in illegal land transactions from a long time ago. Uh, Cape Cod is, is, uh, as, is famous for its incredible wealth. And all the wealth of Cape Cod um, went to non-Indian people from the people at Mashpee, which is again, right there in Cape Cod. And ultimately the tribe did acquire federal acknowledgement through the administrative process, I believe in the 1980s. Um, and it's still desperate to acquire land into trust. And you've heard earlier today about how Mashpee um, is struggling to, uh, to push back and to survive. Um, in this era, this post Carcheri era. Um, I've also seen, again, I'm, I'm not taking a position one way or the other, but I've also seen pretty virulent attacks on the tribe in its efforts to do gaming within its traditional territories that are a little bit closer from to, to Boston. Um, and you know, you can only imagine what uh, the opposition that the tribe would get if it decided to put a casino up in Cape Cod. Oh yes, you can absolutely imagine it because the tribe on Martha's Vineyard, uh, related tribe, the other Wampanoag tribe that's federally acknowledged, trying to put a casino up on Martha's Vineyard. Um, you know, the people who object to them are the people who vote in Congress, are the people who donate millions to members of Congress and um, who own, you know, America effectively. It is an incredibly difficult position for a tribe with no wealth uh, to try to reclaim 
the wealth that was denied them and taken from them. Um, finally, I'll, uh, not finally, but before I get to the very end, I want to talk about the Passamaquoddy and uh, Penobscot nations in Maine. Um, they also signed and it were, are the, the ostensible beneficiary of another land claim settlement act um, in Maine, um, which is probably uh, despite the fact that it allowed for the acknowledgement of the tribes um, and also for the acknowledge, uh, recognition of the tribes, um, some, some semblance of their sovereignty is really the, is really the imposition of state jurisdiction uh, over those tribes. Um, a few years back, I, I was able to participate in one of those uh, task force meetings, one of the very first ones where um, the task force asked me as a professor of law, sort of an Indian law 101, how does Maine fit in to the rest of the United States in terms of um, this, this settlement act and the assertion of state jurisdiction? And I said, there's nothing like it in the US. This is, uh, this is in many ways a direct imposition on even the tribe's internal affairs that a statute like Public Law 280 doesn't doesn't do, um, and I you know I think hopefully there is a movement uh, that may reach some sort of conclusion in a relatively short period of time that would be supportive of modifying the state's position on that settlement act, um, perhaps even allowing for the tribes to commence gaming operations. Again, these tribes are um, they had these are their traditional territories. They had trees. They had resources, access to water. They had land. They had the ability to move around seasonally, to have an economy. Um, all of that was destroyed. Uh, they lost the land through the illegal land transactions. They lost um, the trees because most of North America has been deforested, especially in the Northeast. It was a great show that my friend Nick Z worked on as a writer called Barkskins that actually details some of the original, uh, the early days of the deforestation of North America. Um, all of that was happening. Eventually, of course, Passamaquoddy. Uh, and Penobscot's brought uh, land claims against the United States government, the U.S. refused, or against Maine, excuse me. Um, and importantly, the U.S. refused to participate in these cases. I mentioned before that um, the Department of Justice of the United States is not a friend, generally speaking, to Indian tribes. The Department of Justice treats Indian tribes like the, the, the military treats Indian tribes. We're, we're the enemy. Um, there's a reason why um, when Osama bin Laden was killed, they, they refer to him as Geronimo. Um, the Department of Justice isn't militarized, so to speak, but they treat Indian tribes as an adversary um, and have been. If you ever want to see where the strongest objections to things like the Indian Child Welfare Act, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, all of these land claim settlement acts in the Northeast, the Department of Justice led the way. They did everything they could to try to block all of them. And, um, they were not supportive and in many ways continue not to be supportive, even in the best administrations. The Obama administration, for example, insisted that every federal agency issue um, an, uh, an exec, uh, an, a secretarial order detailing how they're going to uh, enforce the trust responsibility, except for the Department of Justice, which refused to do so. Um, and, you know, what are you going to do? Okay, so these land claims ultimately ended up in the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act. Again, We've talked a little bit about how that those settlement acts are not to the benefit of tribes. They are to the benefit of those who have been sued by the tribes uh, to make the cases go away the cheapest, most efficient ways possible. But at least these time, this time the acts were ratified by Congress, so they didn't violate the non intercourse Act. Um, like I said, these are uh, this is an ongoing dispute in Maine, and these cases, these issues wholly relate to the dispossession of indigenous peoples of their wealth um, and the, the attempt to preserve the, the illegality, the benefits of that illegality centuries or decades later. Last thing I wanna talk about is children because the dispossession of wealth also uh, attacks children directly. This picture of this baby eating this book, I think is one of the, fam the best things I've ever seen in my life. Um, and it's not a child from the Northeast. You can see on the bottom, it's a Ojibwe child. Um, but it's, I just, I just love that picture. All right. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about it, but, um, you know, Maine several years ago had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission related to Indian child welfare and uh, the dispossession, in this case, of Indian people of their children uh, that went on throughout the middle part of the 20th century. And we all know that that uh, the dispossession of those ch of children, um, the, 
removal of children from their homes goes back a century, a century and a half or more uh, throughout the United States. And the Northeast was not ex excluded from that. These tribes that ostensibly were not under federal jurisdiction still had, um, under federal order, still had their children removed. And so there's no more twisted irony than that. But the dispossession of wealth from indigenous peoples, the undercutting of tribal sovereignty and tribal nationhood um, was intentional and they went for our children. And from day one, uh, even before then really, before the Declaration of Independence, when the United States declared itself um, and insisted that um, it wanted to preserve slavery and to destroy the merciless Indian savages, um, there was the sense that the way to get effectively get the indigenous lands and to destroy indigenous nations was to go after the children. So, you know, in the Northeast, you have uh, you have the Dartmouth University, for example, is uh, has wonderful indigenous studies programs now. Some of my best friends are profs there. Um, they work really hard to educate native children from around the country. But the origins of Dartmouth are very brutal. Um, that there is the very first act of Congress that sent money to educate Indian children was sent to Dartmouth at, during, the, at the, during the Revolutionary War at the request of Elizabeth Weedlock. The request was send us money. That way, um, you know, the British are coming and we can hold these Indian children as hostages so that they won't attack us, them and their Indian allies. Um, the use of Indian children as hostages. Um, is the, the first at the beginning uh, of the use of Indian removal, the, the removal of Indian children from their homes um, continues nonstop to this day, but it's taken different forms. So in conclusion, I don't have a lot more to say. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk at the University of Maine. Actually, it's all virtual, but um, in a few weeks, then looking forward to some of these issues, I'm sure I'll cover in that same context. But uh, I want to say it's been a great honor. Um, to, to learn about these things, to talk about these things. I'm happy that uh, for Roger Williams University Law School, it's been a great experience. I had a great time uh, paying attention, following along to with these the talks today. And I wish we could all be there in person because it's a lot more fun. And, uh, but you know, I already know that. So I appreciate the opportunity and uh, open for questions. That's where I really shine. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Fletcher. Um, so as I mentioned before, please, please, please send questions in the chat. Use the hand raise function to ask questions. Um, it's all part of the discourse here. So feel free at this time. So there is one question um, that came through earlier in the chat. Um, so this one says, do you think that there's a model in the United States that other states should be using in terms of treatment of federally or non-federally recognized indigenous people? And if so, what would that be? Well, um, let's, start, let's start with non-recognized. Um, by non-recognized, you mean non-federally recognized, I'm sure. I don't think there's a very good, there are good models. Um, you know, some states do acknowledge tribes for specific purposes, but there's no one size fit all, fits all. There are tribes in Michigan that are not federally acknowledged, that are treaty tribes, that are state recognized. We, they call themselves state recognized. The state says they're state recognized, but they're only recognized for one very specific purpose, which is to receive federal grant money. And the state won't object to it or try to tax it. And um, that's about as minimal as you can possibly get. And then there are other states, um, you know, Virginia was acknowledging the tribes for, for some limited extent. Uh, those tribes that are now federally acknowledged under statutes that are not unlike, um, you know, what you have in the Northeast with Maine and Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Uh, no gaming allowed, a lot of state opportunity to intervene in tribal activities um, and tribal prerogatives and sovereignty. So, uh, that's not a particularly good model. I don't know of any good models, frankly, between uh, state uh, recognition of tribes, maybe California, which gives some tribes some standing to make uh, environmental, an environmental case or opposition and protection of sacred sites, but it's still very limited. As for the best models between states um, and Indian tribes, you know, I, I'll have to 
there's no model, but there are bits and pieces that you can draw from, from some states. Michigan has really good uh, tribal state uh, court cooperation, judicial cooperation. It's led to some tax agreements. Um, it's led to some pretty decent gaming compacts as well. That's a decent model, but um, you know the state could drop anything at any time it wants. Um, we're in a good position right now, say with Line 5, a pipeline that runs under the Straits of Mackinac, at least from vis-a-vis -vis the state of Michigan. They were, they're aggressively supporting the tribe's interests. It's the same as the state's interests, but a new administration that flipped, could be flipped on its head. There's no model to maintain um, those sorts of positions. So uh, look to the best places, the best states. Uh, Washington, state of Washington has a really good relations with tribes, except when it doesn't. Um, Cal Spell Tribe will tell you in North e northeastern Washington that the state of Washington has explicitly authorized the huge toxic waste dump right next to their reservation. And they chose that tribe because it's a tribe without much resources. It's sort of out of the way. Um, and the state has chosen to sacrifice them. So even the best states um, will do things that are really unconscionable. I wish I could say there are better models, but you'd have to pick and choose certain things. Some states have uh, great models uh, have domesticated the Indian Child Welfare Act, for example, at least eight or nine states. And there's a lot to be learned from statutes like that. Great, thank you. Um, so another question is, um, this person said, I just read the case of adoptive couple versus baby girl, and it seemed like a huge missed opportunity for the court to repair some of the damage done to Native families. What do you think the government can do or what is the Supreme Court's role in restoring indigenous families after its effort, efforts to separate native kids from their parents? Well, the Supreme Court's role is to enforce the Indian Child Welfare Act. And what the court did overtly five to four was refuse to do so um, for incredibly spurious reasons. And um, that's, that's a concern. Uh, the, the Supreme Court is very much interested the majority of that court was very much interested in attacking the Indian Child Welfare Act as some sort of racial giveaway. And I'm using that phrase particularly because before the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was a judge, he used to write memorandums. He worked in the Reagan administration's Office of uh, Legal Counsel in the White House. Um, and that's how he described statutes, uh, bills that were being, uh, that he was asked to review that come from Congress to settle land claims, not unlike the ones we've talked about before. And he said, this is a joke. We shouldn't, this is America. We should not be giving Indian people anything. And I'm not saying that's his thought now. Um, maybe it even wasn't even his thought then because he was a young attorney working for a guy like Reagan. Um, but that's an attitude that permeates uh, political and legal elites. It is an attitude that you, you see in Supreme Court opinions like uh, Oliphant versus Suquamish, where the court says, we can't find any laws that say tribes can't do certain things, but the reason that there's no laws is that there was always a, quote, unspoken assumption that the tribe couldn't possess that power, so we don't even need to find those laws. And that kind of attitude um, is around, and it's, um, it's not law. There's no law that backs, backs it up. Um, it's not part of the structure of the Constitution. There's no unspoken assumption. It's uh, systemic racism. And the, the court's role in the Indian Child Welfare Act is to apply the Indian Child Welfare Act. And um, you know, we're gonna have a case coming up called uh, Brackeen versus Holland in the Supreme Court, very likely probably be argued this term next in the winter. And um, the court won't just be asked to apply the Indian Child Welfare Act, they'll actually be asked to dismantle it. And uh, we'll see if they do that. Um, when it comes to rights like that, the rights of tribes and the rights of Indian parents and the rights of Indian families, including children, um, it's really up to the tribes in the first instance to step forward. Uh, tribes have a lot of jurisdiction over their own children. Children are domiciled within their own reservations. They have exclusive jurisdiction over them. That's where a lot of this has to start. Um, the, the children who don't live on the reservation, the families who don't live on the reservation, um, those, that's a harder question. And there's a lot of families, maybe a majority of families live off the reservation. And Indian Child Welfare Act is there to support. Uh, but the tribes need to be leaders in asserting that, um, asserting jurisdiction, asserting the right way to, to raise children and protect children. And I think they are, really, to be frank. Um, 
So there, you know, like I said, eight states have already joined tribes in adopting ICWA uh, on their own. And most other states are really supportive. So the Brackeen case I mentioned, which is an attack on the constitutionality of ICWA, it's brought by the state of Texas. It's really not brought by the state of Texas. It's brought by the attorney general of the state of Texas. The state of Texas's Department of Child Services, that's not the name of it, but whatever it's called, wrote a letter a few years back supporting ICWA, full support of ICWA, and suggest, made suggestions to the Interior Department of ways to improve it, to be more protective of Indian families. Um, Texas is actually strongly in support of ICWA. It's basically just the upper level political elites who are using it as political theater for other reasons. Um, and that's that speaks to the people on the Supreme Court, more so than um, the actual practice of law, the actual um, business of doing child welfare in Texas and elsewhere. Great, thank you. So this question says, in an effort to under, undo erasure, are there any resources we could access to learn tribal languages in Maine or the Northeast? That's a good question. I, I don't know much about languages, um, but I, I was very uh, happy to hear uh, at Mashpee when I went out there several years ago that they have a language program. And, uh, you know, they have no active speakers, or at least they didn't back then. So there's, there's two things that you can do that they were doing. I'm sure there's more. I'm not a linguist, uh, but they hired a language specialist, someone who is not even from, from the Northeast, somebody who I believe was Lakota, um, somebody who's an expert, PhD in um, ancient languages, indigenous languages, and the development of teaching methods to restore languages. So they have recordings, they've got uh, written materials. Um, that's one thing you can do. The next is you have to start your, your kiddos very young in learning the language. Um, there's this huge gap. It's my generation, it's my mother's generation. Um, it's the generation of, of kids who are right out, the families out of boarding school, the families that were removed, the children are removed from their, before ICWA, even after ICWA. Um, but uh, it's the, the elders, many elders know the language if you are lucky to have those elders and they're, I love going to meetings where the elders, uh, they always ask an elder to stand up and, and, and bless the ceremony the proceedings, uh, maybe give a prayer. But in more recent years, I've been seeing children doing it. It's the children who are learning the language uh, fluently. You could speak it fluently. And um, that's really, really heartening to me. So I can't speak specifically about that, but um, it's definitely very doable. You got to thank those crazy colonial colonizing anthropologists from the early 20th century to go write everything down and record everything they could. Um, all with an eye, of course, to saying, see, these ridiculous languages and cultures are dying out, and rightfully so. So I'm going to record them because I'll be the guy who owns it for the rest of, 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 of time. I'm glad they did that. I used that material um, as a lawyer to try to help develop understanding of uh, how cultural stories and philosophies as articulated by people a century ago from my communities who are thinking about law and public policy. They even, they even talk, they have stories about membership criteria um, and how to deal with uh, property rights disputes. It's really quite amazing. You can dig into some of that material. So gotta be grateful for those guys. That's really wonderful advice. Um, so the next question says, can you talk about how indigenous knowledges and particularly indigenous diplomacy work to dismantle systemic racism, including its embeddedness in the Euro-American legal system? Uh, I'll, you know, I think a great way, great place to start are the fish ins of the 60s and 70s. So in the 60s and 70s, you had states had complete control over who was hunting and fishing in, in the waters. Um, they had complete control over who could pollute the waters, who got the waters. Um, there were no environmental statutes uh, until the 1970s from the federal government. It was all the states. And uh, what you had around the country was dirty air, dirty water, the extermination of species, uh, the destruction of habitats. Um, you know who came in and just completely disrupted that system were American Indian Treaty fishers. And they came to it with an eye towards protecting property interests, interests that their ancestors had negotiated for in treaties. They came to it with an eye of protecting their own sacred interests in, um, in the fish, in the land, in the water. Those interests are uh, 
uh, cultural, they're religious, um, they're antithetical in a lot of ways to the way um, that the people in power in state, federal government thought of property rights, thought of um, basically just uh, you know public lands and public waters and air. Um, there are in part environmental statutes because of Indian treaty fishery. There are environmental statutes for lots of reasons. I mean, the country was disgusting, but um, in a lot of places still is, but they came hand in hand and the tribes were able to uh, make their views known really for the first time in any meaningful way and in a broad way because of the Native American Rights Fund and other organizations that had incredible lawyers who were willing to stand up often at the threat of life and limb to articulate those interests. Um, the 70s, 80s, 90s are the first times that the tribes were able, Indian people are able to, to persuade judges in court, open court uh, of their views, how they were right about things. Um, they used property rights articulated in treaties and preserved in treaties to advance those causes in law. But then when they had a place at the table to negotiate with state, local and federal governments about land use, water use, hunting and fishing, habitat protection, uh, that's where they brought in the heavy, heavy stuff, the indigenous political philosophies, the religious and cultural understandings of the humanity's place in the universe, um, how much basically to, to, to negotiate how many fish and animals and when in, uh, human people uh, can take, can harvest from, from nature and um, contribute to a, uh, an ethic of sustainability that did not exist prior to the 60s and 70s. Um, and that's still an ongoing process. There are wins and losses here and there. You still have ridiculous wolf hunts in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, but you also have the restoration of bison. You also have the removal of dams in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they're just amazing, you know, bear's ears. You have amazing things going on. Um, it's just gonna be an ongoing fight. And I think those impacts are really good examples. So that's probably the, the the sharp, the sharp cutting edge, the vanguard of a lot of that. But you're also seeing that kind of thing in Indian child welfare. Um, tribes have developed all sorts of ways to um, protect Indian families in a way that's completely different under state law. Uh, state and federal law will remove uh, children from uh, dirty homes um, with an eye towards getting them uh, uh, eligible for adoption to outside parties as soon as possible. Um, they're willing to, they're willing and, and able um, and encouraged to financially and through law to, to do so. And tribes don't have that. They're pushing back. They're trying to come up with alternate ways to reunify families. And they're, um, they're really showing up the states in a lot of ways. States are adopting things that tribes have been doing for centuries. Um, similarly, when it comes to criminal justice, uh, you know, I had, a, I, have a, I had a colleague a few years ago ask me, how often do tribal judges um, uh, grant motions to treat a juvenile as an adult for purposes of criminal prosecution? And I, I, st I, I stopped, stepped back abruptly. I couldn't believe it. No, no tribal judge would do that, at least not in Michigan. And it happens all the time for political purposes, primarily, when you have these awful crimes. Um, you know, the 12-year-old who, you know, killed somebody because of Slender Man years ago in Wisconsin. Um, Tribes wouldn't prosecute, treat that person as an adult, they're 12, um, no matter what horrible thing they might've done. And um, the tribes really don't have jurisdiction over cases like that, but uh, that sense of humanity that often is lost in the criminal justice system in state courts in particular, um, you can find that in tribal courts. And little by little, um, some of that, that, those think that those teachings, those philosophies are entering uh, state courts and even tribal courts, although that's a much harder nut to crack. Great, thank you. So this question says, you mentioned that historically the Department of Justice has been adversarial in these issues. Is that cultural to the department or something else? You know, I don't know what it is. Um, I think it's not law. The Department of Justice is the attorney for, say the Department of Interior. Let's say Interior says, uh, we did bad. We we violated the trust responsibility. We bre breached the trust. We spoiled tribal assets. Let's settle this case. Department of Justice, um, not because of law, I don't think, uh, 
uh, won't take the instruction from its client, the Department of Interior. It will make its own independent choices. So um, there's a case a few years ago where Interior wrote a big long memo to Justice saying, make this case go away, we were totally wrong. Um, that, and somebody, I don't know who, leaked that memo to the tribe at issue. And the tribe said, hey, we, went, we, we just got the smoking gun that we're right under the merits, let's, make this, let's win this case. Justice successfully forced the suppression of that evidence and forced the tribe to return the memo as a as attorney client privilege document um, because they wanted to win, and um, that's a problem. Now, there, when when the United States government serves as trustee, it has a duty of protection to Indian tribes, it's a fiduciary duty, um, as a duty that uh, to avoid conflicts of interest. And the Department of Justice position is no, there isn't. There is no such thing as a trust duty. Uh, I've heard attorneys from DOJ high-level ones from the OSG say the trust responsibility is a voluntary um, choice. If we feel like it in any given moment, we will enforce the trust responsibility. Otherwise, we will not. Come sue us, and and uh, we will defend. Um, when I talked earlier about uh, f federal statutes that Congress is passing, um, justice will show up at hearings, often uninvited and draft lengthy memorandums saying, here are the, all the reasons why this um, Congress, this act of Congress is either unconstitutional or bad public policy. Again, the Department of Justice is the attorney for the United States. Uh, it's not the attorney for Congress. Um, Congress made an independent choice, for example, in the Indian Child Welfare Act, that they had the authority to pass the statute. Uh, the Department of Justice wrote a memo that uh, is included in part in the legislative history that says here are all the reasons that the Indian Child Welfare Act is unconstitutional. Every single one of those reasons was false. Um, one reason was that the federal government was that, uh, excuse me, child welfare was the exclusive province of the states. That's false. I, did I not tell you at the beginning of this, uh, earlier in this talk that from the very beginning, the, the United States government was involved in intervening in the lives of Indian children versus hostages. Then when they took them as hostages, they had to educate them, so they started schools. And then when they the, uh, they fought wars with Indian tribes uh, and killed many Indian adults, they had a lot of Indian orphans to take care of. They took a trust responsibility to those orphans to create orphanages throughout the 19th century, after the Revolutionary War, after the War of 1812, and especially after the Civil War. And then those orphans got allotments during the allotment era. And then those orphans went off to boarding school. So my point is, is that there is no exclusive state right to Indian children. There was then also, as an aside, not Indian law related, but states didn't even have child welfare systems until the Great Depression. And the only reason they started those child welfare systems was because the federal government gave them money to start the child welfare systems. So justice just assumed because they didn't see the word child welfare in the constitution that the United States couldn't engage in child welfare. But that's just false as a matter of law. That's just an example of Department of Justice failing um, primarily because of whatever bias it possesses, failing to acknowledge uh, the powers of Congress and to defend and assert the duty of protection that the U.S. owes to tribes. Um, I could go on. They, justice showed up and objected to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act every single year that it was debated, saying it was bad public policy, that Fat Tony from Organized Crime is going to take it all over. Tribes are just shills for international criminal conglomerates. All of this stuff they had no factual basis for whatsoever. And we now know after 40 years of IGRA is patently untrue. So it's like that all the time. All you got to do is ask somebody who does Indian Affairs for the Department of Interior, ask them what they think of the Department of Justice. I think in the, the, your commentators from the prior panel might, might have something to say about it. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> um, so the next question says, with such incremental changes and political uncertainties looking forward, are you optimistic about institutional and cultural, not to mention political change that will bring justice to indigenous people? Well, I'm, I'm, a, big I'm a big fan of what I refer to a couple of friends of mine came up with my friend Nick Rio at Dartmouth. I mentioned I know friends at Dartmouth. My friend Nick Rio at Dartmouth is a forestry uh, specialist. Um, 
he, uh, th th there was a Supreme Court case I mentioned before called City of Sherrill from 2005. And Supreme Court said, you know, if the tribe wins this case, uh, it's going to upset settled expectations of the state and local governments, of the non Indian property owners. Um, it's just going to be have too much regulatory disruption. And that word disruption is used in a negative connotation. Um, and disruption, but disruption has positive consequences. And he told me that in a forest fire, maybe this isn't a good example anymore, but in a forest fire, if controlled, um, is actually one of the greatest things ever. Yes, you burn a bunch of stuff down, uh, but what comes up is much fresher. You have new growth, you have uh, Indi Indian people always did burns. And then what came after that was 10 years of incredibly strong berry production. The bears love forest fires, so do Indians. Um, so there are things that come out of disruption. Yes, there's destruction, but there is incredible growth and potential for uh, a lot of really great innovate, uh, innovation. The best innovators in terms of governance in the United States are Indian tribes. When you have nothing, you're surrounded on all sides by uh, those who are in opposition to you. Um, you've got to be creative. And that's one of the great things that um, comes out of tribal governance. One of my favorite things that I observed and participated to some extent with as an attorney for Indian tribes in-house was to see tribal leaders and their advisors create ways to get around some of these problems. Um, I spent a lot of time in my federal Indian law class saying, look, this case is terrible. It goes to the Supreme Court. Tribes should win. They lose. But they didn't really lose. Um, when you lose the case in the Supreme Court, that's when the real work starts. That's when you figure out a way to get around it. Um, your prior panelists mentioned a case called Patch Act. Um, the first time Patch Act went to the Supreme Court for the Gun Lake tribe, um, they lost horribly. It was, it was a shocking loss, one that I didn't, I didn't foresee coming. And it, pretend, and it, had, and it does to this day have a huge impact uh, on tribes. Uh, but the tribe that was the subject of Patch Act is the Gun Lake tribe. It's a Potawatomi tribe in Michigan, represented by my own brother, Zeke Fletcher. And uh, so at the end of the case, um, you know, we didn't, we, I, he lives like a mile from me. We catch up all the time. And he never mentioned what was going on in that case. And I said, what's going on with this case? And he said, I can't tell you. Um, and he didn't for years until an act of Congress was passed that reversed the Patch Act decision. And that was all him. He wrote it. Uh, he got the Senate committee to uh, look into it. He got the Michigan congressional delegation to back him up. Um, he received a bunch of threats from established tribal lobbyists. NCAI uh, was very quiet about it, didn't want to help the tribe. Ultimately, the, he got this law passed. And then he had to go back to the Supreme Court again and defend it and narrowly was able to, to defend it. So um, you lose a case, it doesn't mean you're the end of the world. All of that goes to say that this is a time of incredible disruption. Um, there are states that are failing right now. Oklahoma is a failed state. This is a government, an entire state that is run by oil and gas interests. So there's no pollution control in Oklahoma. There's no regulation of oil and gas interests. Um, they don't have much tax revenue because it's a red state and uh, conservatives don't like to tax things. So they don't have a lot of money. And the tribes in Oklahoma, Creek, Chickasaw, Cherokee, Choctaw in particular, Osage to some extent, some other tribes too, Citizen Potawatomi, um, have resources. They're actually stepping up where Oklahoma is falling down. And you see this around the country. Now, yes, these are tribes that have lots of money. They have a lot of resources, but they're showing how to other tribes, how it could be done. They're also showing really the state of Oklahoma and other states, how to govern land um, in a fair and just way. So um, I think that when there is disruption like this, it's terrifying. I'm not going to say that it's not stressful and that you don't spend nights thinking about what the horrible things that can happen, but it's a great opportunity for, to, for someone like tribes to step in and do some really good work. Thank you. Um, okay, the next one says, until such time as the federal government wholly moves towards indigenous justice, should we who support such issues work at state levels since you mentioned much of the work has been done there? Yeah, um, you know, you, you pick and choose where you wanna work. I think it would be great for people to work at uh, for state governments for two reasons. One is um, I've worked with uh, 
two reasons are one is when there are bad lawyers in state government it doesn't help me. Um, the other is, is that Indian people really should work for their state. Um, my lovely wife went on a single, spent two years working in the governor's office here in Michigan. And uh, I think just showing up to work every day. She does great stuff. I mean, she's a law professor, Harvard educated. She's an absolute genius. She's brilliant. Force of nature. Um, she could have just been somebody to show up. And it would have it was a sea change in the governor's office. And really for the entire state of Michigan in terms of tribal relations, but also um, just being there for a year persuaded the governor to, to do something about line pie in Lake Michigan. She, I don't know, she wouldn't say that it was her, but it totally was her. Um, on the first point, let me give you an anecdote, one of my very favorites of all time, why we should have uh, people in a state government who actually know something about Indian law. Um, it involves the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi and the state of Indiana. Several years ago, Pokagon Band got some trust land in South Bend, Indiana. They wanted to start a casino. Um, they knew the governor of Indiana was a guy named Mike Pence. This was several years ago. Um, they knew he it was unlikely that Mike Pence was interested in entering into one of those big casino compacts, class three gaming compact that you can get under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. But they thought that they would go and negotiate anyway. So they called a meeting of the governor um, and the meeting was short. The governor said, look, um, we, we saw your proposal and you, this is, told from the perspective, my, from what I hear from the from the uh, perspective of the then tribal chairman, Gannon John. John said, Mike Pence did something like this. And he's like, I hereby exercise my gubernatorial veto over your gaming facility. And um, you know, John is a very laid back guy, very cultural guy. And he said, well, Mr. Governor, we thought you would say that. Um, and thanks for your time. We've already started construction on a class two facility. Uh, we wanted to do business with you, but if you don't want to do business with us, um, we're going to move forward without you. And Mike Pence says, what's class two? And John said, ask your attorney. And so Mike Pence turned to his lawyer who advised him he had a gubernatorial veto. And his lawyer went like this. This is why we need people in state government who know something about Indian law. So I strongly encourage people to go into state government if they so choose. That's great. So um, before we get to, uh, there's just one more question, but um, one of our participants, Rena, put into the chat, so I'd like to just direct everybody's attention to there, um, a, a dictionary, it looks like, um, to answer that first question about language, um, maybe some extra research on there. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you'll be fluent or anything like that, but it's a good start, I think, to look at a dictionary like that. So thank you, Rena, for adding that to the chat for everyone. So the final question that I have here says, do you know if the National Museum of the American Indian benefits the indigenous people of North America? I would say on the whole, it absolutely does. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful museum. Um, you know, it, it's very respectful of um, indigenous people in a way that the Smithsonian has never been before. Um, it's primarily run by indigenous people. It, you just have to know it. It's, it's still a museum, and uh, you know it's it, it's it's doing its best. But it's with exhibits are passive things that don't really move very much. It gives the impression that these things are in the past. Indian people are gone. Indian tribes are gone. There's there's never they're never really going to be able to get away from that completely. Um, but I think it's really a wonderful institution uh, for what it is, and um, I, I think it can be incredibly valuable. Uh, I would also say that it's a, a gift shop is one of the greatest places to uh, art markets for indigenous, uh, um, indigenous art and in, certainly on the East Coast. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I, generally speaking, I think it's great. Um, but I, there are, you, you know, my favorite thing about museums that I've noticed over the years is that when Indian people go into a museum, uh, they go in looking for their relatives and friends they know. It's really quite hilarious. That's what I find myself doing, saying, hey, I know that guy. Um, and, and so it's, you know, it's just sort of a, like a running joke, but it's, um, I, I love NMAI, it's great, on the whole. Okay, great. Well, um, unless anybody has any further questions, which I'm not seeing at this time, um, Professor Fletcher, thank you so much for all of your insight. Um, but just real quick, is there a way for our participants to contact you or stay in touch with your work 
um, or a best way to keep up with what um, you're doing and, and potentially other scholars that you connect with as well? Well, I mean, you know, uh, people mostly know me because of Turtle Talk. So if you want to know what I'm doing, I usually uh, I'm doing something. Uh, if I'm doing anything, I'm putting a Turtle Talk. And uh, we update it on every week, weekday with news and, and primary source documents from legal and legislative uh, arenas as much as we can. And uh, been putting stuff about today's event on there as well. So that's where you find me. Um, it's just, just Google my name. I'm a law professor. We always have to have our emails on, uh, on public website somewhere. So. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for, um, for all of your insight and your wonderful presentation and answering all of our questions. Of um, so for our participants today, um, we are ending a bit early, um, but I think that, you know, that's better than going over time. I think we can all agree. Um, so at this time, um, I would just really encourage all of our participants to use the emails and the connections that we've made in the chat today um, to ask any and all further questions um, and stay up to date on all of our speakers and um, what they're doing in the research. Um, and ad additionally, um, as many of you know, um, the Roger Williams University Law Review does um, publish a symposium edition of our law review that will feature the speakers here today. Um, so that'll be out sometime in the spring this year. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, and you can find that just by Googling um, Roger Williams University Law Review Symposium Edition. Um, so additionally, as this program comes to a close, I would like to sincerely thank each of our speakers for their time and all their effort in making this program happen. Conversations about Indigenous law in New England and across the country are few and far between. Um, and although there are some amazing speaking engagements happening um, almost every year now, it's still an important conversation to have, especially as I mentioned earlier today, um, and as our title suggests, that these conversations can be fairly uncomfortable. Um, the import, this important and thought-provoking symposium would not have been such a success without these incredible speakers, their insight, and their education, um, as well as their willingness to answer all of our questions um, into the world of law and Indigenous people. I would also like to thank Ray Watson and the members of the RWU American Indian Law Student Association for their time and assistance with this symposium, and also for just bringing so much passion um, into our school and for, for bringing in um, some really important classes. And so for the Roger Williams students who are here on the Zoom, I very much encourage you to seek out um, some of the classes that Professor Diamond and other professors will um, be teaching on this topic. Um, and then additionally, um, RWU Law Events, thank you so much for all your help, um, for, for your constant support with this symposium, and also to Professor Diamond and the members of the RWU Law Review, many of whom are on the Zoom today for piecing together our vision for this symposium. And I sincerely hope that everyone here has learned something new and can take bits of this symposium into their everyday lives and to be lifelong learners and to sincerely encourage all of you to continue your education on um, the law and indigenous people and to make sure that we're bringing to light all of these important topics um, and standing up for, for some of the things that we talked about today. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my email is in the chat with any questions. Um, and if you need me to connect you to any of the speakers today, I'm happy to do so. Um, so we're ending a bit early, but thank you so much for coming. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed and have a wonderful rest of your day.